हेलो ऑल माय डियर स्टूडेंट्स आई होप यू ऑल आर डूइंग गुड तो कॉन्ग्रेचुलेशन फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल टू ऑल द स्टूडेंट्स हैव क्लियर्ड देयर सीए फाइनल एग्जाम्स वेदर यू हैव क्लियर्ड वन ग्रुप और बोथ द ग्रुप्स कॉन्ग्रेचुलेशन टू ऑल ऑफ यू एंड सेकेंडली ऑल दोज हैवन क्लियर्ड ऑब्वियसली दे विल हैव अ डाउट रिगार्डिंग वॉट आर द चेंजेस फॉर योर डायरेक्ट टैक्स मे ट्वेंटी एग्जाम्स नवंबर ट्वेंटी एग्जाम्स वॉट आर द अमेंडमेंट्स टू ऑन एंड सो फोर so i have taken a decision that this time along with an hindi discussion i will also put i will also be putting a uh, amendment on full english also so hindi amendments are already been uploaded so along with that i'll be also uploading my full english amendments for may 23 students especially for my south india students okay before i can start with the amendment from where we are going to do the amendment what is the source of the amendment i would like to tell few things to you all so please listen very patiently and keenly few things which i am trying to tell in the pre discussion session of this amendment okay as you all know that icai this time has not brought any particular study material for may 2023 attempt so icai is telling you to follow which material icai material which came in october 2021 so icai is telling you to follow the material of may slash november 22 so icai is telling you to follow this material okay along with this icai has issued one supplementary and that supplementary covers what e circulars from 1st november 2022 to 21 to 31st october 2022 it covers circular of that one year plus this supplementary covers finance act 2022 amendments which is applicable for may 23 and november 23 exams so if you want to follow icai material follow the material which was given for the last attempt and then follow this supplementary okay Uh, who has so much time in life to all these things okay we do not have so much time in life that will first of all follow the icai material of 2000 pages and then we'll follow the supplementary of around 280 pages and that will make our syllabus complete for your may 23 and november 23 attempt we do not have that much time sir show us a simpler way a shortcut way and an easier way i am showing you don't worry just follow our books that's it the moment you follow our books our easy notes of around 500 pages approximately that covers the entire syllabus except few topics like house property salary which is not important for ca fund that covers all the finance act 2022 amendment it covers the entire syllabus in a colored form icai booklet is in black and white secondly it covers all the finance act 2022 amendment separately mentioned in green color so that you can identify this is an amendment and third one it covers all the circulars and notifications all circulars notifications till 31st october 2022 so if you are giving exams in may 2023 for your attempt all the circulars which came 6 months prior to the date of exam that is till 31st october 2022 are applicable and our book are easy notes of two volumes of total approximately 250 pages plus 250 pages approximately 500 pages covers the entire syllabus almost entire syllabus entire syllabus will not include few topics as i have told you like salary of property apart from that and everything is there in the book okay <coughs> so that's it one last thing i would like to say before we can start with the session and that is pay absolute attention this amendment is not relevant is not required to be seen is not not relevant is a wrong word is not required to be seen by those students who have already enrolled my batch my regular batch or my fast track batch of may slash november 23 attempt all those who are already 
doing my this batch or or has already done this batch including students who have enrolled in nokar you are not supposed to see this amendment we have done all these amendments in the class itself don't worry except three four circulars which are very recently come after the batch was recorded so that i will be doing separately i'll be sending you all the lectures in your google drive itself that's a matter of half an hour not more than that you are not supposed to see this amendment session of 8 to 10 hours this amendment session will be of 8 to 10 hours all of these are already covered in your respective batch <coughs> so this amendment session is mainly for those students who have done dt as per last year or who have done dt as per finance act 2021 who have given exams in november 2022 and unfortunately they haven't cleared their exams and now they are about to give their exams in may 23 or november 23 as the case may be so it is relevant for them so this is a bridge program bridge program how it is a bridge program it is going to bridge you from your november 22 attempt to may 23 attempt So if you have already done your May 23 attempt classes, as per May 23 books, as per May 23 syllabus, you are not supposed to see all those things. It's a repetition. Till if you want to see, you can see. It's your choice. Okay. If you want to see for your further uh, upgradation of knowledge, you can see that. It's okay. There is no harm in if you have time. But I don't think so. You have time. Okay. Focus on other subjects. Okay. Rather than only studying about direct tax all the time. one last thing from where we are going to do the amendments we are going to do the amendments from our easy notes which we have finally launched in the market for sale so it is available on our website arishkan.com you can go over there and you can just book the books from there okay so there are so many students since last one year they have been asking me again and again sir when are you launching your books when are you launching your books we want to purchase your books so finally when i felt that my book is a complete book when i felt that it can be given to the students in the form of hard copy so now i am ready for it so I, we have already launched this around a months back okay and we have got a great response from the students so far so we'll be doing the entire syllabus uh the amendment from this booklet itself okay so now without wasting any further time let's start with the amendment so amendment will be on different pages because this is the complete book that two volumes we'll try to complete the first volume in today's session and then we'll see in the next session what has to be done the first amendment which is over here is there in the chapter of pgvp okay so the first amendment is there in the chapter of pgvp on page in section 35 that is scientific research section okay now that amendment is there on page number 4.3 if you come to page number 4.3 i request you all to first of all the order the books and then only you can go through the amendment and that will make more sense to you all okay you can watch the amendment with me also because i'll be showing all the amendments on the board also and you can take a photograph of those amendments also if you want okay that also you can do if you don't want to waste your time and then whenever the books will come you can just continue uh, studying from the books now pay attention please <coughs> the first thing uh, which we have to see over here is this is an amendment which is in relation to something which was made in the last year so let me tell you how what is this amendment all about pay attention please suppose there is a donor over here and there is a donee over here and the donee is registered in section 3512 which is a scientific research association or 3513 which is an association engaged in statistical research or social science or 351 to a which is an indian company engaged in scientific research so if the donor is giving donation to them okay so here the government in the last year in the last year has made an amendment that donee has to do two things donee the government has put two responsibility on donee in the last year responsibility number 1 donee has to file a statement with the government every year the donee has to file the statement with the government every year that who all have given the donation and second the donee has to give a certificate has to give a certificate to the donor that this much is the amount which is donated by the donor if the donee does not do these two things then the donee will be liable for a fee under 234g consequence number 
and the donee will also be liable for a penalty under section 271 that is mentioned over here 271k okay how much fee how much penalty let's see this is not an amendment this is the amendment which made which was made in the last year so the donee has to pay a fee of 200 rupees per day if it fails to deliver the statement or if it fails to give a certificate so they have to be liable for this particular fee of 200 rupees per day till the time they do not make their default clear till the time they do not file the statement till the time they do not give the certificate to the donor donor secondly tony is also liable for a penalty under 271k of 10000 rupees to 1 lakh rupees which will be imposed by the assessing officer so there are two consequences which the tony has to bear but now the finance act 2022 has become further strict and now the finance act 2022 has said that if the tony does not file the statement or if the tony does not file the certificate then obviously these two implications tony has to bear but along with that the deduction to the donor of donation will also be what will also be disallowed so now filing of the statement and giving this certificate is equally important to the donor because in the hands of donor the government is now saying that we will disallow the deduction also of the donation so now there is a dual consequences which two people have to bear one doni is already bearing second the donor will also have to bear because of the mistake of the doni okay so this is what the first amendment is made by finance act 2022 you can come to page number 4.3 and you can check this particular line over here i'll just read it for you section 351a has been amended with effect from ay 2122 to provide that deduction claimed by the donor what deduction claimed by the donor with respect to donation given to any research association university college or other institution referred to in these three section shall be disallowed why unless such research association university college or company files the statement the first responsibility is for them to file the statement and second responsibility they have to furnish the certificate so now there is a dual consequence tony is already bearing the consequence since last year now from this year onwards even the donor has to face the disallowance under the income tax law it means his donation has been wasted now it's of no use it is disallowed forever take it once then we'll go ahead with the next one okay So let's move on to the next amendment, which is made in section thirty-seven one general deduction after years and years and years. This deduction, this section has been amended after years and years. Last amendment in this section was made in two thousand fourteen. So after approximately eight years, the government has made an amendment. Now, what is the amendment? The government has not made one amendment over here. The government has in fact made three amendments over here. I'll explain you all of them. Okay, with the help of the examples. You all know that in section thirty-seven one, there is one explanation. Explanation one to thirty-seven one, which says that if you incur any expense for an offence, or which is prohibited by any law, then that expenditure will be disallowed. Do you know that or not? So this is an explanation which is there in section thirty-seven one, in the form of in the form of Explanation one to thirty-seven one. <coughs> I'll again repeat the explanation. If an assessee incurs an expenditure which is an offence or which is prohibited by any law, then that expenditure will be disallowed. So now there was lot of question regarding any law. Prohibited by any law means which law? Indian law or outside India law or both. So now the government of India in Finance Act 2022 has clarified that any law will include both Indian law also and outside law also. If you incur any expenditure which is an offence or which is prohibited by an Indian law or which is even prohibited by a foreign law, in both the cases the expenditure will be disallowed. This is the first amendment which is made by Finance Act 2022. Let's see that. Amendment made by Finance Act 2022. Explanation three has been added. Provides that expression expenditure incurred by an assessee for any purpose which is an offence or which is prohibited by law shall include and shall be deemed to have always included. What shall include? 
Listen carefully. Shall include and shall be deemed to have always included the expenditure incurred by an SSE for any purpose which is an offence under or which is prohibited by any law for the time being in force. And this is the amendment in India or outside India. Both will be covered if you incur any expenditure which is prohibited by an Indian law. That expenditure will be disallowed along with if you incur any expenditure which is prohibited by a foreign law. That will also be disallowed. So, very important amendment for exam, okay? Be very careful about it, okay? Now, the second amendment. What is the second amendment? I will give you the background of each and every amendment so that you understand everything very precisely. <coughs> In 2012, CBDT has came up with a circular. Now, it is a long drawn history. Now, let me explain you the entire history. What was the circular? The circular was targeting the pharma companies. As you all know that there is a pharma company and there is a doctor over here or hospital over here. And we all know that we have learned in the respective batches of direct tax earlier that pharma companies are engaged in providing what? Freebies. Freebies to doctors. That if you sell our medicine, then we will give you this much benefit. If you sell our medicine, then we will give you a foreign tour. <coughs> if you sell our medicine, the moment I took the name of doctor, I started coughing. Doctors have uh, just tried to remember me. They are calling me. <coughs> just a second. So, there are pharma companies who say to doctor. We all know that. This is an accepted fact across the country, across the world in fact. That pharma companies give lot of freebies to the doctors, to the hospitals, to sell their medicines. Now, the Indian Medical Council Act, Indian Medical Council Act has said that it is not allowed. Such doctors and such hospitals should not accept such things. They are not allowed to accept such things. They should not accept such things. It is not allowed. Till they accept. Till they accept. What are the freebies that they accept? They accept foreign tours. They accept expensive gifts like iPhones, MacBook, gold, jewelry, etc. But it is not allowed. Indian Medical Council Act has prohibited that to the doctors to accept that. Till they give. So, CBDT came up with a circular and said that if you give such freebies, then that freebie expenditure will be disallowed in your hand. Will be disallowed in your hand. So, CBDT came up with a circular. And this circular says that such expenditure will be what? It will be disallowed. But it is a circular. It is not binding on SSE. Always remember that. A CBDT circular is never binding on SSE. It is binding on the income tax authority. So, people started challenging this circular. And people started filing petition in different high courts in the country. And there are different opinions given by different high courts. So, some high courts are saying that it is not allowed. Some high courts are saying that it is allowed. Some are saying it is allowed. Some are saying it is not allowed. So, therefore, the government of India did what? The government of India said that we don't want inconsistency across the country. And therefore, the government of India came with, with an amendment made by Finance Act 2022. So, let us see that amendment now. Come to this page, all of you. So, the government finally made an amendment in the law. They made a change in the law. A circular is not a law. A circular is just a clarification. It is never binding on SSE. SSE can just tear the circular and throw in front of the government. It is not binding on SSE. Circular is binding on income tax authority. Assessee can always challenge the circular. CBD does not have the power to disallow expenses to a circular. Yeah. Yes, they can give a clarification. But there's a, that clarification is not binding on everyone. Binding on department. So, the government came up with an amendment. Let us see. To provide any benefit or perquisite in whatever form to a person, whether or not carrying on a business or exercising a profession and acceptance of such benefit or perquisite by such person is in violation of what? Acceptance is in violation of Indian Medical Council or rule or regulation or guidelines as the case may be for the time being in force governing the conduct of such person. So, 
if you give any freebie to any person, if you give any benefit to any person, if you give any perquisite to any person, listen carefully. An acceptance of that benefit, acceptance of that perquisite by the other person is in violation of any law, then that expenditure will not be allowed in my hands. So the hint is towards whom? The hint is towards the pharma company. They are not mentioning pharma company over here. But they have made this amendment for pharma company only. So what this point number B wants to say, if you give any benefit or purchase it to anybody, and if acceptance of that benefit or purchase it by the other person is prohibited by law, it's violation of law, then that benefit or purchase it which you are giving out of your pocket will not be allowed to you as a deduction. We are sorry. Okay. So this is the second amendment made by the Finance Act 2022 in explanation 1 to 37 1. Okay. Now the third one. Third one. Pay attention. Suppose if you break any law, okay, and if the law says that you will be prosecuted, you will be put in jail. So, to avoid that, there are certain provisions in the law which says that you can compound the offense. Compounding the offense means you can pay a hefty penalty. And then your jail will be what avoided. The prosecution will be avoided. So suppose you have broken some law and the government has come to handcuff you to put you in jail. So you can say, don't, don't, don't put me in jail. I'm ready to pay a FT fee. I'm ready to pay a compounding fee. Please don't put me in jail. Instead of putting me in the jail, take a compounding fee for me. The question is, this compounding fee which he is paying, whether this will be allowed or not. So, there were a lot of uh, disparity across the country about that also. Some courts were saying it is allowed. Some courts were saying it is not allowed. Secondly, compounding of which law? Indian law, foreign law, that was also not clarified. So, finally, the government came up with an amendment in point number C that to if you pay any expenditure to compound an offense under any law that is not allowed, for that, whether that law is an Indian law or outside Indian law, if you pay a penalty to compound any offense under the Indian law, that is not allowed. If you pay any fee to compound an offense under the foreign law, that is also not allowed. Check over here. So, these are the three amendments which are made by Finance Act 2022 in explanation 1 to 37 1. And this is a very, very, very important amendment for your exams of May 23 and November 23. You can definitely expect some kind of adjustments with respect to these, these amendments in your PGBP question. And we all know that the first question in the exam is a PGBP question. Whereby they will test you some adjustments with respect to these amendments. So I'll just repeat all three of them. First one is, if you break any law, any law means Indian law or foreign law, you will not be allowed the expenditure. Secondly, if you pay any, if you give any benefit or purchase it to any person for whom that taking of that benefit or perquisite is prohibited, then that benefit and perquisite which is provided by you will not be allowed as deduction. And the third one, if you pay any amount as a fee to compound an offense, then that is not allowed as a deduction, whether that compounding is done to, uh, to for an Indian law or whether for a foreign law, both of them will be disallowed. Just check this once and then we'll go ahead with the next amendment. So the next amendment is with respect to this small section, 48 to income taxes disallowed. We all know that income tax is disallowed, but there are a lot of again disparity across the country whether this income tax will include surcharge and cess or not, and whether surcharge and cess will also be disallowed or it will be allowed. So there were so many high courts which used to say that income tax does not include surcharge and cess, and therefore surcharge and cess was allowed by certain high courts. We all know that income tax has three components. First is the basic tax, then surcharge might be imposed on that depending upon the income of the person and then cess will be imposed on that. So, there is no clarity in the law because in the law in section 40 clause A sub clause 2 only income tax is mentioned. Surcharge and cess word is not mentioned. So, finally the government of India came up with a clarification in Finance Act 2022 where they have said that the term tax shall include shall include the term tax shall include what 
सरचार्ज सेस बाय वट एवर नेम कॉल्ड तो नाउ वट इज द अल्टीमेट आंसर फॉर अस इन फाइनेंस एक्ट टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी टू नाउ देर इज नो डिस्पैरिटी देर इज नो डिस्प्यूट इनकम टैक्स विल इंक्लूड द बेसिक टैक्स विल इंक्लूड सरचार्ज इफ एनी एंड विल ऑल्सो इंक्लूड सेस नाउ देर इज ऑल्सो वन रिलेटेड अमेंडमेंट विच इज डन वी विल बी डूइंग दैट लेटर ऑन जस्ट राइट डाउन ओवर यर रिलेटेड अमेंडमेंट which is done under section 155 sub section 18 so this is related to this particular amendment so whenever we will be doing 155 sub section 18 will be doing one question also on 155 sub section 18 don't worry to explain you exactly what this amendment is all about okay so just go through it and then we'll go ahead with the next one so the next amendment is in section 43b which is again a very important amendment for exam which is made over here now let me give you a brief background of this amendment also i'll give you a brief background of section 43b amendment suppose you have taken a loan from someone okay this is your balance sheet and there is an outstanding interest say of 1000 crore rupees now do you remember that there was already a provision in the law which says that if you convert this outstanding interest into a new loan conversion of this outstanding interest into a new loan does not amount to actual payment do you remember this or not if you convert this outstanding interest into a new loan it will not be allowed as a deduction because that does not amount to actual payment it is just a conversion it is just a change of positioning in the balance sheet so conversion of an outstanding interest into a new loan does not amount to actual payment this is something this amendment was made in 2006 but then government said that yes whenever this new loan is repaid at that time we will give you what we will allow the deduction okay and the government made about a specific amendment in the law by saying this that it is clarified that deduction of interest is available only if it is paid and not if it is just converted into a new loan so conversion of outstanding interest into a new loan is not allowed put an emphasis on the word loan what is written in the law conversion of outstanding interest into a new loan is not allowed when you actually repay the loan it will allow you so people start misinterpreting it and people saying that okay then we will convert the outstanding interest into a debenture we will not convert that into a new loan or we will convert that into a bond we will not convert that into what a new loan because law says what conversion of outstanding interest into a new loan is not allowed now the law does not say that conversion of outstanding interest into a debenture is not allowed the law does not say conversion of outstanding interest into a say a bond is not allowed the law does not say conversion of outstanding interest into a new security is not allowed the law is using the word loan we are not converting the outstanding interest into a new loan we are converting the outstanding interest into a security like debenture or bonds so the supreme court said in the case of mm aqua technologies yes this is allowed you might have done this particular case law in your november 2022 exams the supreme court allowed that the government of india cannot digest this particular judgment of supreme court so the government came up with an amendment in finance act 2022 and said that now conversion of an interest payable into debenture not allowed into any other instrument by which liability to pay is deferred to a future date shall not be deemed to have been actually allowed so now if you convert what is the ultimate conclusion now if you convert an outstanding interest into a new loan not allowed if you convert an outstanding interest into a new debenture not allowed because mere conversion does not mean that you have paid to the bank or to the customer so therefore this is not allowed so now this can also be an important adjustment in your pgbp question be very careful with these adjustments they are going to come in the exams where ici will test you on these these aspects so be very careful about it conversion of an outstanding interest into a new loan not allowed since very beginning since 2006 now conversion of an outstanding interest into a debenture is also not allowed Yes, whenever that money of the venture will be paid to the customers, at that time we will allow you the deduction. The way whenever you repay the loan, we will allow you the deduction. 
Similarly, whenever the debentures will be redeemed, at that time when you will pay from your pocket to the other person, at that time we will allow you. So, this is what a very important amendment is all about. Just go through it. This amendment was made with an objective of overriding the Supreme Court judgment of MM Aqua Technologies Limited. Okay. You can go and therefore that judgment of MM Aqua Technologies Limited is now no more relevant. That is irrelevant because that, that judgment is overridden now. Just go through it now. Then we will go ahead with the next one. Okay. So, the next amendment is in chapter number 8 which is there in section 14a. Section 14a, there is a very small amendment over here which is in the form of a confirmation of a circular. Now, just we have done this circular earlier in the class. So, I will just explain you the circular first of all. So, the government has given a clarification that now this circular is officially a part of law. Now, what is this circular all about? For example, this is financial year 21-22 and I have taken a loan. I have taken a 10% loan of 10 lakhs. Now, in the current year, I have not earned any exempt income. But I have to incur interest expense, right? Because the loan has been taken, so the interest meter will start. But in the current year, there is no exempt income. The exempt income I will be earning in future year. In 22-23, I am earning an exempt income. Okay. So the question is, in the current year, when I am incurring the expense, in that year, there is no exempt income. The exempt income is in the future year. So, whether this interest in expenses will be disallowed or not, because in the current year, there is no corresponding exempt income. So, in 2014, CBDD came up with a circular and said that, yes, it is disallowed. What has to be seen is that, that you are incurring an expense for an income which is exempt under this act. It should not be exempt under this year. The U words used by the law in 14a is any expenditure which is incurred by an SSE for earning an income which is exempt under this act, then that expenditure will be disallowed. That income need not be, that exempt income need not be earned in the current financial year. It may be earned in the future financial year. So if you know that you are earning, you are incurring an expense. If you are aware that you are incurring an expense for an income which is exempt, whether in the current year or future year, it doesn't matter. The expenditure shall be disallowed. So, CBDT came up with a circular. Again, the circular are never binding on a SSE. The people have started raising questions on the circular. People started filing petitions in the high court against the circulars of CBDT. So, finally, in Finance Act 2022, the CBDT said that we are making this circular as what? As a part of the income tax law. You can check this over here. With effect from 1st April 2022, the above circular is clarified through the Income Tax Act itself. This circular is now a part of the law. Now, nobody in this country can challenge this particular circular because now it is no more a circular. It is a part of Income Tax Act, Section 14A. Okay. You can just go through it once, then we will move ahead with the next one. So, where is it? It is there in Chapter number 8, Page number 8.1. Okay. Check it once. So, the next is a small amendment in the change in the tax rates in the chapter of taxation of various entities for cooperative societies. Now, what was the tax? Uh, there is only a minor change in the surcharge of cooperative society. For cooperative society, what was the surcharge earlier? Earlier surcharge was how much? If their total income exceeds 1 crore rupees, then they have to pay a surcharge of 12%. Okay. But now the amendment has been made in their surcharge and now their surcharge is exactly similar to a domestic company. Exactly similar to domestic. So, what is the surcharge which is applicable to a domestic company? That if their total income exceeds 1 crore but up to 10 crore, then they are liable for a surcharge of 7%. And if their total income is exceeding 10 crore, then they are liable for a surcharge of 12%. This is exactly now they are mapping with what with the surcharge which is applicable for a domestic company so okay so there is a relaxation you can say this is a relaxation earlier between 1 crore to 10 crore also they used to pay surcharge of 12 percent but now between 1 crore to 10 crore they are paying a slightly lower surcharge of only 7 percent okay so this is what this small amendment is over here just go through it and then we'll move ahead with the next one this is the amendment okay greater than 1 crore 7 percent greater than 12, 10 crore, 12%, okay. 
So the next amendment is in the chapter of assessment procedure in 143 subsection 3 page number 13.5. There are some minor changes in the proviso to 143.3. Uh, it will require some time to understand this now whether you have learned this earlier in a detail or not. I don't know if you have learned this earlier in detail. You will be understanding it faster or else it will take time. Pay attention please. I am just highlighting two sections. One, two. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. I am highlighting all of them in yellow. Okay. And I am highlighting one section in orange. Now, what used to happen this? All these yellow sections, all these yellow sections were under first proviso. And this orange one was under some other proviso. Okay. So, now the government has done realignment of the provision. Earlier, these four, these four yellow provisions, 1023C, clause 4, clause 5, clause 6, clause 6A, all of them were under the first provision. Now, the government has segregated them and they have divided them into two parts. Now, let me show you what exactly they have done. Pay attention, please, all of you. What used to happen earlier? I have to explain you with the help of a chart. And what they have done now? Earlier, there were two provisos. First, second. In first proviso, there were how many sections? 10, 21, 22B, 23A, 23B. 10, 21, 10, I also forget that. 22B, 10, 23A, and 10, 23B. Along with this, earlier, there were four more sections. 10, 23C, Clause 4, Clause 5, Clause 6 and Clause 6. The so, total there were how many sections? 8 sections earlier in the first proviso. And in the second proviso how many sections? Only one, Section 11. That is which are registered under 2LAB. Trust which are registered under 2LAB. Okay, now they have done realignment. Now, now in first proviso, and second proviso. These four sections are there in the first proviso. Okay, so I am copying this and I am writing this over here. But these four have been shifted to the second proviso. So I will write this over here. And along with this, obviously, in the second proviso, section 11 and 12AB, the trust assessees are also there. Okay. So they, they have done this realignment. Now, along with that realignment, what is the provision now? Now, let me explain you the provision. Under these four sections, now the realignment is done now. Now, I am not interested in the old one. I am interested in the new one. Under these alignments, listen carefully. Listen carefully. When AO is doing the assessment, these assessees, I am talking about the first proviso, not, with, not about the second one. I am talking about the first one now. Under these sections, the SSC is getting great exemptions. But exemptions are subject to certain conditions notified by central government. And they have to fulfill those conditions which are mentioned in the notification. So now, if the AO finds any violation in the notification mentioned by the central government, so where are the conditions mentioned? The conditions are mentioned in the notification of central government. Okay. Be very careful with this point also. So, who will see whether the conditions are followed by the SSC or not? Subject to which exemption is given under 1021, 1022B, 1023A, 1023B? It is the AO is going to see the things. It is the, the AO is going to comply with the conditions. He is going to check whether the SSC is complying with the conditions or not. Suppose the AO is doing the assessments of these four SSCs and he finds some violation in the conditions which are mentioned in the notification of central government. Then he so motto cannot disallow the exemption. What is he supposed to do? This is something which I have told you in the class also. What is he supposed to do? He has to intimate that defect, that violation to the central government. And then central government will cancel the notification, will withdraw the approval of these associations. And then they will intimate the assessing officer and then assessing officer will accordingly do what? Will accordingly disallow the exemption. Moral of the story, assessing officer Suomoto does not have the power to disallow the exemption. 
So there are few very minute points which are mentioned over here. What are these SSEs getting benefit? They are getting great exemptions. Why are they getting exemption? Because they are fulfilling certain conditions notified by central government in a notification. Are the conditions mentioned in the income tax law? No, no, no. The conditions are mentioned in the not in the income tax law, but in a central government notification. Who will confirm whether the conditions are fulfilled or not? AO. What if the conditions are not fulfilled? AO will not disallow the exemption. He will intimate that defect to the central government. Central government or the prescribed authority will cancel the notification, will withdraw the approval, will intimate the AO. Then AO can disallow. AO suo motto cannot disallow. Now, what is happening in the second proviso now? In case of these sections. Here, first of all, the government has given the conditions as what? As specified violations. And the word specified violation is now defined in Finance Act 2022. Earlier it was not defined. <coughs> so, where it is defined? It is defined in the chapter of trust. We will be doing that specified violation definition later on in the chapter of trust. So, the government has defined specified violation in the chapter of trust. So, here if the AO finds any specified violation done by a trust which is registered under 2LAB, or an institution or association which is registered under 1023C, Clause 4, Clause 5, Clause 6 or Clause 6A. Then what the AO will do? Then the AO will not tell central government. Now in this case, the AO will tell the Commissioner of Income Tax. And then Commissioner of Income Tax will withdraw the approval and then accordingly they can disallow the exemption. I will tell you the difference between the two. In the first proviso, where are the conditions mentioned? In a notification. In the second proviso, the violations are mentioned in the Income Tax Act itself. In the first proviso, AO will tell whom? AO will tell the central government or prescribed authority. In the second proviso, AO will tell the Commissioner of Income Tax to withdraw the registration of the SSE of 2LAB and 1023C. So, these are some of the differences. If you want, you can take a photograph of this if you want. This will just try to recall you all. Okay. I will just show you where exactly the provision is now. Now we will read both the provisions if you want. What is given in the first proviso? If AO wants to disallow exemption under 1021, 1022B, 1023A, 1023B, then the AO must intimate the violation of the conditions by such institution to central government prescribe authority. And the central government prescribe authority will rescind the notification, will withdraw the approval and then only AO can disallow such exemption. The AO Suomoto cannot disallow the exemption without intimating central government or prescribed authority. Okay. Secondly, where AO is satisfied that any fund or institution under 1023C or section 11 has committed any specified violation, you can write over here, refer. It's already written, refer the chapter of trust later on. You may not write. Then he shall send a reference to the principal commissioner of income tax or commissioner of income tax to withdraw the registration. So the difference is what? Here the AO was telling the central government. Here the AO is telling the commissioner of income tax. Then the AO shall pass the order after giving effect to such withdrawal. Okay. So the specified violation definition, don't worry, we will be looking at the definition later on whenever we will be doing the chapter of taxation of trust. Okay. So just go through it once and then we will move ahead with the next one. Okay. Now the next amendment is in section 144. There is a mention of a new section 139.8a over here which is a concept of updated return. Obviously, you will not understand this right now unless and until we are done with this concept. So, right now I am not speaking much about it. But yes, there is an insertion of a new section over here. Along with 139.1, 139.4, 139.5. Now, there is a mention of 139.8a also. You can just check this over here. So, we will be doing this after what? Some lectures, maybe in the next one or two lectures, I will be discussing this, this particular issue also. Don't worry. Just check it once and then we will go ahead with the next one. So, the next amendment is in the chapter of Income Tax Authority and their powers. And there is one very small amendment which is given on page number 14.5. You can check over here. That is, there is some change in the powers of CBDT. As you all should know, that CBDT has power under section 119. To issue circulars, to issue orders, to give you relaxation in many sections. Like every year, they give you relaxation from what? Filing of income tax return. They extend the due date. 
so they have the power to relax that so they have the power to relax the ssc to give the ssc the benefit of relaxation under various provisions like under 115p under 115s under 139 which they consider as their national duty and every year they extend the due date under 211 234a b c they can waive your interest under 234a b c under 234e under 270a that is they can waive your penalty also by issuing a circular or an order or an instruction so in this there is an addition of one more section to this family and that is 234f so now along with all these sections the cbdt also has the power to give you relief under section 234f what is 234f 234f is nothing but fee for late filing of return which is of 1000 rupees in some case and 5000 rupees in some case so now the cbdt can also relax the fee which is liable to be paid under 234f which is mentioned over here just check it once okay so next amendment is in the chapter of search and seizure which is on page number 15.3 a very small amendment over here there is a change of some sections earlier it was mentioned over here 153a now 153a is not relevant 153a section which is search and seizure assessment is irrelevant from 1st april 2021 you all know that search and seizure is a part of income escaping assessment only in 147 so now the government has removed that and in place of that the government has mentioned three sections the regular assessment also the best judgment also assessment also and the income escaping assessment also so the time limit for retention of books of accounts by the department for all three assessment will be same now like 30 days within 30 days from the end of the assessment once the assessment completes after that within 30 days the department has to return the books of accounts so earlier this provision was applicable to only search and seizure assessment but now finance act 2022 has made an amendment and now it has clarified that this provision is applicable to all assessments whether it is a regular assessment best judgment assessment or 147 assessment the time limit and the constraints mentioned in this section are applicable to all the assessments under the income tax law so just check it once over here a similar amendment is made over here also in 132b here also earlier there was a mention of 153a so 153a is not relevant anymore now from finance act 2021 onwards because from 1st april 2021 153a is discontinued so the government has removed the word assessment under 153a and they have put the word only assessment or reassessment which will include all the assessments so they are not mentioning what the assessment under 153a rather they are removing the word assessment under 153 and they are putting just assessment or reassessment that's what they are trying to clarify over here just check it over here not very important for exam it is not a very important academic adjustment uh, amendment okay just go through it once then we'll move ahead with the next one now the next is the amendment in section 147 and they have made drastic amendments in 147 now uh, you would say as a student sir in last year only they have made drastic amendment in 147 so again they have made drastic amendment in 147 yes <coughs> we all know that in last year they have revamped 147 they have removed search and seizure assessment and they have brought 147 as a separate section which includes search and seizure survey everything but you can see this it has been amended once again so many amendments see 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 here also amendment here also amendment new section introduced again amendment so what i'll do is if i start to teach you what was to happen earlier and what is the amendment what i'll do i'll you i'll teach you this chapter entirely till here till where till here not after this after this it is not required because after this there is no amendment okay there's no amendment after this so i'll be putting a separate lecture on this 147 assessment separately okay so I am not doing anything on that as of now. I will be putting a separate lecture which will be explaining you all the amendments from the very scratch. In fact, the entire lecture will be there explaining 147 in detail from the very basics till here. Okay. So, we will be doing that as a separate lecture. So, I am not doing that in today's lecture as of now. Okay. Just check here and then we will move ahead with the next one. So, the next amendment is in the chapter of appeal which is on page number 18.7 they have brought a new substituted section 158 ab 
158 AB was there earlier also, but they have removed that section and they have brought a new section now. So, I am in a fresh section. So, I am interested in explaining you the fresh section now. It will take time. And here, I have to introduce few people over here. Pay attention, please, all of you. So, I am not saying this is the new section. It is a substituted section. Earlier also, it was there. They removed the old one. They brought a new one. Now, pay attention, please. What exactly this section has to say? Pay attention. Suppose, for that, I have to create an entire background now. Suppose, there is Mr. A, who is an assassin. And who has filed an appeal to ITAT or who has filed an appeal to High Court and the Assessee has won the case. Okay. So, because the Assessee won the case, the department has appealed. Appeal to what? Appeal to High Court or Supreme Court. And we all know that if you appeal to High Court or Supreme Court, it has to be a question of law. Okay. And suppose this is a matter of financial year 1819. And suppose the matter over here is what? Say it is depreciation. You have to pay absolute attention on each and everything what I am trying to say. So, whatever I have said you so far, please pay attention on that first. I will put this aside. I will make it slightly smaller. I want a lot of space over here. Suppose previous year 1819 is going on, Mr. A is an SSE and he has filed a case to ITAT. Obviously, in the order of the law, first to CIT appeal, then to ITAT, then High Court, then Supreme Court. <coughs> and he has won the case in ITAT. So the department is aggrieved. They filed a case in what? Supreme Court. They, they filed a case in High Court. Or he has won the case in High Court. So department is aggrieved. They filed a case in Supreme Court. And the matter for this year is what? This year is pending in High Court and Supreme Court. Okay, as the case may be. Okay. Okay, now suppose a similar issue has arised in case of Mr. B. Mr. B, who is Mr. B? He is other person. Other person, he is my friend. For him also, a similar thing is happening for 1819. Similar Similar events happened. For what? For 1890. What do I mean by similar event? His matter is also depreciation. He has also won the case in ITAD or High Court. In his case also, Department has appealed in High Court and Supreme Court. And in his case also, the appeal is pending. Everything is similar. Okay? Everything is similar. Now, suppose a similar issue arises in case of Mr. A in 22-23 also. Similar thing. That the SSC has appealed and the SSC has won the case in ITAT. Now, again the department wants to appeal. Now, does it make sense to appeal again for 22-23? Because the appeal of 18-19 is already pending in case of SSC. Or a similar matter is already pending in case of some other person. Department is already agitating that particular matter in High Court and Supreme Court. What sense does it make? So, for that purpose, the government has made a collegium. Collegium means a group. Collegium of what? It is mentioned over here. Let me give you the entire idea. Collegium of two or more chief commissioner or commissioner. Collegium of two chief commissioner or etc. Okay, listen carefully. I'll tell you the number of persons will be introduced over here. There will be a lot of persons will be introduced over here. So, this similar issue has arised in 22-23. In case of Mr. A only. In case of Mr. A only. So, what sense does it make to again appeal the same matter of depreciation because already appeal of 18-19 is pending in High Court or Supreme Court. So, in this case, the government has said that the collegium will make, will tell the CIT will tell the CID that do not appeal. Do not appeal for previous year 22-23. Okay. Then CID will tell the AO that we are not supposed to appeal. So, will tell the AO that file an application. File an application with ITAT. With ITAT or High Court. 
within 120 days that we are not appealing. Plus, also take acceptance from Mr. A, Asasi. Asasi should also agree to it. Take acceptance from Asasi that we are not filing an appeal. We are waiting for the judgment of 1819 in your case or in for judgment of 1819 in your friend's case. And whatever the judgment will come, we will try to give effect of that. And after that, we will take a decision whether we want to appeal or we don't want to appeal. Okay. So, this is how the unnecessary appeals will be what? Will be avoided. So, here who is going to take the decision whether to appeal or not? The decision will be taken by the collegium. The collegium has been made for that purpose only. The collegium, the duty of the collegium, the duty of the group of two commissioner of income tax is to identify those cases where the appeal of similar matter is already pending in High Court or Supreme Court, in my case or in some other case. Don't again and again appeal the same things. What sense does it make to appeal the same thing again and again, again and again? It's a repetition of the same thing, unnecessary repetition. So, this is what the government has made the amendment over here. Okay. So, now I will be reading everything with you all with the help of this example. Then you can take a photograph of this if you want. The board will specify a collegium. Collegium means a group comprising of two or more chief commissioner or principal commissioner or CID for the purpose of 158AB. Okay. The collegium is of the opinion that any question of law that is depreciation matter arising in case of an SSE for any AY relevant case that is 22 23 is identical with the question of law arising in his case for another AY that is 1819. So, the, the question of law that is depreciation matter of 22-23 is similar to the depreciation matter of 1819 or in the case of any other associate that is his friend's case for any AY which is pending before jurisdictional high court. Yes, the matter of 1819 is similar to matter of 22-23 and the matter of 1819 is already pending in my case or in my friend's case. Or the Supreme Court against it, order of tribunal or high court, which is in the favor of SSC, that is other case. The collegium may decide and inform the principal commissioner or commissioner not to file an appeal at this stage. They are not saying don't file appeal ever. At this stage, don't file. Let the high court and Supreme Court judgment of 1819 come and then we will take a decision. To the tribunal, high court against the order of the commissioner of appeal or tribunal. The principal commissioner on receipt of the communication from the collegium. So, the collegium is informing whom? To the commissioner that do not appeal. So, what the commissioner will do? The commissioner will direct the AO to make an application to tribunal or high court in the prescribed form. So, the AO will inform the high court and tribunal that we are not appealing now. And that application shall be made within 120 days on the date of the receipt of the order of commissioner of appeal or tribunal. So, within 120 days you have to make an appeal. Then the application, what will be written in the application? The application which the AO will do to the high court or the to the tribunal. What, what will be written in that? The application may state that an appeal on the question of law arising in the relevant case may be filed when the decision on the question of law becomes final in the case of 1819. So, we will take a decision when the judgment of 1819 will come till that time we are silent. Till that time we don't want to appeal. At the same time, the commissioner shall direct the AO that also take the approval from the SSC. If the SSC does not give an approval, then you have to file an appeal. The SSC says that no, 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 this matter and that matter is different. This matter is on different issue. That matter is on different issue. 1819 depreciation is a different issue. 22, 23 depreciation is a different issue. Now, if the SSC does not agree that it is same matter, then the commissioner cannot do anything. Then he will file an appeal. But you have to take one approval from the SSC. The commissioner or the principal commissioner shall direct the SSC officer to make such application only if an acceptance is received from the SSC. To the effect that the question of law in the other case is identical to that arising in the relevant case. If no such acceptance is received, if the SSC does not give acceptance, then the commissioner shall proceed with the provisions of appeal. And the provisions of ITAD appeal is given here and High Court appeal is given here. He can accordingly go for an appeal now. now. What will happen when the final order will come? When the order of the commissioner appeal tribunal in the relevant case is not in conformity with the final decision in the law in the other case. The Commissioner of Appeal or the Commissioner may direct the AO to appeal the Tribunal or High Court against such order. So, if the final order, whenever the final order will come, okay, the final order is not in conformity with the order of 2020 to 23, then they can go for an appeal. 
and they can file an appeal within 60 days to the tribunal or 120 days to the high court which is the time limit generally to file an appeal to tribunal and high court. Time limit to file an appeal to tribunal is 60 days. You can go and check the time limit. The time limit to file an appeal to high court is 120 days. Okay. 120 days or 60 days as the case may be on which the order of high court or supreme court in the other case is communicated to the principal commissioner. So, when the 18-19 judgment will come and the department does not agree to that judgment, they can go and appeal. They can go and appeal for 22-23 and as a fresh case, they can go and appeal for 22-23 and try to find, try to see that whether they can win this case or not. So, this is what this provision is all about. You can take a photograph of this. This will help you all to understand. What is the reason of this amendment? The reason of this amendment is very simple. The government wants to do what? The government wants to reduce the unnecessary repetitive appeals in case of what? In case of department. Just check it once. Now, the next amendment is on page number 18.10, a very small amendment. Uh, pay attention, please, all of you. In section 263, where the commission has the power to revise the order of the AO, so now this power has been extended to the commissioner to revise the order of even TPO. So, if the commissioner finds that the order passed by the TPO is erroneous and prejudicial to the interest of the revenue, the commissioner has the power to revise what the order of TPO also just check it once over here. Check once. Earlier only AO's order was modified, but now even TPO's order can be modified. Check it once. Okay. And then we'll move ahead with the next one. Now the next amendment is a very small amendment in the chapter of profit link deductions, whereby the government has extended this date by one more year earlier. In ATIAC, that is deduction which is available to the eligible startups, the company or LLP should be incorporated from 1st April 2016 to 1st April 2022. Now, that has been extended to 1st April 2023, which is on page number 20.4. Check it once. So here, the amendment is they have extended by another one year. So, they have been doing this since last so many years. Earlier it was 2019, then they extended to 20, then 21, then 22, now even 23. Okay, just check it once. So, the next amendment is in the chapter of alternate minimum tax. We all know that the alternate minimum tax is 18.5%. And if the assessee has a unit which is located in IFSC and the consideration is received in foreign currency, then it is 9%. We all know that, right? So, for normal SSC, it is 18.5%, but for IFSC SSC, it is 9%. But now, there is an amendment where the government has relaxed that this 18.5% will be 15% for cooperative society. So, for cooperative society, the two rates will be 15% and 9%. And for others, the two rates will be 18.5% and 9%. Just check it once. So, for cooperative society, the government has reduced the rate from 18.5% to 15%. So, the government is giving a lot of relaxation to cooperative society. For surcharge also, there is a relaxation over there. Here in AMT also, there is a relaxation. So, now, what will be the AMT position as of now? Pay attention, please. AMT position for cooperative societies. For cooperative society, normal case, it is 15%. And if it is an IFSC case, then 9%. And for others, others means other than cooperative society, individual, HUF, form, LLP. Normal case, it will remain at 18.5%, obviously subject to surcharge as whatever it is and for IFSC case, it is 9%. So, what is the amendment? The amendment is only this much, that is for cooperative society, the normal case, it will be 15% instead of 18.5%. Just check it once and then we will move ahead with the next one. Or you can take a photograph of this or write down this over here, whatever you want to do. Pause the lecture and write it down. So, the next amendment is in the chapter of penalty on page number 23.6. You can come to this page, page number 23.6, where the amendment is in section 271 AAB. And the government has made two amendments over here. First amendment is, the government has mentioned here notice under 148 because the notice under 153A is not relevant from 1st April 2021. Do you know that or not? Because the search for search and seizure assessment also... Now, the notice has to be issued in 148. For search and seizure assessment also from 1st April 2021, the notice is issued under 148. Prior to 2021, 
फॉर सर्च एंड सीजर असेसमेंट नोटिस वॉज इशूड अंडर वन फिफ्टी थ्री है so they have clearly mentioned i have also mentioned in the last year that there is a mistake in this particular section you can check my last year book if you want in the last year i have mentioned that there is a mistake in this section the government should mention over year 148 they should remove 153a but they have not removed 153a but they have inserted 148 at least they have made the provision correct now so this is the first amendment which is there over year the reason why this has to be inserted because now the search and seizure assessment is also done under section 148 and this penalty is in respect of search and seizure assessment it is not for normal assessee the second amendment which is made over here is made in three sections consistently the amendment is made under 271 ab the amendment is made under 271 ac the amendment is also made in 271 ad in all these three sections the government has made one similar amendment and that is the power to impose this penalty earlier it was only by ao but now it is also extended to cit appeal so this amendment is made in three sections this section this section and also this section so there are two amendments which are made over here please make a note of it and then we'll move ahead with the next one so as just now i have said you that the similar amendment is also made in aac and aad so you can check over here here also the government has given the power to cit appeal along with the ao is the section which is with respect to penalty for fake invoice which came in finance act 2020 if you remember penalty for fake invoices okay this is also a very recent section only not a very old and uh, it's not a very old section okay just check it once now the next amendment is on page number 23.9 and it is very 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 important amendment uh, which is there in section 68 now i'll just explain you what exactly this amendment is all about section 68 i'll try to explain you first of all there was already one amendment which was made in section 68 in finance act 2012 so this amendment is an extension to that amendment the finance act 2012 amendment used to say that that if there is a closely held company okay and this is the balance sheet of a closely held company and if there is a share application money or if there is a share capital listen carefully then the company has to explain the source of this that if the shareholders are resident from where the hell they have got this money suppose if the shareholder is mr a a promoter then it is the duty of the company to explain that from where the hell the shareholder who is a resident if the shareholder is non resident you are not supposed to explain but if the shareholder is resident it is the duty of the company closely held company to explain the source in the hands of the shareholder also so if the company is not able to explain from where the shareholder has got the money this amount will become what deemed income in the hands of company and they will be liable for 78% tax under section 115 bbe which is 60% tax 25% surcharge and 4% cess so what was the provision the provision was very simple that if i am a closely held company and if in my balance sheet there is a share capital there is a share application money which obviously i have received from shareholder then it is the duty of the company to explain the source in the hands of the shareholder also that from where the hell the shareholders are getting money to invest in your company if the shareholders are resident so if i am not able to explain the source in the hands of the shareholder then it then the, the company is under default and the company will be liable for tax and also penalty under 271 aac okay so now there is an extension to this so the government in finance act 2022 made an amendment the amendment there is no change in this this is same there is an extension and this extension is for every assessee not only closely held company every assessee this finance act 2012 amendment was only for a closely held company but this one is not for closely held this is for all assessee and this says that if there is a balance sheet and if there is a loan in your balance sheet <coughs> there is a borrowing in your balance sheet say you have taken a loan from mr a then you have to explain the source in the hands of mr a that from where the hell mr a has got the money to give you loan <laughs> that if you have a borrowing in your balance sheet then you have to explain that from where you have borrowed this money that person has financial credibility or not So earlier it was only applicable in case of closely held company, but now it is applicable to everyone for loan and borrowing. 
because loan and borrowing can be taken by any person na loan and borrowing can be taken by company also it can be taken by individual also it can be taken by partnership firm also llp also <coughs> so now this is a very very important amendment okay pay attention please what was the earlier amendment this was the 2012 amendment i'll just read that once for you all provided that where the ssc is a closely held company and the sum so credited consists of share application money etc any explanation offered by such ssc shall be deemed to be not satisfactory unless the person being a resident in whose name such credit is recorded in the books of such company also offers an explanation that is the shareholder about the nature and the source of such sum so credited and the such explanation in the opinion of the assessing officer as found to be satisfactory now what is the amendment the aforesaid provision of 68 have been amended with effect from ay 2324 to provide that the nature and the source of any sum whether in the form of circulate whether in the form of what loan or borrowing whether in the form of what loan or borrowing or any other liability credited in the books of accounts of an SSE shall be treated as explained only if the source of the fund is also explained in the hands of the creditor or the entity provider. Who is the creditor? The person who is giving you the loan is the creditor. So you have to provide the details of that person also. He will ask question to that person also that is the lender who has given you the loan. And that lender also has to explain from where the hell he has got the money. If the lender is not able to explain, then you are gone. You, who will be gone? The borrower will be gone. The borrower will be liable for what section 60. <clears throat> so, this is the dangerous amendment made by Finance Act 2022. Very important for exam. So, these are the final points which they can ask. Very technical points in the exam. To make your paper tough. Anyways, they are making direct text paper a lot of tough day by day. So, you have to do the subject in depth. Now, the next amendment in 271 AAC, as I have told you, in three sections, they have made similar amendment 271 AB, AAC, AAD. They have given the power to CIT appeal also, along with what? Along with the assessing officer. So, here also they have made this amendment, okay? Now, next, uh, there is one last amendment in the chapter of penalty. Then, we will move on to the next chapter. One last amendment is there in section 272A, whereby earlier... If there is a failure to answer any question to the department, failure to sign any statement, failure to furnish any information or return or statement or allow inspection, the penalty earlier was 100 rupees per day. So now that has been increased to how much? It has been increased to 500 rupees per day. That is the only small amendment which is made over here. So if you do certain defaults which are mentioned in 272A, like I have said you, so there was a penalty of 100 rupees per day. Now there is a penalty of what? 500 rupees per day. That is a very small amendment which is made over here. Just check it once. So the next amendment is on page number 24.2. That is in the chapter of dispute resolution committee. As you all might be knowing, in the last year, the government has brought the concept of dispute resolution committee for certain assessees. If there is an assessee whose returned income is less than or equal to 50 lakhs and the variation proposed by AO is less than or equal to 10 lakhs, then he has an option to go to dispute resolution committee. Okay, and then dispute resolution committee will do what? Will waive his penalty, will waive his penalty and prosecution. So will give him immunity from penalty and prosecution. So now, suppose, suppose there is an assessee whose return income is less than or equal to 50 lakhs or whose and and sorry both the conditions have to be fulfilled and the variation proposed by the AO is less than 10 lakhs so he is going he is opting for this option in that case he has to wait for the order of the DRC once the order of the DRC will come and then the AO will accordingly pass what his assessment order so now the question is in how many days the AO will pass the order after the DRC's order has been passed so, that time limit was missing under the income tax law. So, to fill that time limit, the government of India has made an amendment over here on page number 24.2. You can check over here that that time limit is, it has to be done within one month from the end of the month in which such order is received from the DRC. 
So whenever the AO will receive the order from the DRC, suppose the order from the DRC is received on the 28th of Feb 2023. Okay. Then the AO can pass the order, can complete the order till 31st of March 2023. Okay. So this is what this particular provision is all about, which it wants to say. So there was a time limit which was missing. Once the DRC will pass the order, obviously the AO has to give the effect of that order in his assessment order. So whatever the DRC will pass the order, DRC has the power to what? To reduce your income also. So if the DRC reduces the income, the AO also has to reduce the income. So if the AO is reducing the income, so if the DRC is reducing the income and passing the order for reduction of income, Accordingly, the AO has to pass the order. Within how much time? That time limit is mentioned over here. Just check it once and then we will move ahead with the next one. So, the next amendment is in a very important section of set off and carry forward which is section 79 and section 79 is only applicable to a closely held company which says that if a closely held company has to wants to carry forward its losses to the next year and set off in the next year. Then 51% of the shareholders in the year of loss and in the year in which you want to set off has to be same. Suppose there is a loss in 21-22 and I want to set off in 22-23. Then 51% of the shareholder of 21-22 as on the last day of 21-22 that is on 31st March 2022 has to be common with 31st March 2023. So, if the 51% shareholders as on the last day of the year of loss and the year in which you set off are not common, are not same, then the loss is lapsed. But then the government has given relaxation in this case to certain companies like relaxation number one. To certain companies, this section is not applicable. First, if a company is going to an insolvency and bankruptcy code for revival, then this section is not applicable. So, in that case, even if the number of shareholders fall below 51%, it is allowed. You can carry for the loss. Then if a company is going to NCLT, National Company Law Tribunal for what? For revival. Then also this section is not applicable. So now there is one more company which has been added over here. Now who is this company? This company is a strategic disinvestments of a public company into a private player. Like when the government is selling its PSU, as you all might be knowing, the government is selling lot of PSU to the private players. Why? Because PSUs are under losses. So now, if you sell the PSU to private players and there are a lot of losses with the PSU and if you sell to private players, their 51% shareholders will change and if their 51% shareholders will change, their losses will be lapsed because as per section 79, 51% of the shareholders have to be same. So, the government has given certain relaxations to disinvestments of PSU. So, let's see what kind of relaxation has been given and it has been given subject to some conditions. The provision of subsection 1, that is section 79.1, shall not apply to an erstwhile public sector company. So, it will not apply to a public sector company. Mainly, it has been given to Air India because Air India's disinvestment has happened last year and it has been given to our Tata's. Subject to the condition that the ultimate holding company of such erstwhile public company immediately after completion of the strategic disinvestment continue to hold Directly or through its subsidiary, indirectly, at least 51% of the voting power of the erstwhile public sector company in aggregate. So, what do I mean by this? So, for to explain this, I have made an example. Suppose this is a PSU which is getting sold. For example, this is Air India. Okay. And which is getting sold to Tata, a private player. So, what the government is saying that now, suppose there is an ultimate holding company and there is a subsidiary over here. And there is a subsidiary of subsidiary and this PSU is a subsidiary of this. So the government is saying that you can sell this PSU to any private player but directly and indirectly 51% has to be in the hands of the ultimate holding company. You can sell the remaining percentage. So directly and indirectly taking together. Suppose directly they have 20% and indirectly they should have 31%. If this is the case, we will allow the loss to carry forward or else we will not allow the loss to carry forward. So the government is saying that the PSU which is getting sold, at least 51% of the, at least 51% of the voting power has to be held by the ultimate holding company, either directly or indirectly through layers of lot of subsidiary. If that is done, then we will allow the loss to carry forward. Otherwise, the loss will be lapsed. So, if you want to take a photograph of this, you can take this. 
otherwise you will not understand the implication of this particular provision okay you can take a photograph of this then we'll move ahead with the next one okay so let's move ahead with the next one now next one is what next one next amendment is again in the chapter of set off and carry forward for example there is an SSC say Mr. A who has been found with undisclosed income of say 5 crore rupees. Now the government says that you have to pay tax on this. This undisclosed income will be chargeable to tax as per section 68, 69, 69A, 69B, 69D etc. And there will be 78% tax on it. Now what SSC is saying? Wait, wait. You have found 5 crore na, as undisclosed income. I have 4 crore loss kept with me. Loss of earlier year. Please allow me the set off of that and on balance income you can take tax whatever you want to take. Okay. So what does he used to do? This undisclosed income which has been found after a lot of efforts of the officer. Assess he has a lot of losses kept with him. So assess he is trying to set off what? That loss against this income. So the government of India made a new section 79A and they said that not allowed. If your undisclosed income is found in search or if your undisclosed income is found in survey, other than, other than, other than, other than, one survey is excluded, other than the TDS and TCS survey which is covered in 133A subsection 2A, you have to learn the provisions in such minute details. So, if you are covered by search, if you are covered by survey, other than 133A subsection 2A survey, which is a survey done for the compliance of TDS and TCS. Any other case, if you are caught, if you are caught with undisclosed income, we will not allow you to set off your losses against this income. Just check this. This is an amendment which is made by Finance Act 2022. Very important one. I will just read, in section 70 to 80, there are specific provisions relating to set off or carry forward and set off of losses while computing income under various heads and with respect to different classes of person. However, currently there is no provision to disallow claim of set off of losses or unaccounted depreciation against undisclosed income corresponding to difference in stock, undervaluation of stock, unaccounted cash payment, etc. which is detected during the course of search or survey proceedings, blah, 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 blah. So, they have made an amendment. Here the amendment starts. To disallow the aforesaid adjustment of losses, 79A has been inserted with effect from assessment year 22-23. It provides for the following. Section 79A is applicable notwithstanding anything contained in this act. Second point is important. Section 79A is applicable when there is a search which is initiated or which is the requisition under 132A which is also a part of search and seizure only. Or there is a survey but other than 133-2A which is a TDS or TCS survey. In this case, section 79A is not applicable. The total income includes any undisclosed income. If the above conditions are satisfied, what are the conditions? That is, there is a search or there is a survey and the total income includes any undisclosed income. Then the SSC will not be eligible to set off against such undisclosed income any loss, whether brought for a loss and even unabsorbed depreciation. Loss will not be allowed. No, no loss will be allowed to be set off against such income nor any unabsorbed depreciation will be allowed to be set off against such income. And what do I mean by undisclosed income? This is similar to what you have done earlier in 271 AAB. You can check 271 AAB. It is there over there also. I will just brief you if you want. It is the same thing. Undisclosed income means an income which is not disclosed by you till the time the search was done or survey was done. Suppose today's the search is done and you have not disclosed that in the books of account. So that becomes undisclosed. Suppose today's search is done and yesterday you have disclosed everything, then that cannot be called as undisclosed income. This is what the definition of undisclosed income is all about over here. You can just go through this provision. This is an important one, very important for example. Just go through this and then we will move ahead with the next one. So, let us move ahead with the next chapter where there are some amendments which are made. Not many amendments luckily made in the chapter of TDS now. But there are some amendments which are made in the chapter of TDS. Let us see one by one all of them. Okay. First amendment is made in 194 IA that is TDS on purchase of immobile property. Now what was the position earlier? What was the position earlier and what is the position now? I will just explain you with the help of example. 
earlier if you purchase if you are a buyer and if you purchase an immobile property of a consideration which is greater than or equal to 50 lakh rupees then you have to deduct tds at the rate of how much percentage one percentage okay so if the consideration is say suppose if the consideration is 75 lakhs then you have to deduct tds of 75000 rupees and pay to the central government before the prescribed time but now the government has made the amendment now what does consideration mean that was also defined earlier okay even today it is applicable the consideration includes all the things the consideration for immobile property shall include all charges of the nature of club membership fee car parking fee electricity and water facility fee maintenance fee advance fee any other charges of similar nature which are incidental to the transfer of immobile property so all these things are part of consideration okay so now the government has said that no 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 we are not satisfied with this now the government says that suppose if the consideration is 55 lakhs but if the stamp duty value is greater than the consideration suppose it is 65 lakhs then you have to deduct TDS on whichever is higher. It means now you have to deduct TDS on higher of the two. So if the stamp duty value is higher, then on stamp duty value, if the consideration is higher, then on consideration. Whichever is higher, you have to deduct TDS on that much amount, one percentage. For example, for example, if the consideration is if the consideration is say 55 lakhs and the stamp duty value is 65 lakhs then you will deduct tds on 65 lakhs suppose if the consideration is 65 lakhs and the stamp duty value is 55 lakhs then you will deduct tds on 65 lakhs suppose suppose now the twist will come in the story suppose one of the amount is less than 50 lakhs suppose this is 48 lakhs and this is 52 lakhs then whichever is higher this will be deducted on 52 lakhs so when this section is not applicable if both the consideration as well as the stamp duty value is lower than 50 lakhs then this provision will not be applicable if one of the amount is greater than or equal to 50 lakhs even if it is equal to 50 lakhs because the provision is applicable on 50 lakhs or more if one of the two if consideration is greater than or equal to 50 lakhs or if stamp duty value is greater than or equal to 50 lakhs if either of the two is greater than or equal to 50 lakhs, you are liable for 194 IATDS. So be very careful. There is one question which I will be showing you in a while. Before that, you can just see the provision over here. 1% of total consideration or stamp duty value, whichever is higher. Now, when this section is not applicable, this section is not applicable where both the sale consideration and stamp duty value both is less than 50 lakhs. If both of them is below 50 lakhs, then 194 IA is not applicable. Just go through it. Till that time, I'll just search the question in the question bank and I'll show you the question also. Okay. So here is the question which is given on page number 32.12 in your question bank. And this is a very comprehensive question bank. It covers all the questions of ICI. It covers all the RTP. Last five attempt RTP from November 20. To November 2022, all RTPs are covered. All mock test papers are last four to five attempts. Mock test papers are covered. Last three to four attempts, past exam papers are also suggested answers covered. Everything is given in this particular RTP, in this particular question bank. Okay. So now this is the question where in first case uh, both are less than 50 lakhs, so not applicable. Yes, this is less than 50 lakhs, but this is exactly 50 lakhs. Yes, so you have to deduct TDS on 50 lakhs at 1%. So in the third case, you have to deduct TDS on 51 lakh. And in the fourth case, you have to deduct TDS at 58 lakhs. Just check it once and then we'll move ahead with the next one. Okay. You can go through the solution below also if you want. Now, the next amendment is on page number 28.17. That is over here. There is a note which we used to write in our class. You all might be knowing that there are certain sections under income tax law in which if you are an individual and HUF, then you are liable to deduct TDS only if your last year's business turnover is greater than 1 crore if you are doing business or if you are into profession, then your professional gross receipt of the last year has to be greater than 50 lakh rupees. Then only certain sections are applicable like 194A. 194C, 194H, 
194i, 194j. These are the five sections which are only applicable to those assessees whose last year's turnover of business is greater than if, if you are individual actually. If I am a partnership firm, then I don't have to see all these things. Then I have to deduct the TDS. But if I am an individual, if I am an HUF, then there is a relaxation which is given to me. Now, in this section, there are two more sections which are added by Finance Act 2022. Now, these are the two sections which are added by Finance Act 2022. And ironically, both these sections are newly inserted sections. Both of them are newly inserted sections in which year? In this year only, in Finance Act 2022. So, we will be learning about both of them one by one. One we are going to learn in this chapter, one we are going to learn in the chapter of virtual digital asset. Okay. So, we will be doing about both of them. But in these two sections also, if the deductor is an individual and HUF, then they are liable to deduct TDS only if the last year's business turnover is greater than 1 crore or if the last year's profession turnover is greater than 50 lakh rupees. You can just go through it and then we will move ahead with the next one. Now, the next amendment is on page number 28.28, which I was just speaking about that there is a newly inserted section 194R, which is applicable from 2022 onwards. So, I will just explain you the reason of this particular provision. Pay attention, please. Suppose there is Mr. A, a customer, and there is a seller over here, Mr. B. Okay. Now, Mr. B has suppose uh, sold some raw material to Mr. A and Mr. A liked it like anything. He's, he loved the raw material, the quality of the raw material, the service given by Mr. B. So, in return, Mr. B, Mr. A is giving some benefit or some perquisite to what? To Mr. B. Say he is giving him an iPhone or he is giving him 10 lakh rupees cash or he is giving him say for example a, a foreign trip. So, we all know that this is taxable in the hands of Mr. B because it is received in the form of a business benefit. So any benefit or perquisite received in the business or profession in exercise of a business and profession is taxable. We all know that. But now the government is going one step ahead. And telling Mr. A that if Mr. B is a resident, then when you are giving the benefit to him, now you have to deduct TDS also. So now the government is not restricting itself to taxability, the government is also putting responsibility of Mr. A to deduct TDS on behalf of Mr. B. So when I am giving a benefit or perquisite, so I have to deduct the TDS. How much percentage? What is the timing of TDS? If I give cash benefit, then how to deduct TDS? If I am giving kind benefit, then how to deduct TDS? All these questions are answered in 194R. So, let's see this section one by one, step by step. Let's follow this. Who is responsible for tax deduction? Any person responsible for providing benefit. So, who the person who is providing any benefit, that is the giver of the benefit, the giver of the uh, of the perquisite will be deducting TDS. Any person responsible for providing any benefit or perquisite pertaining to business or profession carried on by deductee is responsible for deducting tax under 194R. But if the deductor is individual HF, as I have told you, then they are liable to deduct only if the last year's business turnover is greater than 1 crore or if they are doing profession, then the last year's profession gross receipt has to be greater than 50 lakhs. This is something which I have just told you that which was mentioned in that note. Do you remember that? Okay. Now, who is deductee? Who is deductee? Deductee is any resident who gets the aforesaid benefit. So, deductee has to be resident. If the deductee is non-resident, what if the deductee is non-resident? Then deductee is in 195, not here. Then 195 may be applicable, not this section. Okay. What is the threshold over here? The threshold is 20,000 rupees. So, when am I supposed to deduct? When the benefit or perquisite in the financial year exceeds 20,000 rupees, only then I am supposed to deduct the TDS. Okay. If the benefit or perquisite is exceeding 20,000 rupees, then I am supposed to deduct TDS. Otherwise, I am not liable to deduct the TDS. Is it clear? I hope it is clear. 
What is the rate of tax? 10% is the rate of tax. The TDS rate is 10% over year. What if I am giving a benefit to the other person which is in kind? Then how will I deduct TDS? Then you have to deduct TDS. Then you have to follow the same procedure that you follow for lottery. You remember that in case of lottery? If there is a winning in kind, then what am I supposed to do? If I am giving someone a winning in cash of 1 crore rupees, then I will deduct 30% TDS in lottery. But if I am giving in kind a BMW car of 1 crore rupees, then how will I deduct TDS? Then in that case, the government says that the deductor has to ensure that the other person has paid the tax. Only then you have to release the winning. Only then you have to release the benefit. Only then you have to release the perquisite. So if you are giving the benefit or perquisite in kind to someone, then you have to ask the other person to pay the tax first. Then I will give you the, the package tour. The, the tickets of the Europe, Europe tour, which I am giving you. First pay the tax, then I will give you iPhone 14 Pro Max. First pay the tax, then I will give you Mac Pro, MacBook Pro. Check it here. If however, the benefit is only in kind or partly in cash, partly in kind, but the cash is not sufficient to meet the liability of TDS in respect of whole of such benefit or perquisite, then the person responsible for providing such benefit or perquisite shall, before releasing the benefit or perquisite, ensure my liability is not to deduct. If I am paying in cash, if I am paying in money, my liability is to deduct. But if I am paying in kind, my liability is just to ensure that the other person has paid the tax on that benefit and perquisite. He will pay the tax, he will show me the chalan and then I will give the benefit. Okay. Now, what is the timing of deduction? So, the timing of deduction over here is before releasing the benefit or perquisite. At any time before releasing the benefit or perquisite, you have to deduct the tax. And one last thing over here, which is very, very, very important now. The CBDD has said that in application of this section, if there is any difficulty, we will come up with a great circular. So, CBDD has come up with a great circular, a very big circular, which is covered in book 2. I am doing it right now itself, right now, because then it is fresh now. Where the CBDT has given lot of FAQs, around 8 to 9 frequently asked questions have been answered. So, there are lot of questions which is going to come now, which I will be addressing now immediately after this. Okay, so I request you all to go through this provision once at your end properly and then we will move ahead with that circular and then we will move ahead with the next part of this chapter. Okay, so now this circular is extremely important for exam. The last two, three things which we have done were not very important. But this one is extremely important. As you all might be knowing that there is one new section which is introduced by the government in Finance Act 2022 itself. 194R. Okay, pay absolute attention. What is 194R? We have done that in the chapter of TDS. You might not remember that, but we have done that. You can go and check the chapter of TDS. So what is 194R? If you are giving any benefit or perquisite to anybody, okay, and if the other person is a resident, you have to deduct TDS at the rate of 10%, okay. So, you are a payer and the payee is resident. So if the payer is giving any benefit or perquisite, then deduct TDS at the rate of 10%. So, the CBDT has given a long FAQ on this, discussing each and every aspect of this section in detail. The first question which is raised over here is, is the payer supposed to see that the benefit or the perquisite which I am giving to the payee is taxable under section 28.4? Is the payer supposed to see that? Or the payer is liable to deduct TDS on any benefit or perquisite, whether taxable under 28.4 or whether taxable under other section or whether it is even not taxable, then also deduct the TDS. Be very careful. Be very careful. There are various kind of sections under income tax law. This is a very, very, very important circular for your exams. To pay absolute attention, we will go into the depth of this circular. The way we have gone into the depth of the circular of virtual digital asset. Be very careful about it, okay.
the question which is raised over here the first question the government has said that you have to deduct tds on benefit or perquisite if you give to some other person okay the question which is raised over here is whether the benefit and perquisites will cover only those benefits and perquisites which are taxable under section 284 under pgbp or it can be any other benefit or perquisites which are taxable under any other section or it will also include those perquisites and benefits which are not even taxable so there are two types of sections under income tax law let me give you an example one is section 194e which is about non resident sportsmen one is section 195 which is generally for non residents in this section it is specifically written that the other person's income has to be chargeable to tax in India, then only deduct TDS. It is specifically written over here. But here it is not specifically written. Always deduct TDS. There is nothing written over here in 194E that you have to deduct TDS only if the sportsman income is chargeable to then nothing is written. Nothing is written. So what has to be done in 194R? Let's see. Is it necessary? Read the question very carefully. The same to same question will come in exam. Let me tell you. Same question will come in exam. Same to same question will come. Is it necessary that the person providing benefit or perquisite needs to check if the amount is taxable under 28.4 of the Act before deducting tax under 194 R? No, no and no. You are not supposed to check all those things. The deductor is not required to check whether the amount of benefit or perquisite that he is providing would be taxable in the hands of recipient under 28.4. The amount could be taxable under any other section like 41.1 etc. 194R of the Act cast an obligation on the person responsible for providing any benefit or perquisite to a resident to deduct tax at 10%. Very important line. Very important line is coming. There is no further requirement to check whether the amount is taxable in the hands of recipient or under which section it is taxable. There is no need to do all those things. Moral of the story. What is the moral of the story of this question? The moral of the story of this question is very simple. If I am giving you any benefit or perquisite, whether it is taxable under PGPP or it is taxable under other heads or whether it is even not taxable, if I am giving you any benefit or perquisite, it is my duty to deduct tax. That's it. Whether it is taxable or not taxable or taxable in this section or that section, it doesn't matter. Even if it is not taxable, you have to deduct TDS. This is the ultimate conclusion. Such requirement is there in 195. Yes, in 195, you have to check the other person income is taxable. Further, such requirement is not there in 194E for non-resident sportsmen. This is what I have explained you through this particular discussion. Is it clear? Just go through it. Every question has to be done with me only and then, I'll, then only I will go ahead with the next question. Question number 2. Is it necessary that the benefit or perquisite must be in kind? Is it necessary? The answer is no. If the benefit is in cash, deduct TDS. But if the benefit is in kind, there is a special proviso in section what? 194R. What is the proviso? If I am giving you benefit in kind, then I will not deduct TDS. I have told you earlier also. If I am giving you benefit in kind, I will told you in the chapter on the, of lottery also winning in kind. Then what is my obligation? My obligation is to ensure that you have paid the tax. And then only I will release the benefit. Then only I will release the perquisite. First I will tell the pay, go and pay the tax, show me the chalan. Then I will release the winning. So it is not necessary that the benefit has to be in kind or cash. It can be in any form. If it is in cash, deduct TDS. If it is in kind, ensure that the other person has paid the tax. Check. Tax under 194R of the Act is required to be deducted. Whether the benefit is in cash or in kind is required to be deducted. Whether it is in cash or kind. Okay. And this proviso tells you that you have to ensure that 
the other person has paid the tax. Okay, check. Question number three. Is there any requirement to deduct tax under 194 of the Act when the benefit or perquisite is in the form of a capital asset? So, the benefit which I am giving you, if it is that, if that is your capital asset. For example, I am giving you a land. Land is a capital asset. Now, the CBDT has mentioned car also over here. Car is not a capital asset. This is a mistake by CBDT. By default, personal movable car is not a capital asset. Yes, business movable car is a capital asset. But if it is a personal movable car, then it is not a capital. This is the example given by CBDT, which is wrong. So, now, coming back to the question. Am I supposed to deduct TDS if I am giving you benefit, which is a capital asset? I am giving you jewelry in the form of benefit. I am giving you painting in the form of benefit. Yes, you have to deduct TDS. This is what it is mentioned. You don't have to check the nature of the asset. Check. The nature of the asset need not be checked. Whether the uh, nature in the hand of the other person is a capital asset or a revenue item. You have to deduct TDS. You don't have to even check whether it is taxable or not taxable. Forget about whether it is a capital asset or not. You don't have to check the taxability also. Still you have to deduct TDS. Forget about being a capital asset or not being a capital asset. You have to deduct TDS. Check it please. Just read it once. Now, the next question, question number 4 is a big one. There are a lot of small, 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 small points over here. I will try to explain them with the help of an example. Whatever is given over here, we will go very slowly with it. It is a big question having a very big answer with a lot of examples given. Whether sales discount, cash discount, rebates are benefit or perquisites. For example, for example, if I give you a sales discount, for example, I am a teacher. Okay, and you are a student, and suppose my fees is, for example, 20,000 rupees, but if I give you a discount of say 3,000 rupees, then whether this 3,000 rupees is a benefit which is provided by me to you, the answer is yes, actually yes. Actually speaking, yes, it's a benefit given by me to you. But in that case, am I liable? Because I am giving you a benefit of 3000 rupees in the form of discount. Am I liable to deduct TDS on this? The government has said no. Because in that case, there will be a practical difficulty. There will be a lot of practical difficulty in what? In deducting TDS in such cases. So, the government has clarified that there is no need to deduct TDS in such cases. Okay. Pay attention. Whether sales discount, cash discount, there will be practical. In that case, so everybody gives discount to some of the other person. You go to the mall, you buy something, they are giving you discount. You go to the shop, you go to the grocery shop, he is giving you some discount. So, everybody will start deducting TDS only or what? <laughs> it will be very, very practically difficult to do, apply this. Whether sales discount, cash discount and rebates are benefit or perquisites. To remove such difficulty, it is clarified that no, no, no. No tax is required to be deducted under 194R of the Act on sales discount, on cash discount, on rebates allowed to customers. If you allow all these things to customers, there is no need to what? There is no need to deduct TDS. It cannot be considered as a benefit or perquisite given to the customer. There could be another situation. So, this is the first part. Now, this is the second part. There could be another situation where a seller is selling its item from its stock in trade to buyer. Okay. The seller offers two items free with the purchase of 10 items. So, I tell you if you buy 10 items, I will give you two items free. Am I supposed mm -hmm. to deduct TDS on those two items? Because two items I am giving you as a benefit of purchase. <laughs> in substance, the seller is actually selling 12 items at a price of 10. Actually. Let us assume that the price of each item is 12 rupees. Okay. So one pen is sold for 12 rupees. Now I am telling you, I am a seller. Let me give you an example. I am a seller. Cost per pen 
is how much? Rupees 12. You are a buyer. And I am telling you, I am giving you an offer. Buy 10 pence and I will give you 2 pen free. So, you will pay me how much for 10 pence? 10 into 12 rupees, 120 rupees. So, in 120 rupees, he is getting how many pence? Actually, he is getting 12 pence. Okay. So, he has paid actually me how much? 120 rupees for 12 pence. So, the 2 pence which I am giving him free. It happens now in mall also. Buy to get one free. It happens or not in malls? Go to a shopping mall, you see the offer is going on. Diwali offer, New Year offer. Buy to get one free. That one which he is giving you free is not actually free. It is included in the cost of two obviously. The two pens which I am giving you free is included in the cost of one pen. It is included in the cost of ten pens. So, am I liable to deduct TDS on that one pen or two pen or one shirt? Again, they have said no. No need to do. In this case, the selling price for the seller would be 120 for 12 items, obviously. For buyer, he has purchased 12 items at a price of 10, just like seller. The purchase price for the buyer is two, for 12 items, 120. And is expected to record so in the books. In such a situation, again, then could be a difficulty in applying the provisions of 194R. And so, remove difficulty, it is clarified that on the above facts, no TDS is required to be deducted. <laughs> it is clarified that. Now, very important line. <coughs> the situation is different when the free samples are given and the above relaxation would not apply to situation of free sample. So if I am giving you absolutely free sample, then I am liable to deduct TDS. That is a different situation altogether. So, when I am giving you discount, 1000 rupees item at 800 rupees, no TDS. When I am giving you buy to get one free, no TDS. But I am giving you all 10 items free without buying anything, then it is a free sample. There is a difference between the first example and this one. If I am giving you all 10 items free, then it is a free sample, then TDS is applicable. So, relaxation is only for these two cases. Do not extend this relaxation to other items as it is written in the circular itself. Similarly, this relaxation should not be extended to other benefits provided by the seller in connection with sale. To illustrate, the following are some of the examples of benefits or perquisites on which tax is required to be deducted. Tax is required to be deducted. The list is not exhaustive. It is just illustrative. Only in two cases, the government has said, do not do not deduct TDS. Where? You are giving discount. Where? You are giving buy to get one free. <laughs> Apart from that, deduct TDS. Like, in these cases, you have to deduct TDS. Where a person gives incentives. In the form of cash, I am giving you cash incentive, I am giving you car, I am giving you TV, computer, gold chain, mobile phone. <coughs> As an incentive, <coughs> I am liable to deduct TDS. Where a person sponsors a trip, I am sponsoring you a trip, I am telling you, do this much sale for me. I am telling the websites like Lecturewala, like Zero in Fee, like Conferenza, these are my official website owners. If, these, if I tell them, if you sell 100 lectures in one month, I will give you a foreign trip. I will give you a foreign trip. That is taxable. I am providing free ticket for an event. For IPL etc, I am giving you free ticket. That is taxable. I am giving free medical samples for medical practitioner. The pharma company is giving what? Free medicine to the doctors as a medical sample. Taxable. The above examples are only illustrative. The relaxation provided from non-deduction of tax for sales, discount, rebate is only for those items and should not be extended to others. It should, this should not be extended to others. Only two cases where you are giving discount, rebate or where you are giving buy to get one free. Then only relaxation is there. Let us talk about uh, further points. It is further clarified that these benefits or perquisites may be used by the owner. Yes, director, employee or their relatives who in their individual capacity may not be carrying on business or profession. For example, I am giving a benefit to Mukesh Ambani. Okay, actually I am giving benefit to Reliance Industry, but Reliance Industry cannot take that benefit. Now, that is an artificial person. So, the benefit of 
what foreign tour is taken by Mukesh Ambani? Suppose my classes is a partnership firm. My partnership firm cannot take benefit. My partners can take benefit. That's what they are saying. However, tax is required to be deducted by person in the name of the recipient entity. So, I have to deduct TDS in the name of Reliance Industry, in the name of the partnership firm, in the name of the company, not in the name of Mukesh Ambani. Even though the benefits are taken by Mukesh Ambani, Nita Ambani. In the usage by the owner, director, employee, relatives by virtue of the relation with the recipient entity in substance, the benefit of perquisites has been provided by the person to the recipient entity. So, if, so if I am giving a benefit to a particular person, so I am why I am giving benefit to that person? Because that person has a relationship with that entity. So if, if Reliance Industry has done something good for my business. I will give a pen to Reliance Industry. What will Reliance Industry as a company will do with that pen? I have to give that pen to Mukesh Ambani only. Na? So, I have to deduct TDS in the name of what? In the name of company only. Because Mukesh Ambani is getting that pen from me because of the company. That's what it has to say. Further, to illustrate, free medical sample may be provided by company to doctor who is an employee of the hospital. Okay. So, I am a pharma company. I am giving to doctor a free medical sample. Okay. Why I am giving to doctor? Because doctor is an employee of the company, of the hospital. The TDS under 194 R of the Act is required to be deducted by the company in the name of the hospital as the benefit of perquisite is provided to doctor on account of him being what? The employee of the hospital. I have to deduct what? The TDS in the name of the hospital only because Employee, the doctor is nothing but an employee of the hospital. Hospital does not have hands. Hands are in the, are with the doctors. They are going to give medicines to the people, to the patients. So, if I am a pharma company and you are an hospital and there is an employee doctor, if I am giving some free medicines to the doctor, I will deduct TDS in the name of the company. That is in the name of hospital. Thus, in substance, the benefit of perquisite is provided to hospital, obviously. The hospital may subsequently treat this benefit or perquisites as perquisite given to its employees. Now, again, another new angle. I am giving the benefit to hospital and then hospital can treat that they have given that benefit to what doctors. I will deduct TDS of hospital and hospital will deduct TDS of doctor because doctor is an employee and the hospital is giving those medicines to the doctor on behalf of me. Listen carefully. Very, very important. I am a pharma company. I am giving medicines to doctor. Who is an employee. But I am not giving to doctor. I am actually giving to hospital. So under 194R, I will deduct TDS of hospital. And then hospital can deduct TDS under section 192 of doctor because doctor is an employee and this can be treated as what perquisite given by hospital to its employee okay this is what it has to say check if a person who is is employee under section 17 of the act and deduct tax under 192 in such a case it would be first taxable in the hands of hospital and then allowed as an expenditure as salary then ultimately the amount will be taxed in the hands of the employee and not in the hands of the hospital Hospital can get the credit of the tax deducted under 194R by furnishing its tax return. It is further clarified that the threshold of 20,000 rupees in the second proviso to 194R, in 194R there is a threshold of 20,000 rupees. If the benefit is more than 20,000, then only you are supposed to deduct TDS. Okay. It is required to be seen with respect to the recipient entity. Similarly, the tax is required to be deducted under 194R. Now, suppose the doctor is not an employee but working like a consultant. There are two types of doctor. One doctor is working like an employee in the hospital. Another doctor is working like a consultant, means a third party. What has to be then? In that case, the benefit of perquisite provider may deduct tax under 194R with hospital as a recipient. And then hospital may again deduct TDS under 194R of the consultant. Why? Why? Reason is very simple. Pay attention. I will just make a simple chart. This is a pharma company. And there is a doctor. 
Now we have to see, and there is a hospital. So when the pharma company will give the medicines, free medicines, 194 hour. And when the doctor will, when the med, when the hospital will give the medicine to doctor, and if the doctor is employee, and if the doctor is consultant, if the doctor is employee, section 192. If the doctor itself is a consultant, then section 194 hour again. Okay, under the current section itself. Okay, you can take a photograph of this if you want. Okay. Now, <coughs> to remove difficulty as an alternative, the original benefit or the perquisite provider may directly deduct tax under 194R of the Act in case of consultant or recipient. So, the government has given one more option over here. One more option is what? Instead of you directly first deducting the tax of hospital and then hospital will again deduct of consultant, pharma company can direct the, directly deduct under section 194R for consultant. That can also be done. They can directly also deduct the TDS of the consultant. That is also an option which is given to them. One last thing, you are not supposed to deduct TDS in case the hospital is a government hospital who is not carrying on what? Any business or profession. Okay. So, there is only one relaxation. When it is given as a discount, rebate or buy to get one free, no TDS. Otherwise, in most of the cases, you have to deduct TDS. In case of hospital, you have to deduct TDS. Hospital will deduct TDS of the employee doctor and also of consultant. And the pharma company will deduct TDS of hospital. Secondly, uh, one more thing is there. Whereby, if if I am giving benefit to Reliance uh, to Mukesh Ambani, I will deduct TDS not of Mukesh Ambani, but of Reliance. If you are giving benefit to Arish Khan classes and me, you will deduct TDS in the name of Arish Khan classes, not me. Because the recipient entity is a partnership firm and company and not an individual, okay. So this is what this provision is all about. Just go through it once and then we will move, move ahead with the next question, okay. Now, the next question will be, when you provide any benefit or perquisite to any person, suppose if I am providing this phone to you, okay, as a benefit or perquisite, how will I value that? So, the government has said that you have to value how the valuation of benefit or perquisite will be carried on. The government have said that you have to take the fair market value, okay, by default, by default, fair market value, but except in following cases, where you have purchased that item. Suppose if I purchase this phone for 50,000 rupees, then rupees 50,000 rupees, the purchase price will become the, the price at which you will deduct the TDS. Or suppose if I have not purchased this, but I have manufactured this, then the price at which you charge to customer, that will be the price. So by default, you have to take the fair market value. But if you have purchased and then you are giving, then purchase price. If you have manufactured and then you are giving that benefit or purchase it, then manufacturing price. Further, GST will not be included for the purpose of valuation. So, you are not supposed to deduct TDS on what? The GST portion. As you generally do not deduct TDS on GST portion while deducting the TDS. Okay. Just check it once. Now, the next question is a very, very important question and a very practical question. There are so many companies who give what? Sample product to social media influencer. Like for example, suppose Samsung has given a phone to a tech reviewer. So this phone which is given to tech reviewer, will this be subject to TDS? Now that depends upon. If the reviewer returns the phone, after reviewing, he is returning the phone, then no TDS. But if he is keeping it with him, he is not returning, not returning, then deduct TDS. Because if he is returning the phone after reviewing it, then there is no benefit given to the person, na? to the reviewer. But the company is saying, review the phone, keep it with you, then you have to deduct TDS under 194R. This is what question number 6 has to say, check it once, all of you, read. 
read it. Okay. The next one is with respect to out of pocket expense. If you go for article ship, you might be knowing about what is out of pocket expense. Whether reimbursement of out of pocket expense incurred by service provider in the course of rendering services is a benefit or perquisite. Let me give you an example. Suppose there is a practicing chartered accountant who is in Mumbai and he has to go for an audit say in Gujarat. So now if he is going to audit for a Gujarat, so he will be staying in a hotel, okay. So he is staying in hotel. The hotel gave a bill to practicing chartered accountant and the bill is in the name of client. The bill is in the name of client. Okay. So what practicing chartered accountant did? The practicing chartered accountant paid the bill. Paid the bill and the client later on what? Reimbursed. Obviously, the practicing chartered accountant will pay the bill and the client will what? Will reimburse. And the bill is in whose name? Is in the name of the client. So in that case, is the client giving me any benefit or perquisite? The answer is no. This is not a benefit or perquisite. This is a part and parcel of my service. Without being staying in the hotel, I cannot provide you the service. And therefore, staying in the hotel is mandatory for providing the service. This cannot be subject to what TDS? Check. This is what the government has to. Sometimes the invoice of out-of-pocket expenses obtained in the name of the client and accordingly paid by the CA is reimbursement client. So, CA paid and the client reimbursed. In this case, since the expense paid by CA for which the expense is made is incurred only and exclusively for the purpose of rendering services, is only and exclusively for the purpose of rendering services to client and then the invoice is also in the name of the client and the reimbursement made by client being the service recipient will not be considered as a benefit for the purpose of 194R. No tedious. But if the invoice is not in the name of client and the payment is made by client, Payment is made by client directly or reimbursed. It is the benefit of perquisite provided by client to CA. So, the year, if you don't want a TDS to be deducted, the invoice has to be in the name of the client. The invoice cannot be in the name of the CA. The CA cannot make the invoice in his name. If the invoice is in the name of client and if the CA is making the payment and the client is reimbursing, no TDS. But if the invoice is in the name of the CA, then nothing can be done, then the TDS will be deducted. Just check it once. Okay. Now, the next is also a very, very practical question. For example, there is a company and the company wants to keep a conference for delay, uh, dealers. Say there is a company. And the company wants to keep conference for what dealers? or customers to explain the importance of the product, how good is our product, how our product is better than our competitors, so on and so forth. Okay. So, they are keeping some conference for that the dealers are staying in a hotel, they are getting some food to eat, etc. They are getting some leisures. So, whether that will be considered as a benefit or perquisite or not. Okay. So, let us see whether the what the government has to say. The government is very precise about it. If there is a dealer conference to educate the dealer about the product of the company, a company has thousands of dealers. Because of the dealer, the company is standing today. Dealers are the one who are selling the product on behalf of the company. So, the company has to educate them. For that, the company is keeping a conference. Is it a benefit or purpose? The expenditure pertaining to dealer or business conference would not be considered would not be considered as a perquisite for the purpose of section 194R of the Act in case of 
in case where the dealer or the business conference is held with the prime object to educate dealers or customers about any of the following or similar aspects. Okay. What? So the company is explaining the dealers or customer new product being launched. If this is the reason why the conference is held, no tedious. Discussion as to how the product is better than others, that is the competitors. Obtaining orders from dealers or customers. Teaching sales techniques to dealers or customers. Addressing queries of the dealers or customer. Reconciliation of accounts with the customers. So if the company is providing dealer these benefits, then there is no need to deduct tedious. However, such conference must not be in the nature of incentive or benefit to select dealers or customer. It should be for all. It should be for what? It should be for all the customers and all the dealers. It should not be for selected customers. Secondly, in these cases, you have to deduct TDS. You have to deduct TDS. In the following cases, the expenditure would be considered as benefit for the purpose of 194R. Example, expenses in attributable to leisure trip or leisure component, even if it is incidental to the dealer or business conference. So, suppose if the dealers have come for the conference and you are giving them some leisure, say you are giving them spa. What is the need for spa when they are coming for a, a, for a conference? What is the need for that spa? There is no need. So you are giving them a leisure. So, the leisure which you are giving them, even though it is incidental to the dealer or business conference, it will be subject to TDS. Or if you are bringing family members along with you, why the hell you are bringing family members along with you? The company is giving the air tickets, etc. for the family members also. That will be subject to tax. TDS. Or if you are overstaying or you are coming before, 10 days before the conference starts, that is also subject to tax. Check. If you are getting some leisure from the company, subject to TDS. Your family members you are bringing along with you, subject to TDS. If you are overstaying or you are coming to prior stay, the uh, conference is going to start from 10th. You are coming already from 4th, 6 days prior. Why the hell you are coming? So, the prior stay and the extended stay which you are getting will be subject to TDS. Okay, I hope it is clear. Okay. Question number 9 is very simple which I have already explained you earlier and question number 10 is similar to question number 6 of the previous question. If you see question number 6 of previous question, it will be exactly copy paste. Okay. I may not have to speak that. But yes, question number 9, I will speak. Am I supposed to deduct TDS in case I am giving a cash benefit? The answer is yes. If I am giving a cash benefit, I am definitely liable to deduct TDS. Am I supposed to deduct TDS if I am giving a kind benefit? No, no, no. Then what am I supposed to do? I am supposed to just ensure that the other person has paid the tax. The question is, how will I ensure? That's what it is answered over here. Let's check. Section 194R provides that if the benefit or perquisite is in kind or partly in kind and in cash is not sufficient to meet TDS, that the person responsible for providing such benefit or perquisite is required to ensure that the tax required to be deducted has been paid in respect of the benefit or perquisite before releasing the benefit or perquisite. How can such person be satisfied that the tax has been deposited? How will I ensure that? That the other person has paid the tax. So, what am I supposed to do? That's what it has been answered over here. Such recipient would pay tax in the form of advance tax. So, the recipient has to pay advance tax. The tax deductor may rely on the declaration along with the copy of advance tax payment chalan provided by the recipient confirming that the tax required to be deducted on the benefit or perquisite has been deposited. So, the other person will pay advance tax and will give me the chalan. It is as simple as this. This would then be required. To be reported in TDS return along with the chalam number. Then I will report that in the TDS return. In form 26Q. In the alternative, as an option to remove difficulty, if any, the benefit provider may deduct the tax under 194R and pay the government. The tax should be deducted after taking into account of the fact that the tax paid by him as TDS is also a benefit under 194R. In form 26Q, he will need to show it as a tax deducted on the benefit provider. Okay. So, you have to take the advanced tax chalan from the other person. That's it. Nothing great as such. The next question which I have discussed with you all in the case of virtual digital assets. Because the section came from between, that is from 1st July 2022. 
how to count the threshold of 20,000 rupees. That I have told you. You have to consider from 1st April. The threshold will be counted from 1st April. But the TDS will be deducted only from 1st July payment. Okay. So, this is what this question number 10 is all about. Okay. Just go through it. So, after the discussion on that circular, I hope you all have enjoyed that discussion on circular which is there in your book too. Okay. Let's go ahead with some more amendments. The next amendment is in section 206AB. Now, this section was brought last year only. Now, this year they have made an amendment. Now, what does this section say? This section says that if the assessee, if the payee, I am the payer, you are the payee. If the payee has not filed the ITR of last two years and his TDS and TCS in the last two years is 50,000 or more, and he has not filed the ITR of last two years, then the deductor has to deduct the TDS at twice the rate or 5%, whichever is higher. So, what am I supposed to check as a deductor? That the other person, the deductee, the payee, if the payee has not filed the return for the last two years and the TDS and the TCS deducted and collected for the last two years is 50,000 or more. And I am supposed to deduct the TDS at twice the rate at 5%. But now the government has made amendment in one year. Now the government says that don't check for the last two years. Just check for the last year. So now you don't have to check for the last two years. Just check for the last one year. So if you are making the payment in 22-23, just check 21-22. Earlier we used to check for two years. But now only check one year. Secondly, just check in the last year if the TDS deducted and collected is 50,000 and more or more. If it is less than 50,000, then this provision is not applicable. If it is 50,000 or more, just in the last year. So, the government has made a very simple amendment. Let me tell you. Initially, we have to check the compliance for the last, both the two years. But now, you have to check the compliance only for the last, immediately last year. That's it. This is the first amendment which is made in this section. A similar amendment is also made for TCS under 206 CCA. For TCS also there is a similar amendment. There also they have removed the word 2. The word 2 is removed and they have said only last year. Whenever that section will come, I will show you that. Now the second amendment. This section is not applicable to certain assessees. To certain sections. This section is not applicable if you are deducting TDS in 192, 192A, 194B, 194PB, 194LBC, 194N. But now they have made few more additions to this particular exclusion. So, now this section is not applicable to 194IA also, which is for TDS on immobile property. This section is not applicable for 194IB also, which is for TDS on rent. This section is not applicable for 194M also, which is for TDS on certain contracts, certain professional fees and commission where the payment is exceeding 50 lakh rupees in a financial year. So, now the exclusion has expanded. These are the three more sections where this provision is now not applicable. Okay. So that this is a small amendment. First amendment is earlier we used to check last two years whether last two years return is filed or not. Now you don't have to check two years return. Only one year return is not filed. You can go for this section. But in these sections, you are not supposed to double the rate. You are supposed to follow the rate which is mentioned in the respective sections. Okay. Now the next amendment is given in section 2011A. 2011A that is uh, interest on default in deducting the TDS or delay in deducting the TDS sorry or interest on delay in paying the TDS. What is the interest on delay in paying the TDS? Paying the TDS 1.5%, deducting the TDS 1%. So, there was uncertainty regarding who will determine this particular interest. Is the assessee going to determine how much will be the interest or is the AO going to determine how much will be the interest? So, finally, the government has clarified for both TDS as well as for TCS, for TDS in 201 subsection 1A, for TCS in 206C subsection 7, that it is the AO who is going to determine. It is the AO. 201 has been amended to make it clear what? That where any order is made by the AO for default under subsection 1 of said section, the interest shall be paid in accordance with the order. The interest shall be paid in accordance with the order made by the assessing officer in this regard. And similar amendment is also made for TCS. Check. The model of the story is what? There was uncertainty regarding who will determine that how much interest is to be paid for delay in deduction, delay in payment. 
it is the AO who will make the order and accordingly you will pay that much interest as per the order of the assessing officer. Just go through it once and then we will move ahead with the next one. Now, the next amendment is on page number 28.36 after 28.35 in section 206C1H. In section 206C1H, what happens when you sell goods of more than 50 lakh rupees to any person, you have to collect TCS and the seller's last year's business turnover has to be greater than 10 crore rupees. Then only this section is applicable. So, last year's turnover has to be greater than 10 crore and you, if you sell more than 50 lakhs to any person, to any buyer, then this section is applicable. Now, the question over here is, in the definition of buyer, the government has excluded certain buyers. Do you remember that? If you sell to central government, do not collect TCS. If you sell to state government, do not collect TCS. These are excluded from the definition of buyer. You can check here. If you sell to embassy, any high commission, legation, trade representation, local authority. And the last one is, any other notified person. So, the government has notified any other person over here as, so, this is an amendment, non-resident. This is not an amendment made by Finance Act 2020. This is an amendment made through a notification. That is the reason you might not find this as green because this is an amendment made in between of the year, not by Finance Act 22. So, non-resident who does not have a PE. So if there is a non-resident who does not have a PE, is not a buyer. So if you sell to such non-resident who does not have a PE in India, then you do not have to what? Collect TCS. But if you sell to such non-resident who has a P in India, like Standard Chartered Bank, like Citibank, like Microsoft, they have P in India, then you have to collect TCS. Check it once. So, they have excluded from the definition of buyer a non-resident who does not have a P in India. Check it once. Okay. You can write this over there if you want. Then we will move ahead with the next one. Page number 28.38, next amendment, as I have told you earlier that there is a similar amendment is made in 206AB, here also there is a similar amendment, for TCS also you have to twice the rate or 5% whichever is higher, so here also earlier we used to check whether the SSC has filed the return in the last two years or not, but here also they have made, you have to now check only in the immediately last year, don't check two years, only the last year, don't check whether in the two years. 50,000 is crossing or not. Just check only in the last year if 50,000 is crossing or not. Just check it once. Now, the next one is virtual digital asset. Now, on this, I will be putting a complete lecture. Don't worry. Complete lecture means what? Because this is a completely new, new concept. I have to put this entire discussion. I will be teaching you from the textbook. I will also put the soft copy of my textbook of regular batch. Because I have to do some detailing over there. Then you can revise from here. There is no issue. Everything is covered here also. Then I will also go to book 2. Because there is one very recently introduced one circular. There is one chapter, chapter 76 in your book 2. Where I have put all the latest circular. So that you can pay special attention on that. Then I will also go to question bank. And then I will solve some questions based on virtual digital assets. What is virtual digital asset? It is nothing but what a cryptocurrency. The cryptocurrency taxability has been introduced by Finance Act 2022, which was missing earlier. So, that we will address in a separate amendment lecture. The way we are going to address in what? A separate. Immediately, tomorrow only I will put. Don't worry. Today, you see this lecture. Tomorrow, you will get the next lecture. And then, day after tomorrow, you will get the next lecture. In 3-4 lectures, we will try to wrap up all the amendments which are covered by Finance Act 2022. Okay. Now, the next amendment is with respect to capital gains. In slum sale, they have made a small amendment. This is not an amendment. In fact, this is a rectification of a mistake. You all might be knowing that in the last year, the government has expanded the definition of slum sale. Last year only, they have made an amendment in the definition of slum sale, if you remember. Sir, how, sir? Earlier in slum sale, there was only sale covered. Exchange was not covered. Relinquishment was co not covered. Extinguishment was not covered. So, they said that, no, 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 no. Sale will include, slum sale will not only include sale, but include all kind of transfers. Okay. So, though I made this definition, slum sale means, earlier it was sale of one or more undertaking. So, they removed the word sale and they put the word transfer. Okay. But at the end, they forgot to remove the word sale and put the word transfer. 
So there was a defect in the definition. Check. So what was the definition earlier? I'll just tell you three definition. What was the definition before 2021? It was like this. Sale, slum sale means sale of one or more undertaking. What was the definition after 2021? It was like this. And what is the definition after 2022? They have removed the word sale from here and there also they have put the word transfer. They don't see the provision or what properly. Before making an amendment, they don't read or what. I don't think so. They should make such kind of silly mistakes in income tax law app. You have a team of thousands of people with you. You have a lot of committees. You have resources. You have money. You have time. You have everything. You have one full year to amend a lawyer. How can you make such silly mistakes? But ultimately, this is what human is all about. You all are humans ultimately. Law is not amended by a computer. It is amended by humans. So, mistakes are bound to happen. So, the government made a rectification of this mistake by removing the word sale and by putting what? The word transfer over here. Apart from this, there is no other amendment made over here. The rest of the things are already amended in the last year, if you remember. Okay. So they have brought some rule 11 UAE last year to value what? To value full value of consideration. All those things are the major amendments which has happened in the last year. So, just go through it once and then we'll move ahead with the next one. So, the next amendment is on page number 34.12, 34, after 34.11, 34.12 and the amendment is in section 10.4D whereby the government gives some exemptions to certain specified fund and the term, there are four exemptions which are given to specified funds and the definition of specified fund is mentioned over here. In this, there are two types of specified fund. One is this category, another is this category. In the second category, there is no amendment. There is an amendment in the definition of specified fund in the first category. So, I will just read the definition and then I will explain you the amendment which is made by the government of India over here. Okay. Who is a specified fund? A fund which is established or incorporated in India in the form of a trust or company or LLP or any kind of body corporate is called as a specified fund. Okay. Now, which has been granted a certificate of registration as category 3 AIF. Okay, so they have been registered as a category 3 AIF and is regulated by SEBI under the SEBI. Okay, is this condition amended? No, no, this condition is not amended. Which is located in IFSC? Is this condition amended? No, this is same. The condition number 3 is amended. All the units are held by non-resident. So, the fund has suppose 100 units. All the units have to be held by the non-residents other than the units held by the sponsor and manager. So, sponsor and manager can be residents. They are allowed to be residents. Sir, who is sponsor? Sponsor is the person who has started the fund. Maybe the promoter of the fund can be called as a sponsor. Sir, who is the manager? Manager is the person who is managing the funds. Maybe, maybe the fund manager of the fund can be called as a manager. So, the promoter that is the sponsor and the fund manager that is the manager can be resident. Rest of them have to be non-resident. Now, there is a relaxation given to this condition. So, the government has given some relaxation to this condition subject to some condition. The relaxation is not unconditional. The relaxation is conditional. So, relaxation is conditional to what? Let's see. Just wait. The aforesaid provision have been amended with effect from AY 22-23 after the amendment. The condition 3, that is this one, shall not apply, shall not apply. The condition 3 shall not apply where any unit holder was non-resident during the previous year when the unit or units were issued, but he became resident under section 6-1 or 6-1A in any subsequent year. So, however, this concession will be available only if the aggregate value and the number of the units held by such resident unit holder or holders do not exceed 5% of the total units issued and fulfill such other condition as may be prescribed. Now, let me explain you this with the help of an example. Okay. Uh, so, there is an example over here which I will just explain you over here. I have made one example for you all over here. So, suppose, suppose, suppose. Pay attention. This is section 1040. This is specified fund. This is previous year 22-23 and uh, 100 investors are there. Each investor invested rupees 1 lakh. Therefore, the fund will get how much? 1 crore rupees. Okay. Now, all are non-resident in the year of issue. The government says that in the year of issue, they are supposed to be non-resident. In subsequent year, they can become resident. But in subsequent year, they can become resident unconditionally. No, no, no. The condition is 
नॉट मोर देन फाइव परसेंट ऑफ द इन्वेस्टर एंड नॉट मोर देन फाइव परसेंट ऑफ द वैल्यू शुड बी रेसिडेंट इन द नेक्स्ट ईयर सो इन द नेक्स्ट ईयर इफ आउट ऑफ हंड्रेड इन्वेस्टर्स आउट ऑफ सपोज एवरी इन्वेस्टर हैज बॉट वन यूनिट सो आउट ऑफ हंड्रेड यूनिट इफ नेक्स्ट ईयर इफ फाइव यूनिट होल्डर्स बिकम रेजिडेंट एंड अप टू फाइव लाख रुपीज इफ दे आर रेजिडेंट देन इट इज ओके बिकॉज द गवर्नमेंट हेज पुट अ कंडीशन ओवर इयर दैट दिस कंसेशन विल बी अवेलेबल ओनली इफ द एग्रीगेट वैल्यू कंडीशन नंबर वन द एग्रीगेट वैल्यू एज वेल एज द नंबर ऑफ यूनिट हेल्ड बाय सच यूनिट रेजिडेंट यूनिट होल्डर डो नॉट एक्सीड फाइव परसेंट ऑफ द टोटल यूनिट इशूड एंड फुलफिल सच अदर कंडीशन एज मे बी प्रिस्क्राइब सो बी वेरी केयरफुल दिस कंडीशन से इज वॉट This condition says what in the year in which you issue, in the year in which you issue, in that year the investor has to be non-resident. But in the subsequent year, to the extent of five percent, can convert themselves into resident. And that five percent has to be checked at both the points. The number of units should also not exceed five percent, and the value of investment should also not exceed five percent. Just check it once. This is what this particular provision has to say. You can take a photograph of this if you want. Okay, I hope it is clear to all of you. Okay, now there is one more amendment which is made over here only, which is made in section forty-seven now. Now, what is that amendment in section forty-seven? Your original fund to resulting fund. Now, what is this exactly? I'll just try to explain you. There is one rule which is prescribed by the government. I'll just try to explain you this also. Pay attention, please. So last year the government has brought this provision where there is an original fund which is outside India. And there is a resultant fund over here. Now the government says that if this original fund if you shift to india resultant fund is in india then we will give you relaxation in capital gains no capital gains on transfer of asset no capital gains to the unit holder so on and so forth so there are lot of relaxation given by the government over here okay now there are some amendments made by the government over here in the definition of pay attention please there are some amendments made by the government in the definition of the original fund Now, who is an original fund? As I have told you, it is outside India. So listen carefully. So they have made some amendment in the definition of original fund. Original fund means a fund established outside India. As I have told you, the fund is outside India. The government is encouraging them to come to India. It collects funds from the members for investing and fulfills the following condition. First, the fund is not a person resident in India. It should be outside India. The fund is in such country with which India has a DT double A. That is also a criteria. This is condition number two. The fund is in such country where there is an investor regulation protection. Like in India, we have investor regulation protection issued by SEBI. So in that country also, there should be someone like SEBI who is controlling them. Okay. And the fourth one, pay attention, fulfills such other condition as may be prescribed. So the government said that the government will prescribe few more conditions. So the government has prescribed the condition under Rule Twenty One AL. So to fulfill this point. To fulfill this point, the government has brought Rule Twenty One AL. And now, what does Rule Twenty One AL says? It's a very simple amendment made by the government through a insertion of a rule. Rule Twenty One AL pro prescribes that aggregate participation or investment in the original fund. So the aggregate investment in the original fund by the person resident in India shall not be five percent of the total corpus. It means the fund which is there outside India in that fund. the condition number 4 says that which is prescribed through rule 21 al it says that the fund which is there outside india in that the resident indian resident should not be more than 5% if the indian residents are more than 5% in the original fund then the fund cannot be called as original fund because then the condition number 4 will be violated so if the condition number 4 has to be fulfilled the condition number d or 4 whatever you want to say has to be fulfilled You have to fulfill what is written in Rule Twenty One AL, and Rule Twenty One AL says that the original fund, which is there outside India, in that the investment of Indian residents should not be more than five percent. So, if the Indian residents are up to five percent, we consider that as a compliance of condition number four. But if the Indian resident exceeds five percent, 
and condition number 4 is violated. If condition number 4 is violated, it cannot be called as original fund and if it cannot be called as original fund, you will not get the benefits mentioned in section 47. Just check it once. So, here we complete all the amendments of book 1 and I will tell you the roadmap for the subsequent amendment lectures for how it will be done. So, book 1 all the amendments are done now, book 2 amendments are pending and now what will come next? Next I will put income escaping assessment lecture I will put, do not see the last part, last part I will not put only I will edit and put only the amendment part, I will not put the entire part, ok. Secondly, virtual digital asset will come which is there in your book 1 color book and then circular will come which is there in book 2 and then question bank we will be doing questions on, on what cryptocurrency, how cryptocurrency taxability will be done. And then I will be putting one more lecture on updated return which is mentioned in 139.8a. So, this is the roadmap for the subsequent few days. You do that much till that time I will record book 2 lectures, book 2 amendments I will record and then that will complete all the amendments for you all. Once I upload, uh, the after this only one lecture will come that is book 2, book 2 amendments. The once I put that book 2 amendments then rest of the things will be done, ok. Once the amendment lectures are done, I will be also putting the from next month onwards, that is from February onwards, I will also be putting the revision lectures in full English, do not worry for you all, the way I have put it for November 22, so I will be putting the revision lectures also for November 22 students from next month. So, I hope you all have enjoyed the lectures, if you have enjoyed the lectures, share this lectures with all the students across South India, in all the states, with all your friends. I am trying my best that whatever I do for Hindi batch, I will try to be at par with for the English batch as well. Because I do not want to be having any disparity between two kind of students. Okay. So, I will try my best that whatever I do for my Hindi students, generally I am a Hindi speaking person. I do not know much English. I do not know whether I speak good English or not. You can only tell me by putting a comment in the comment box whether I speak good English or not. But still, I have tried my best to speak in English, to explain in English and to cover maximum syllabus in English and now even I have my full batch in English, full regular batch in English. I have get, got great response from the students across South India and I have also a fast track batch in English. For that also, I have got a great response. Thank you very much for that also. So take care all of you. If you need any other help, any further help, I am always there for you all. Take care. Bye all of you. So, now let us go ahead with the next chapter which is there in your book 2 that is book 2 detail book a very 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 important chapter for our exam and also for our practical life. So, it is a tricky chapter let me tell you in advance only so pay absolute attention on each and everything that we are going to learn in this chapter ok. Now, there has been some significant changes in this chapter significant amendments made in the last two years. Let me explain you first of all how the things used to be before 2021 and how the things are after 2021. Listen carefully now please. Till 31st March 2021 the things were absolutely different and from 1st April 2021, the things are absolutely different. Okay, pay attention please. Till 30 was 31st March 2021, there were two assessments. One was covered under section 147, which was called as income escaping assessment. Okay, pay attention beta please. Now no masti please. And there was one more assessment under 153A which was called as search and seizure assessment. So, till 31st March 2021, there were two assessments, 147 was called as section 147, 147 means section 147 was called as income escaping assessment and section 153A was called as search and seizure assessment, ok. And here the government used to do open your assessment for last 4 years in some cases. If your escaped income is around 1 lakh, I will just put it completely over here. If your escaped income is less than 1 lakh, then the government used to open your assessment for 4 years. 
If the escaped income was greater than or equal to 1 lakh, then the government used to open the assessment for 6 years. And if the escaped income has some foreign asset, foreign asset, then they could open your assessment for last 16 years also as per the old provision. Okay. 16 years assessment. So, which year is going on now? 22-23, right? So even the assessment of 2005-06 can be opened in 22-23. And they can check that how you have invested in the asset in 2005-2006. Even for 16 years, they used to check the assessment. Search and seizure assessment was used to happen immediately after the previous chapter was done. Previous chapter was what? Search and seizure, right? Immediately after the search and seizure is done, they used to do assessment under 153A. And for how many years? In some cases, they used to do assessment for 4 years. And if your escaped income is likely to be greater than or equal to 50 lakhs, then they used to do an assessment for 10 years. So, these were the two different assessments which were covered in 147 and 153A. You need to understand this particular pre-amendment scenario first of all beta to understand the post-amendment scenario. So, pre-amendment scenario, if you hide any income and if the government catches you, then your assessment of last 4 years can be opened, of last 6 years can be opened in some cases and last 16 years can also be opened in some cases. And if there is a search and seizure against you, then there is a separate assessment only. Then the government will not go over here for search and seizure. Then there is a separate assessment section 153A, 4 years or 10 years if your escaped income is likely to be greater than or equal to 50 lakhs. Is it clear? But now finance at 2021, that is last year, last year. Current year is finance at 2022, which is applicable for our exams of 2023, right? But last year finance at 2021, there was a major change, major change in these sections. Major change was what? The first major change was the government removed this section. Which section was removed? That is the reason I told that Babisha to come on time. He will not understand the things later. The major change was, first thing which they removed was what? The search and seizure assessment was removed and it was merged with this section. Now, there is only one section now. So, till last to last year, there were four assessments under income tax law. Regular assessment, best judgment assessment, income escaping assessment and search and seizure assessment. But now, after 2021, there are only three assessments because two big assessments got merged into one only. Are you clear? So, now there is only one section, section 147 instead of these two sections, they all are merged in one and there are only two possibilities now. If your escaped income is greater than 50 lakh rupees, how much? Then there will be 10 years assessment and if it is less than 50 lakh rupees, then there will be 3 years assessment. That's it. Now there are only two time limits, 3 years or 10 years, that's it. It means what all removed? 4 year removed. Okay, 16 years is also gone. Are yes or no? So now the assessment can be done for either 3 years, maximum 3 years or maximum 10 years. Not beyond that, okay. So instead of academically, it has become slightly easier for us. Let me tell you honestly, academically the things have become slightly simpler for us because the government has merged these two provisions. Otherwise, we need to learn two separate chapters. First 147 and then 153A. Okay. Now this new provision is applicable from when? 14-2021 it is applicable. That is from financial year 21-22. Okay. Because it came in the last year. In financial 2021 in lockdown they have done all these things. So now we need to do 147 in detail. That is section 147 which is income escaping assessment, which will cover every kind of escapement. An escapement in the case of normal escapement, an escapement in the case of search and seizure. Everything will be covered here. Okay? So, now pay absolute attention all of you. It's a tricky topic. It will blow your mind. I am telling you, pay more than 100% attention over here. But it's a very important topic academically as well as practically. Practically, though, nobody knows anything about this because it has been very recently introduced and a lot of people have a lot of doubts. 
So it will be an upper hand for you in the industry also if you learn this provision in a proper manner here itself. So shall we start with the discussion? Please tell me. Shall we start? So let's start with this section. Page number 17.1, that is your first page of your next book, that is book number 2 of your textbook. First of all, there is some bhashan which is given over here, what used to happen earlier, what is happening now. So let me read that once again. I am reading that introductory bhashan, introductory comments. The provisions pertaining to income escaping assessment provide that if the AO has reason to believe that any income chargeable to tax has escaped assessment for any AY, he may assess or reassess or recompute the total income for such year under 147 by issuing a notice under 148. However, such reopening is subject to time limits prescribed in 149. Where a search is initiated under 132 or action is initiated under 132A, assessment is made in the case of the SSE or any other person in accordance with the special provisions of 153A, 153B, C, D that deal specifically with such cases. Due to advancement of technology, the department is now collecting all relevant information related to transactions of the taxpayer from third parties under 285 BA, that is statement of financial transaction. Similar information is also received from other law enforcement agency. A new, completely new procedure of assessment has been incorporated in the aforesaid cases with effect from 1st April 2021. Now listen carefully. The salient features of the new procedure are given below. Till here, nothing is important because this is all old bhashan. What used to happen earlier? Forget about it. What used to happen earlier? We are not interested in what used to happen earlier. We are interested in what is happening in today's time. Please start your video, please. Now, you have to be very patient enough. Please, huh? I am telling you. We are not going to complete this topic today under any circumstance. We will be continuing this topic tomorrow. But the most important part and the most difficult part of this topic, there is nothing difficult in this world. It just, it just depends upon how well you can understand that and how fast you can understand. You have to pay attention, that's it. Nothing is difficult. But it is slightly tricky. The most important part of this chapter we are going to do today, sir. Today, whatever time is left in today's time, that is 1, 1, and a, one hour 15 minutes. In that time itself, we are going to do the most difficult part and most important part of this section. So, pay absolute attention. Section 147. We are starting with the income escaping assessment now. This is the main section. This is the main section. Let me read this main section first of all. And please call her where is, where is she here. You will miss important things here. Section 147 has been substituted with effect from 1st April 2021. Shall I read? Shall I read? Section 147 has been substituted with effect from 1st April 2021 to provide that if any income chargeable to tax in the case of an SSE has escaped assessment for any AY, the AO may, subject to the provisions of 148 to 153, assess or reassess such income and also assess or reassess, recompute any other income chargeable to tax which has escaped assessment and which comes to his notice subsequently in the course of what the proceedings under this section or recompute the loss or depreciation or allowance or any other allowance as the case may be for such assessment here. I want you all to read this paragraph once. Please read it once. I am giving you two minutes.
Now, pay attention please, all of you. Leave aside everything. Pay absolute attention. Start your video. Pay attention over here. There are a lot of small, small things which are mentioned over here. Pay attention please. Shall I start? This is previous year 22-23 going on. If in this previous year AO finds that you have escaped some income in say previous year 1920 or 1819 then he has the power to reopen your assessment in the current year and charge tax on that income ok it's not that easy, let me tell you. So, again I am saying, in the current year, that is in previous year 22-23, if the AO finds that some income was escaped in 1819, then in that case, he can reopen your assessment in 22-23. And he can charge tax on that income, interest on that income, penalties on that income as well. So, the first question which we need to answer over here, what do I mean by escaped income? Because of whose mistake income can be escaped? And what will be the imposition of that, implication of that on the SSE? What do I mean by escaped income? First, we need to understand that escaped income means what? So, the income can escape because of two things. Listen carefully. Income can escape because of assessee's default. Because assessee has made some wrong deductions. Because assessee has not shown some income. So that the income can escape. If the income is escaping because of assessee's default. Then in that case, assessment under 147 will be done on you. This is a draconian assessment. Not a very simple assessment. Very dangerous one. There will be taxation impo imposed on you. There will be interest imposed on you and there will be a penalty which can be imposed on you. Suppose you have escaped an income of 10 lakh rupees. Okay. You have escaped an income of 10 lakh rupees. What do I mean by escape of, escapement of income? Escapement of income can happen in any of the two ways. Either you are not showing the revenues or you are showing excessive deduction. Excessive claim of expenses also escapement of income. Yes or no? Array, instead of claiming a deduction of 10 lakhs, you are claiming a deduction of 25 lakhs. So, are you escaping 15 lakhs or not? So, that is also escapement of income. So, if you are making a mistake, it's the default is of assessee. And if the assessee is making a mistake and escaping an income, listen carefully the consequences. Suppose you are escaping an income of 10 lakh rupees. Then there will be 30% tax first of all, plus surcharge and says whatever it is. Then interest, then penalty of 200% of tax. How much penalty? Are how much penalty? 200% of tax. That will be the penalty which can be imposed on you. You will learn in the later topic in the chapter of penalties later on. So, if you are escaping an income of 10 lakh rupees, 30% of goes directly in tax, then surcharge and says also. Then interest will be imposed. Various section interest will be imposed. We have not done any interest so far. Then penalty of 200%. You just try to imagine and make a rough calculation in your mind. Nothing will be left in your hand. If there is a 10 lakh income you escape, 30% you pay tax, then interest you pay and 200% penalty. What will be left in your hand? In fact, you have to pay, pay extra from your pocket. Are you able to understand? Video, video, video. Therefore, it is very dangerous. Don't escape income. Don't escape income. Escapement of income means don't under show your revenue. Show your revenues properly. Don't overstate your expenses. Show your expenses properly. Show your depreciation properly. Okay. Now, this is the first reason. This is the first reason how income is escaped. 
The second reason how income is escaped is a very important for us. Listen carefully, pay attention over here. Income, this is a technical one, the second one. Try to understand, it's a very technical topic. One second here and there and you will be gone out of this topic. I am telling you very seriously. It is not a hall to assessment like 143 or 144. There was nothing in that assessment. This is a great assessment. So, listen carefully. Income can also get escaped because of subsequent development in the law. It means what, sir? What do you mean by subsequent development in law? Listen carefully. Suppose in 1819, in 1819, you are Mr. A. And in your case, the AO, the AO allowed you an expense. Allowed an expense of rupees, say, 10 lakhs. Okay? So, you took, you took deduction of this 10 lakh rupees in your, in your PGBP income, right? Now, in 20 to 23, suppose there is a Supreme Court judgment which comes. Listen carefully, please, here. In 20 to 23, there is a Supreme Court judgment which came in case of Mr. B. Mr. B is some other person. In some other person's case, this judgment came. And in some other person's case, this similar expense was disallowed by Supreme Court. Can it happen or not? Now listen carefully. In your case, what has happened few years back? The EO has allowed that expense to me. But in some other case, the EO might have disallowed the matter went to Supreme Court and the Supreme Court has also disallowed that expense. Now I have a question to you all this. Therefore, can I say my EO has made a mistake few years back? Are, can I say my EO has made a mistake few years back by allowing that expense to me? The answer is definitely yes. He should have also disallowed. Because what Supreme Court is saying today, that is the correct interpretation of the law. Na? It means my AO has made a wrong interpretation of the law. Therefore, today Supreme Court has made a development in law by giving its judgment. This is a subsequent development in law. Now, this gives the power to my assessing officer that he can disallow this expense in my case also. He can open my assessment three years back. Are you trying to understand? It's not a very straight for a topic. It's a very tricky topic. That's the reason I'm saying pay absolute attention. So, in my case, which was allowed three years back, yes or no? But now Supreme Court judgment is coming in some other case that I'll disallow such expense. So, my assessing officer will be active now. And now he will open my reassessment. He will open my assessment of 2018-19 and he will disallow that expense. Are you able to understand that? He has that power. But in such cases, in such cases, listen carefully. He will disallow the expense. He will do assessment under 147. But he will take tax, no interest, no penalty. Check over here. Because it was not my mistake. I have not hide any income. I have shown everything correctly. AO has not disallowed that earlier. It was his mistake na, that he didn't disallow. He should have disallowed in 1819. If he would have disallowed in 1819, this issue would have not arised only. So, in subsequent development of law, they will charge tax on you, but they will not take interest and penalty. Are you clear? So, escape, income can escape because of two reasons. Because of assassin's mistake. Listen carefully, please. If it is because of assessee's mistake, they will take tax also, interest also, penalty also. They are not going to leave you. But if it is not because of assessee's mistake, you can say if it is because of assessing officer's mistake. Yes or no? Right hand side, I can say nah, it was because of assessing officer's mistake. So, in that case, they can impose tax, but they will not impose penalty and interest. Is it clear? Or is it clear? Now pay attention, beta, please. It's a very difficult topic for me also to teach. Coming back to this main section. This is the main section. This is the heart of this particular chapter. Everything revolves around these six lines. Everything. I am reading this section once more. I have read once more earlier. I have allowed you to read once. Now I am reading once more. Because everything will revolve around this chapter. This entire chapter of around 7 to 8 pages is an interpretation of these six lines. That's it. Section 147 has been substituted with effect from 1st April 2021 to provide that. Are you paying attention first of all? I am not 
feeling that you are paying attention. Are you? To provide that, if any income chargeable to tax in case of assessee has escaped assessment for any AY, the AO may underline subject to the provisions of 148 to 153. Assess or reassess such income and also any other income chargeable to tax which has escaped assessment and which comes to his notice subsequently in the course of proceeding under this section or recompute the loss or depreciation allowance or any other allowance as the case may be for such assessment here. Listen carefully. Who has the power to do this assessment? AO has the power to do this assessment. We have done two more assessments earlier. That is regular and best judgment. There also who had the power to do assessment? AO. Everywhere, always remember, it is the assessing officer who will do the assessment. Okay. Every year. CIT will not interfere. Chief CIT will not interfere. Other higher authorities will not come into picture. It is only the assessing officer who is going to do. Listen carefully. But when you read this entire paragraph of six lines, it is saying very important sentence in the bracket which says that subject to 148 to 153. It means if the AO wants to do an assessment under this section, he has to follow 148, 149, 150, 151, 152 and 153. Unless and until he follows these six sections, he will not be able to do assessment under this section. This section is dependent on the next six sections. So, understanding this section means understanding seven sections including this. So, 147 is not 147 in isolation. It is 147 plus six more sections. Are, are you clear? So, we need to understand the entire procedure now. One by one, 148, 149, 150, 151, 152, 153. Pay absolute attention, beta. It's not that cakewalk. Please, you have to pay absolute attention in today's lecture. Listen carefully. Leave aside everything. There is an A over here. This is previous year 22-23 going on. He came to know that income is escaped in previous year 18-19. Okay. Now, what will he do? What will the AO do after this? I am not asking you any question. I am just raising questions so that I can answer. What will AO do after this? He has to follow the procedures mentioned in section 148, 149, 150, 51, 152, 53. He has to follow these six sections. So, now what is written in these sections? Obviously, there are a lot of things written. There is a lot of content in these six, six sections. So, what is the first thing that AO will do, sir? Okay. What is the first thing that AO will do? The first thing which AO will do is there is an assessee over here. He has to ultimately deal with assessee only. Okay. What is the first thing that please pay attention here? So, what is the first thing that he will do? He will send you a notice under section 148. Under which section? You have to buy hard this procedure and go home today. Please. You have to learn this properly, 148. Sir, so what will be written in this notice? Okay. What will be written? What will be written in this notice? Pay attention. It will be written that file ROI. File return of income. Return of income? For which year? For 1819. For 1819, I will file return of income in 20 to 23. Yes. So, AO finds some income that which is escaped by you. He will send you a notice under 148. You have to file the ROI. You have to file the ROI. Under which section? This ROI is filed under which section? It is filed under 148. The way ROI is filed under 139, 139, 1. 139.3, 139.4, 139.5, 139.9, subsection 1, clause 1. Similarly, this is the last section of ROI in our life. 
that is 148. Filed an ROI under 148. Okay. I am teaching you something and Times of India has a notification that there is an IT raid conducted in slum office. 90 crore donations received right now. There is a notification of Times of India. Anyways, great coincidence. Pay attention please. So the first thing will be done by the AO is, he will do what? He will send a notice to you to file what? Filed an ROI, return of income for 1819. Sir, I have already filed a return of income for 1819, sir, in 1819. File again. File again because earlier you have filed a return of income without showing this escaped income, right or not? Now file again by showing this escaped income. You have to show this income in your I ITR. Okay. Sir, in how many days I will file the return? That will be mentioned in the notice. Okay. Where it will be mentioned? It will be mentioned in the notice. So, first thing which we want to understand in today's lecture is we need to understand section 148. What 148 has to say? So, let us try to understand what 148 has to say. All of you come to your book to 148. Better please have patience in life. The first two pages are going to be very dangerous page of this chapter. The rest of the things are easier. I am reading. 148 has been substituted with effect from 1st April 2021. The new section provides as follows. Shall I read? This is step 1. Before invoking the provisions of 148, the AO is required to conduct an inquiry within the parameters of 148A. Now, what is 148A? Yeah? Listen, listen, listen. Have patience. I have thought, I have just told you, not taught you also. I have just told you what is 148. What is 148, beta? Are, tell me, na, don't see in the books. Please tell me. Are, what is 148? I have just told you. Na. Notice. Notice for what? Notice to file ROI. Now, even before that, there is one more condition. That before sending this notice, the AO has to make some inquiry in 148A. Are, are you able to understand that? So, even before sending this notice, even before sending this notice, this is the first thing, na? So, even before this first thing, he has to do something. And what is that something? He has to do some kind of inquiry under 148A. Yes? You can go to the next page and see there is an inquiry section on the next page. You can see. We are not reading that as of now. We will read after some time. Okay? So, even before sending a notice under 148, we need to do an inquiry. Inquiry. How that inquiry is done, sir? That I will teach after some time. Don't worry. Assume that inquiry is done. Uh, Let us assume. Okay? So, that we can at least complete this section first. Otherwise, we will go here and there, here and there. We will confuse with both the sections here. Let us complete one section at one point of time. Assume that inquiry is done. Okay. Now, shall I send in the notice? To file ROI? Yes. Let us read this step 2. After conducting inquiry under 148A, assume that inquiry is done. But before making the assessment or reassessment or recomputation under 147, the AO shall serve on the SSE a notice. He has to serve on the SSE a notice. Along with the copy of the order passed under 148A. Copy of what? Copy of inquiry. That my inquiry is done. Requiring him to furnish a return of income or return of any other person in respect of which he is accessible within a specified period. So, what this paragraph tells you, if you read completely, it tells you after the inquiry is done, after the inquiry is done on the next page, you are supposed to send a notice to the assessee. Yes or no? Notice for what purpose? For assessee to file the return of income. Is it clear to all of you? Yes or no? So now, step by step, can I say the first step which the AO has to do is to conduct inquiry. Then he has to send a notice to the SSE to file the ROI. Now, the question is, why the hell they will send a notice? 
Will they send this notice to random assessees? No. They will send the notice because they have some information with them, na? That you have escaped in you have escaped income, beta. So why they will send the notice is given in this particular point. Step number three. Shall we read it? However, a no. However, no notice under one forty eight shall be issued. No notice under one forty eight shall be issued unless. Underline. There is an information with the AO. Underline till the extent I am doing it, which suggests that income chargeable to tax has escaped assessment. Underline this much. I am highlighting also this much. This is one of the most important sentence of this chapter. No notice under one forty eight shall be issued unless there is an information with the AO that income chargeable to tax has income has escaped the assessment in case of the assessee for the relevant AY. Moreover, prior approval of the specified authority to issue such notice is required. Now listen carefully. Just wait now. Have patience now. Have patience. Step by step, we'll talk. First step: What the AO will do as a first step? He will conduct inquiry on the next page about which we do not know much as of now. Okay. Assume that inquiry is done. Inquiry is done. What is the next step that he has to follow? Send a notice to the SSC for what? To file ROI within how much time? Specified in the notice, which is generally thirty days time. Generally, I am telling you out of industry experience. Now the third point says that you should not send a notice. Unless there is an information with the AO, which suggests that income chargeable to tax of the assessee has escaped assessment, yes or no? So, what is the meaning of this phrase? When the AO can say that I have an information, when the AO can say that I have an information which suggests that income chargeable to tax has escaped assessment, this entire phrase which is underlined in red line, can you see that? This entire phrase is defined by the government of India in Explanation One to Section One Forty Eight. Can you see this entire phrase over here? I am striking that off because of some reason. I'll tell you what is the reason. Okay? Can you see that? What is that phrase? For the purpose, information which suggests that income chargeable to tax has escaped assessment means means what? Means two things. Can you see that? Don't get into all those things. Try to understand the structure of the section first. Then we'll read the paragraphs. Can you see that? Now there are two things which government feels that there are two things. Point number A, point number B. If either of the two things are happened, if either of the two things are happened, try to understand. Please pay attention, beta over here. You need to understand this order of the law. If either of the two things have happened, then the AO can proudly say that I have an information which suggests what that income chargeable to tax has what. Escape the assessment. Can I say in that case he gets the power to send the notice? Are they yes or no? Because unless he has this particular sentence with him, unless he can prove that he has an information which suggests that income chargeable to tax has escaped the assessment, he has no power to send the notice because it is written in this third paragraph. No notice can be sent unless he has a proof that income chargeable to tax has escaped the assessment. Are you clear? So our entire duty is now to understand what do you mean by this phrase. When can I say that I am an AO? For example, when can I say that I have an information which suggests me that income chargeable to tax has escaped assessment in Assessee's case? When can I say the government has said that we are putting two points over here, A and B? Now, when they have brought this particular section at the beginning of this particular provision, I have told you when they have changed this entire section in Finance Act twenty one. Are yes or no? Last year they have brought this new section, na, beta. Are beta, I have given you at the introduction of this section the bhashan, the bhashan, 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 bhashan. When they have brought this new section, two thousand twenty-one finance act twenty-one, right? It means everything is brought in the finance act two thousand twenty-one, na, please. Everything, the entire section was changed in two thousand twenty-one. Now listen carefully. This explanation was also brought in Finance Act 2021. Now see the consistency of the Income Tax Department. 
they cannot stay with what they have said for one year also and they have removed these two points and instead of these two points now they have brought in finance at 2022 five points instead of two points are you able to understand this first of all they have brought these two points last year only and they cannot remain consistent with those points for one year also and immediately in the next year they have changed the entire meaning of the phrase what do you mean by income chargeable to tax as escaped assessment? Are you able to understand? So, in today's time, income chargeable to tax escaped assessment means what? Means 5 points. If either of the 5 points are happening, okay, then the AO has the power to send you a notice. Shall we read one by one all of them? Let's read. Explanation 1 to section 148. Has been amended with effect from 1 for 2022. Can't you think in the last year itself that you have to put these five points when they make when you make when you make a new section? So they make sections in hurry, and then they realize after a year that they, we have made some mistakes. We need to change this. We need to change that. At least keep it consistent for three four years. Yeah, when you are bringing a new law, it is so confusing for the taxpayers, for the assessing officers, for the department also. If you make such frequent changes every year, explanation 1 to 48 has been inserted, has been amended in fact, not inserted. It was inserted in 2021, but amended in 2022 again to provide that for the purpose of the set section at 148A. The information with the AO which suggests that income chargeable to tax as escaped assessment means, means point number A, point number B, point number C, point number D, point number E. Shall we read beta? Please pay attention. Are you there with me? Point number A. Any information in the case of an assessee for the relevant AY in accordance with the risk management strategy formulated by the board from time to time. Now, what do I mean by this? Listen carefully. Shall I say? Tell up now video chalu kar. Please. I cannot see your expression, I cannot teach. Yeah, all right. Anyways, play, pay attention, please. Now, what is the first thing which can be said that the AO has information which suggests that income chargeable to tax has escaped assessment? Highly technical point. Any information in the case of an assessee for the relevant AY in accordance with the risk management strategy formulated by the board from time to time. What does it talk about? Do you know that? So write it in the bracket. SFT. They are talking about SFT. If your information is, is shown in the CBDT's SFT, they will they can say we have an information which suggests that income chargeable to tax has escaped assessment. That is the reason. Do not do anything which comes in SFT. What comes in SFT? Can you give me some illustrations, some examples of items which comes in SFT? Cash deposits of 10 lakh or more in saving account. FD if you purchase of 10 lakh or more. If you purchase an immobile property of 30 lakhs or more. If you purchase in mutual fund shares of 10 lakh or more, right? Do not do, if you are doing all these things, you should have a proper source of income, right? If you have if you have source of income, you are doing this, no worry. If you do not have a source of income, if this is put in the information system of the CBDT, listen carefully. The information of the CBDT which, which, which will include what? Which will include SFT, right? Which will also include what? AIS. If it is reflected in SFT or AIS and one information system and if the department will start to compare your what? Investments with your source of income. And if they find that your investments are more and your source of income is less, they will definitely send you a notice. They will definitely say that, now our assessing officer, listen technically, they will definitely say, they say that, that if your investments are 30 lakhs, and if your source of income is 10 lakhs, they have a information, which can suggest that, that income chargeable to tax has escaped assessment. Can you say this? Can you say this? This will give them the power to what? to issue a notice under 148. Are you clear, beta? Second point. Any audit objection box 
to the effect that the assessment in the case of an assessee for the relevant era has not been made in accordance with the provisions of the act any audit objection has been made by the auditor the auditor has made an objection so that objection can be the basis for the cbdt for the assessing officer to say that i have an information which suggests that income chargeable to tax has escaped assessment did you understand now they have made small small amendments what small amendments earlier there was a flag word over there they have removed the word flag from here you can check the amendment which they have made i am telling you that second in second point they have there was a audit of only cag now they have removed the word cag you can check any audit would be covered are are you able to understand i am just trying to explain you how what amendments they have made you are not supposed to know that you are supposed to know the new one so the first two points were there last year but they have made minor changes in that and the next three points are absolutely new points okay shall i go ahead the third point which can be the third point which can be called as what the information chargeable to tax has escaped assessment third any information received under agreement referred to in 90 or 90a you can write in d bracket dt double a dt double a stands for double taxation avoidance agreement listen carefully if the income tax authority in india listen carefully i have taught you in the chapter of income tax authority and powers please pay attention if the income tax authority wants information of which himalaya they have to have a dt double a with you united kingdom did you know i have told you this so if the united kingdom and india has a dt double a under section 90 or 90a and if the united kingdom authority is giving me what some information about vijay malya i can say that i have an information which suggests that income chargeable of vijay malya is subject to tax are are you clear so this points are telling you from where all you are getting information the first information you are getting from sft or ais the second information you are getting from audit objections the third information you are getting from what you are getting from dt double etc okay the fourth information any information made available to the a under the scheme notified under 135a now what is notified under 135a what is notified under 135a is 133 133 is what collection of information do you remember that calling of information all these things are covered in 135a let me show you 135a in the previous book <laughs> Can you say this one thirty five a beta? See on the board. This covers calling of information, collecting of information. Can you see this? So the AO sends you notice that under various section to call for information. So that information can suggest him or not that your income is chargeable to tax as escaped assessment. So that can also be the case. And the last but not least, point number E that you will explain me now. any information which requires action in consequence of the order of the tribunal or court can you explain me this or else i am always there i am not telling you that you have to explain this it's okay even if you not but if you can nothing better than that can you explain me this if no then also it's okay shall i are shall i now listen carefully what does this particular point means this point means there is a high court judgment or there is a tribunal judgment there is a supreme court judgment okay in some other case some other case there is a high court judgment there is a supreme court judgment okay in some other case which says that this expenditure is disallowed can that be considered as an information for me to disallow your expense also subsequent development in the law now check point number 8 talks about that now ao should have either of the five things with him if he has either of the five things he has got the power what beta he has got the power what to issue notice okay so we learn step by step once again 
shall be first step should be what he wants to do assessment under this section first step he has to do inquiry about which we do not know as of now much assume that inquiry is done then what is the next step issue a notice for what for filing the roi but before issuing the notice before issuing the notice he has to fulfill that last sentence na what is that last sentence you have to buy hard that sentence please income chargeable to tax he should have an information which suggest him that income chargeable to tax has escaped assessment and what do i mean by this phrase this phrase means he should have either of the five things mentioned below can you see that now what if he doesn't have any of them can he do can he send notice no he cannot send notice he doesn't have information from sft or ais he doesn't have audit objection he doesn't have information from dtwa he doesn't have information from collection of information he doesn't have what any information from court or tribunal's order he cannot send notice yes or no now pay attention please we are moving to the last part of this first section shall i but just below this explanation the government has added another explanation explanation 2 which is very dangerous for us as very dangerous shall we read yes let's read that in this cases given below in the cases given below it shall be deemed that it shall be deemed that the ao has information which suggests that income chargeable to tax has escaped assessment for 3 years immediately preceding the ay relevant to the py in which all these things are are striked off by finance act 22 you can see over here strike off words are removed by finance act 22 so ignore that beta shall we read again by ignoring that paragraph in the cases given below it shall be deemed that ao has information which suggests that income chargeable to tax has escaped assessment where the search is initiated or requisition is made or any material is seized or requisition or survey is conducted it means what do you know what is the danger part of this particular provision explanation to cr are please cr in these cases in these cases it is deemed that you have escaped assessment you have, it is deemed that you have escaped income it means in these cases you don't have to fulfill these conditions to send notice now which are those dangerous cases if the search underline is initiated under 132 on or after 1st april 2021 try to understand if a search is conducted on or after 1st april 2021 by default the ao will send you notice he do not have to fulfill any of the five condition mentioned about are you clear and that is the reason i have taught you in the last chapter after search and seizure is done did i tell you or not that you will be liable for an assessment under 147 by default he will directly send you a notice he will not get into the activity of finding out whether either of the five things have happened or not are you clear second first case is what search case if the search is conducted on or after 1st april 2021 sir why on or after 1st april 2021 because i have told you pay attention on the board please that this new section is applicable from 1st april 2021 before 1st april 2021 there was a separate search and seizure assessment do you remember that or not so this new provision is applicable from 1st april 2021 earlier it was not applicable second point pay attention please pay attention if a survey is conducted under 133a are baap re then also there will be a direct assessment yes not being survey under 133a subsection 2a or subsection 5 now see how minute amendments have been made up when they brought this amendment in the last year they have excluded these two sections but in the current year they have removed one of them now we need to understand what are these surveys let me tell you first of all 133a survey subsection 2a is the survey of tds and tcs do you remember that they can do survey for tds and tcs also and subsection 5 survey is for ceremonies is for what ceremonies wedding functions can they do survey in subsection 5 ceremonies wedding etc i will show you that because knowing that subsection in detail is relevant for understanding the concept 
This is the section of your survey. Okay, see on the board, all of you. Subsection, these two subsections are mentioned over here. Can you see this? 2A, TDS, TCS. And can you see this subsection 5 for ceremonies, events, functions? So, I am highlighting this. Subsection 5, ceremonies, event, functions. Subsection 2A, TDS, TCS. Please, now, I want this much interpretation to be done from your side. I expect that much to be done from your side. Please tell me. They have excluded two surveys from your last year. Now, out of that, they have removed one survey from your in the current year. It means now in the exclusion, there is only one survey. So, can I ask you one question? If they are doing survey, forget about these two points. Now, general survey. Can they, are they supposed to fulfill these five points? First question, if they are doing general survey, forget about these two points. Are they supposed to fulfill, are, is the assessing officer supposed to fulfill these five points? Can he directly send you a notice? Perfect. Second question, he can directly send you a notice. If they are doing a survey, if they are doing a survey for TDS, TCS, for what? Are they supposed to fulfill these points? Are beta kajal, read properly. If they are doing survey for TDS, TCS, can they directly send you a notice? Or they are supposed to fulfill either of the five points? Because the TDS survey is excluded from direct notice, na beta? Third point, if they are doing survey for ceremony or events or functions or weddings, are they supposed to fulfill these five points? Are they supposed to fulfill these five points? Absolutely no. Are, are you clear? Only for one survey they are supposed to fulfill these five points and that is 133A subsection 2A, that is TDS survey. Are you clear? Perfect, beta. The third and the fourth point also if you read, that is about search and seizure only. Check. Is it clear? So now, let's do this much without looking into the books and understand the procedure at our end. Please tell me what is the first thing that the AO will do? Enquiry. Under which section? Which we don't know as of now how it is done. Okay, we will see just now. Once the inquiry is done, what is he supposed to do? Send a notice under which section? For what? ROI. But before sending this notice, he should have something with him. What is that? Some information he should have which suggests that income chargeable to tax has escaped assessment. Now, what do I mean by this phrase? Five points. Is it clear? Can you tell me five points in your own language? He should have information from DTAA, correct? SFT or AIS? Audit objection? Then? Court order, tribunal order, then? 135A collected information. Okay? Now, he should have either of the five information to send this notice. Now, is it always necessary to have this five information? In explanation two cases, it is not necessary. Can he directly send you a notice? In which case? If the search is conducted on or after 1st April 2021, okay? Or if a survey is conducted on or after 1st April 2021 other than TDS survey, okay? Perfect, beta. 
Now, let's go ahead with the discussion. The discussion is not completed. Shall I go ahead? Now, let's see how inquiry will be conducted. How? This is the, that's the first step, na? How inquiry will be conducted? Under section 148A. Now, I am giving you a brief synopsis and then I will read the provision. Okay? Now, please tell me. A was information that you have escaped some income. So, what you will do? Step 2. I am telling you the steps of inquiries now. Okay? Shall I? So, A was information that you have escaped income. That information can be either of the five informers. Now, AO will do no. What do you know? AO will send you a show cause notice. AO will send you what? Show cause notice means what? He is, he is trying to give you what? Opportunity of being hurt, right? He will tell you that I have an information that you have purchased the property of 50 lakh rupees. Please tell us the source. Okay? So, you have to what? Reply now. If, you, if your reply is good, he will stop everything. Okay? Or your reply, if your reply is not good enough. Or if you do not reply only, do not reply means not good enough, na? If I ask you something and you are not replying only, then what should I assume? It means you are, you are escaping the income, right? Or you do not reply only. Then AO will complete his what? Complete his what? Enquiry. Enquiry and then... After he completes his inquiry, does he get the power to send you notice under 148? Yes. And if the assessor is giving you sufficient reason and good reasons, then he will not do anything. He will stop the proceeding there itself. Okay. So, now let us see the what inquiry section. Page number 17.2. All of you. Conducting inquiry. Providing opportunity before issue of notice under 148. 148A has been inserted with effect from 1st April 2021. It provides the provisions regulating the pre-assessment inquiry after providing an opportunity to the SSE before issue of notice under 148. These provisions are replicas of Supreme Court guidelines rendered in the case of GK and Drive Shop with a few modifications. The provision of 148A are given below. Earlier there was a Supreme Court case which used to speak about this procedure. So, now the government has made a provision only of that with some modifications. Modifications are as follows. Listen, beta. Please pay attention on the board first of all. Please. There are four steps. 148A, subsection A, clause A. Then there is clause B, then there is clause C and then there is clause D. Is it clear? Now, listen carefully. What is there in clause A? Step by step, whatever I said you, it is there in four clauses. Clause A. Before issue of notice, before 148, the AO shall conduct inquiry if, requ if required with prior approval of the specified authority. With respect to the information which suggests that income chargeable to tax has escaped assessment. That now the AO has income. Now the AO has information which suggests that income chargeable to tax has escaped assessment. So, he has to conduct an inquiry. Okay? Now, how will he conduct inquiry? Before issuance of notice under 148, the AO shall provide underline an opportunity of being heard to the SSE. With the prior approval of specified authority, not required, it was required in last year, now it is not required. Okay. For this purpose, a notice is required to be served upon the SSE to show cause underline. As to show cause as to why a notice under 148 should not be issued on the basis of information which suggests that income chargeable to tax has escaped assessment. So, you have to give what? A show cause notice to the assessee. Okay? Now, how much time you will give the assessee to reply? Okay? So, you will give minimum 7 days and maximum 30 days. Read this. So, minimum 7 days has to be given to assessee and maximum 30 days. Can that be extended? Yes, 30 days can be extended also if required. Check it. Is it clear? Because
because it might happen that if the question asked by Bhavisha is in this section why an opportunity is given. The reason is because uh, there is some income which is disclosed, there is some uh, investments which are disclosed in SFT. Okay. We are giving you an opportunity so that you can explain the source. If you can explain me the source, then why to do all these assessments and all that? Okay. Why do not necessarily open the assessment? It is a long down process then. It will go on for months. Shall I go ahead? Now, before issuance of notice under 148, the AO shall consider the reply of the SRC furnished, if any, in response to the above show cause notice. Obviously, SRC's reply will be considered now before issuing your notice. Now, then the AO will decide, then the AO will decide whether it is a, whether or not it is a fit case to issue notice under 148 on the basis of material available on the record, including the reply of the SSE in response to the above show cause notice, okay? Then the AO will decide that, whether it is, means if you give a valid reason, then he will leave you. If you do not give a valid reason, then he will issue a notice under 148 requiring you to file the ITR, yes? For this purpose, underline an order shall be passed by the AO. The AO will pass an order under 148, A subsection D, clause D, sorry, with the prior approval of specified authority. Such order shall be passed within one month from the end of the month, in which the reply referred to in 148C is received by him. So, within one month, the AO will pass the order. The moment you give the reply, within one month from the end of the month, they will what? They will pass the order. If you do not give a reply, okay? It is possible, no? you are not replying only to the AO's notice. So, AO has issued you a show cause notice, but you are not replying. So, then in that case, we will pass an order within one month from the end of the month in which the time allowed to the SSE was expired. Okay? But whatever time was given to you, maximum time is how much given to you? 30 days. So, whenever 30 days will expire, he will pass within one month an order against you. Okay? That the inquiry is done, now we can send a notice. Now, listen carefully. I am just putting this steps again on the board. So, the AO has information. What shall he do? Shall he directly send the notice? Take approval and then send what? A show cause notice. Okay. How much time limit should be given to us, Sasi? To reply? 7 to 30 days. And then, then decide, decide whether it is a fit case or, or not. Shall I consider the reply of the SSE while doing this? Reply should be considered and after that decide. Okay. If SSE replies, then within one month, from the end of the month in which it replies, and if it SSE does not replies, Okay, shall I go ahead? Then in within one month from when the time limit to reply expires. Okay. Now one last thing over here, that's it. These dangerous provisions will be done after that. Shall I go ahead? In some cases, the government says that you don't have to do inquiry also. Without inquiry, you directly send the notice under 148. In some cases. Shall we see those cases? See here. Read it. I do not have to explain much over here. The one line explanation will be sufficient. You read this paragraph and then I will ask you a question. Let me tell you which are those cases in which there is no inquiry. Search, search, search. 
and where you get the information under 135A. So there are two cases only, search, search, search and 135A cases, where you get information from the SSE, where you collect information, where you call information, etc. Okay, there is no need to do any kind of inquiry also. Now, shall I ask you some questions? Sure, you can go through the book and answer me, whatever we have done so far till here. Don't go beyond this, not required. I will be asking you question only from the first three pages. Shall I? Are you ready? So, my first question. If a search is conducted on or after 1st April 2021, first question. Is inquiry under 148A required? No. Rest of you please answer Kajal Vinita. Second, inquiry not required. Is the AO supposed to satisfy the five points mentioned in 148? Sure, he is not supposed to do. It means can he directly issue notice? No inquiry. No need to satisfy yourself that income chargeable to tax has escaped assessment. The moment you do search, you get an automatic right to directly send the notice under 148. Are you clear? No inquiry needed, no five points to be satisfied. Clear? Those five points are deemed to be satisfied. Yes? Question number two. Suppose there is a survey conducted on or after. 1st April 2021. Is inquiry under 148A required? Inquiry not required. Read third page properly, Bhavisha. If you are saying no. Is survey mentioned in third page? Are this minute detailing has to be done. And they have asked a question in November. They have asked a question in November 22 RTP on this point. Huh? <laughs> on this point. Please tell me whether the inquiry under 148 is required for survey or not. Yes, because its survey is not excluded from inquiry. Without inquiry, you cannot touch the survey cases. Survey is not mentioned here. Are you able to understand data? This is not copy paste of previous page. Now you will not make mistake. Now you will be very careful. Are we supposed to satisfy these five points or we can send the notice directly? These five points are supposed to be satisfied or it is deemed to be satisfied? It is deemed to be satisfied because in 148 explanation survey is mentioned. Are you clear? Can I ask you the third question? If there is a survey, you can copy this particular thing or you can take a photograph of this after afterwards. Okay, beta? First case, second case, third case. Survey on or after? 1st April 2021 of TDS or TCS. Am I supposed to conduct inquiry? You don't have to think much. Survey is not covered in inquiry section. Automatic, automatic uh, notice cannot be sent. You have to do inquiry for survey cases. Can I directly issue notice under 148 or I have to satisfy 5 points. Satisfy either of 5 points. Are you clear? And last but not least, there is an information collected from 135A, am I supposed to conduct inquiry? Hmm. No, 
not required but am i supposed to satisfy the five points yes can you see this this is not copy paste of each other some point is mentioned here some is mentioned there some is not mentioned here some is not mentioned there yes or no therefore can i say listen carefully first search and caesar 148 and 148 a mentioned at both the place at both the place it is there na survey normal it is mentioned here but not mentioned here survey of tds tcs not mentioned here not mentioned here and faceless collection of information it is not mentioned here but mentioned here are you clear these are the maximum possibilities that can come will you take the photograph of this beta for your better understanding take a photograph of this i'll scroll this just wait beta अरे तू गाना नहीं गा रहा सुर में कब से आई डोंट नो हाउ टू सिंग कौन से एंगल से माय वॉइस इज गुड यार आई एम शाउटिंग सो मच इट्स सो हार्ड फॉर सिंगिंग यू नीड अ मेलोडी वॉइस माय वॉइस इज सो हार्ड आई नो दैट इट मी मस्त आवाज है उसकी He can sing. <laughs> right. You pass CA final exams with rank. I'll give you a copy. Take a photograph of this also. Done. Now, this is what this provision is all about. Till year. Okay. Failure. Now, one last thing, which is again an amendment made by Finance Act 2022. Let's read that a small amendment, which talks about certain approvals. 148B new section is inserted from this year Finance Act 22 amendment. This is as you can see over here. I have written over here till last year. So you can just imagine that in last year only they brought this provision, and in current year they are making so many changes. They are not aware of what they are bringing also. they are they don't know how long this will last also 148b has been inserted with effect from 1st april 2022 to provide that no order of assessment or reassessment or recomputation shall be passed by an ao below the rank of jc except with the prior approval of additional commissioner additional director joint commissioner joint director in respect of assessments consequent to sort survey requisition to re reduce un to reduce avoidable inaccuracies now what do i mean by this if an ao if an ao which is below the rank of jc who is below the rank of jc acdc and ito if they want to pass an assessment order what ultimately an assessment order will be passed now on completion of assessment in case of search and survey which are sensitive cases na right so they have to take an approval approval from these people these four authorities can you see that otherwise they cannot pass an order not much important academically okay so if an if a authority if an income tax officer below the rank of jc is doing survey wala case is doing search wala case then he has to take an approval to pass an order from assistant commissioner sorry additional commissioner uh, uh, additional director joint commissioner joint director is it clear these four authorities are somewhat similar to what we have done in the first page of search and seizure if you remember okay so we'll stop the lecture here because from after this we are going to start with the time limits for how many years they can make assessment i have told you na for 3 years or 10 years 
In that also they have made significant amendments in finance act 2022 you can see over there. In one year they have made so many changes. One year. They have brought this new section in 21 and sub substantially changed in 2022. Pay attention please. Let's go ahead with the discussion of section 147 which we have started in the last lecture. A very, very, very important section for us. Whereby the assessing officer is opening the assessment of earlier years. Okay. So there are a lot of conditions that we have seen yesterday. He should have some information which suggests that income chargeable to tax has escaped assessment, so on and so forth. Okay. Now pay absolute attention, all of you. Uh, and let's now today understand for how many years they will they can send you the notice. So if you escape an income in 2022-23. And if you have not shown some income in 2022-23, so till when a notice can come to you, okay. So, let us try to understand that. So, the time limit to issue notice, the time limit to issue notice is given under section 149, okay. So, the time limit to issue notice is given under which section? It is given under section 149. Okay. So, what does section 149 has to say? It talks about the time limit to issue notice. For how many years? Till when the government can send you the notice. Okay. Shall we start? So, pay attention please all of you. So, there are two time limits as I have been saying from the very beginning of this section that there are two time limits. One is 3 years, one is 10 years, right? So, let us see the first case. First case is the normal case and the second case is the special case. The normal case is the case of 3 years and the special case is the case of 10 years. Okay, now you have to pay absolute attention first of all on the normal case. Let us talk about the normal case first of all. Notice can be put it in circle, issued. Within 3 years from the end of the relevant AY, notice beyond the period of 3 years can be issued only in few specific cases given below. Now, you have to pay absolute attention over here. Notice can be issued within 3 years from the end of the relevant AY. Okay. So, now pay attention please. You have to read from year till year. From year till year. That is it. And net, now, let us try to analyze this. Suppose, if I escape some income in previous year 22-23, pay attention on the board please. Then notice will not be sent from the end of this year. It will be, the 3 year will be counted from the end of the relevant AY. So, the relevant AY will be 23-24. So, from the end of the relevant AY, there is 3 years time limit with the government. And the 3 years time limit will complete on 31st March 2000. 27. Okay. This is the last date. Last date to do what? Read carefully. Till this date, you should receive the notice or they should send the notice. This is the last date to send. Okay. Is it clear? This is the last day to send the notice. Okay. Now, so they cannot send notice beyond 2027? No. Generally, no. This is the last date by which they are supposed to send you the notice. Okay. Now, if they want to send the notice beyond this date, listen carefully. Say previous year 22-23 is the case. Assessment year 23-24 is the case. If they want to send beyond this date, beyond this date, then they can send till 31st March 2034 also. They can send. They can send. That is... From the end of this, how many years? 10 years. They can send. But if they want to send beyond this, beyond 3 years, that is for the next 7 years, or I can say for the last 7 years if they want to send, okay, then they have to fulfill certain conditions. They cannot just send the notice beyond 3 years and up to 10 years. For that, there is a specific case over here. Shall we read it? Let us read together. Notice can be issued beyond 3 years, but not beyond 10 years. 
from the end of the relevant era where AO has in his possession evidence which reveals that Income escaping assessment represented in the form of what? An asset. Put it in the box asset. Just, just ignore this point as of now. Ignore this point as of now because this is an amendment made by Finance Act 2022. Income represented in the form of asset. Okay. Pay attention now please. This time limit is very tricky. Once this is done, this topic is done. There is nothing great left after that. Now, just jump directly here. Ignore this paragraph. Okay. Again, I am re reading from the above, from the very first line. Notice can be issued beyond 3 years, but not beyond 10 years. From the end of the relevant AY. Where the AO has in his possession, which reveals that income escaping assessment represented in the form of asset which has escaped assessment amounts to or likely to amount to 50 lakh or more for assessment year. For this purpose, asset shall include immobile property, being land or building or both or shares and securities, loans and advances, deposits in bank account. Now, please underline this asset. This is the definition of asset for you. Assets includes immobile property. Shares and security, number 2. Loans and advances, number 3. And deposits in bank account, number 4. Now, pay absolute attention. We need to understand the implication of this. Okay. Tell I? Now, let's try to understand this with example. Suppose. Suppose in previous year, 30-31, okay, the AO has possession of an evidence that in, pay attention please all of you, that in previous year 22-23, the SSEs has escaped income of around 50 lakh rupees or more than that, okay, of more than or equal to 50 lakh rupees, listen carefully, He has evidence. He has got the evidence in 2030-31. That in 20-23, as he has escaped an income of 50 lakhs or more. And that income, obviously, whatever you earn in the form of income, that has to be represented in some asset, na? Yes or no? That has to be represented in the form of some assets, yeah. Okay? So, now, suppose that is in the form of what? With this income, which you have escaped, you have bought an office. So, is this escaped income represented in the form of an immobile property? Are yes or no, beta? So, now, the AO has the right to do what? The right to charge this income, even though 3 years have gone. Because in such cases, the AO can charge income up to how many years? Up to 10 years. Are you clear? So, there are two conditions over here. First is, your escaped income has to be 50 lakhs or more and it should be represented in the form of an asset and the government has given the definition of asset. Assets includes land and building, shares and securities, deposits in bank account, loans and advances. That's it. Okay. But is it clear? Now listen carefully. Yes, please say. I'll come. I'll come to that. Venita has asked the question, if we only have hard cash of 50 lakhs or more, then what will happen? Then whether 10 year time limit will be applicable or whether 3 year time limit will be applicable. Now you guys only say, read the provision. What will be up? Only read to the extent we have read. Huh? Don't read what we have not read so far. What will happen? What time limit will be applicable? If the escaped income is represented in the form of cash, it will be 3 years. Yes. Because there is no, con there is no mention of cash over there. 
forget about hard cash vinita let me tell you if ao has evidence that you have escaped an income of 50 lakhs or more listen carefully and that is represented in the form of jewelry what can it happen or not how many years time limit will be applicable 3 years or 10 years again 3 years will be applicable not 10 years because the word asset does not include over year jewelry are, are you clear maybe that is a mistake by the government of india they should write jewelry also jewelry is a very common asset which person will use to hide income yes or no clear now this was the provision listen carefully now this was the provision till last year and yeah last year only this section came right now that's it the provision is over okay now pay attention now pay attention now pay attention now there is one mistake in this provision what we have learned so far okay now what is that mistake pay attention please all of you suppose beta in 22 23 i have earned an escaped income of 50 lakhs or more okay okay and i have done some transaction with that i have done transaction with that okay shall i say suppose some wedding is done with that money in previous year 25 26 now ao came to know about this in 2030 31 -30 okay when did he came to know 30 31 ao came to know now this income was cannot be charged in 2030 31 -30 right because for this income only 3 years time limit will be applicable right because if you want to apply more than 3 years and up to 10 years then the income should be represented in the form of asset na Here the income is not representing in the form of an asset, but the income is incurred as an expenditure, na? Yes. Similarly, you have done some wedding, some function, you have bought some, you have you have, you have done some uh, foreign travel, you have you have you incurred some uh, other things, etc. For your purpose, then this will this cannot be covered. So finance at twenty two made an amendment. And apart from asset, there are certain other things also which now will be covered in this section. See point number two. We will again read from here. The AO has in its possession evidence which reveals that the income escaping assessment represented in the form of what? Point number two now. What represented in the form of what? Expenditure in respect of a transaction or in relation to an event or occasion or entries in the books of accounts. now this is applicable from 1st april 2022 this came in the current year the bold and the underlined words are amendment made by finance act 22 okay so now if we have done some expenditure okay of that escaped income of 50 lakhs or more 50 lakhs and more is criteria that is necessary so now if you have escaped an income of 50 lakhs or more listen carefully and if you have purchased some asset or if you have done some expenditures in relation to anything in relation to any transaction event occasion or you have passed some books books of accounts entry with that then you have to be scared about that for 10 years the ao can catch you for 10 years is it clear now if he wants to issue notice for say you have escaped income not in one year but in two years but in three years can it happen You have escaped income of fifty lakhs or more in twenty two, twenty three, also twenty three, twenty four, also twenty four, twenty five, also yes or no? Then he has to send notice for every year. Check over here. Sir, every year the fifty lakhs mark has to be crossed. Yes, for whichever year the fifty lakhs limit is crossing, or exact fifty lakhs is also fine. You will be liable for what? a notice up to 10 years hello all my dear students i hope you all are doing good uh, so today we are going to start with the discussion of a very important topic for your exams one of the most important topic you can safely say for your exams and that is taxation of virtual digital asset 
which is absolutely a new amendment made by Finance Act 2022. Till last year, that is till 21-22, there was no clarity about how a virtual digital asset like cryptocurrency and all should be taxed. So now the government has came up with a complete solution on how to tax a cryptocurrency, how to tax an NFT, that is non-fungible token, so on and so forth. How to tax these things? The government has come up with a complete solution. First of all, <coughs> you need to understand that the government has first of all defined what is cryptocurrency, what is virtual digital assets. First of all, the government has given the definition of what the virtual digital assets. Then the government has also given the taxability of virtual digital assets. The taxability is given in section 115 BBH. And then the government has also given the tedious implication with respect to virtual digital asset which is given under section 194S. So we have to see all of them and then later on there were a lot of doubts with respect to this. So the government has clarified that doubt through a CBDT circular. CBDT has given a long notification in the form of various FAQs. And those FAQs are trying to address what questions which can come to our mind. So you have to be very careful. It's a very important discussion for your exam. Be very careful about it. All of you, please pay attention. The first thing which we need to understand over here is the definition of virtual digital asset. What does virtual digital asset includes? Let's see. There are two things which the government has included in the definition of virtual digital asset. Now, this chapter is there in your book one. Chapter number 29, book one. Okay. So, come to chapter number 29 in your book one. It's not there in book two. It's there in book one. Section 247A is the definition of virtual digital asset and they have included two things in that. Virtual digital asset includes means what? First of all, any cryptocurrency like Bitcoin and all. And second is NFT, like non-fungible token. You might be knowing that there is something called as NFT, which is very popular in today's world. So I will not get into the explanation of what is NFT, but there are a lot of celebrities who sell their non-fungible token. So you can say that I have the rights of that celebrity. For example, Amitabh Bachchan has come up with his NFT and it has been sold for lakhs of rupees. Like Mahindra Singh Dhoni is also coming with his NFT. And many other celebrities across the world are coming with an NFT. And NFT gives you what? Right over that particular celebrity. So you have the right of that celebrity. That is also an intangible asset. So it's a kind of intangible asset. It's a kind of virtual asset. And the government in the third case has said that they can include any other digital assets as may be notified by central government. Okay. They can include any other notified asset as the central government may notify. Further, they have said that the central government also has the power to exclude any digital asset from the definition of virtual digital asset. And they will be also coming with a notification to exclude any digital asset. And what I feel personally is they have put this provision only because of one reason. That is my personal perception. The reason why they have put this provision is because they want to exclude the crypto which RBI will come up later on. So they want to exclude that crypto from here. So RBI has announced that they will be coming with their own cryptocurrencies. <coughs> so far it has not been uh, launched. So far it is not yet available in public place, public forum. But RBI has announced that they are going to come up with their own cryptocurrency. So I personally feel that this exclusion might be for that particular crypto only which RBI is going to come up. RBI wants to encourage their own cryptocurrency. Therefore, they want to keep this own cryptocurrency out of the scope of what? The taxability. Or they might give some relaxed taxation to that. Okay. <clears throat> so this is the first thing that you have to keep it in mind. What is the definition of virtual digital asset? So virtual digital asset will mean what? First of all, it means cryptocurrency. Second, NFT, non-fungible token. Third, any other 
asset, any other digital asset as the government may notify later on. So far they have not notified anything. And the fourth and the last point is, they can exclude, if the government wants, they can bring a notification to exclude any digital asset from the definition of virtual digital asset. We are presuming that when the RBI's cryptocurrency will come, they will try to exclude that cryptocurrency from the definition of virtual digital asset to give relaxation to RBI cryptocurrency over Bitcoin and other kind of currencies. Okay. So now let's come to the taxability. The second part of this particular section, this particular discussion. This is something which we have done. Now let's come to this one. 115 BBH. What is 115 BBH? 115 BBH talks about taxability. The first thing which we need to address over here, what will be the nature of income of virtual digital asset? I have a cryptocurrency. If I sell that cryptocurrency and if I earn some profit out of the sale, okay, now what will be the nature of that? Will that be considered as a capital gains or will that be considered as a business income? So that depends. The law has not mentioned about the nature of capital, nature of gain. I have a cryptocurrency. I am selling that cryptocurrency. With that sale, I am getting some profit. That profit, whether it will be a whether that profit will be considered to be a capital gains or PGBP, that depends. That depends upon the facts and circumstance of every case. By default, it will be a capital gains. But if you are regularly trading in the cryptocurrency, then it can be called as PGBP or income also. That's what it is written over here. Check. <laughs> cryptocurrency or NFT may be deemed as capital assets if they acquired for the purpose of investments. In such case, any gain arising on transfer of such assets shall be taxable under the head capital gains. If, however, such transactions are substantial and or or if such assets are held for trading purpose, income from sale or purchase of virtual digital assets may be taxed as what? As business income. <coughs> so, income from transfer of a virtual digital asset, it may be taxed in capital gains, it may be taxed in PGBP. That depends. If it is purchased in the form of an investment, then capital gains. If it is purchased for trading purpose, then PGBP. Now, nevertheless, it doesn't matter whether it is PGBP or capital gains. In either of the case, it will be taxable at 30%. The way lottery is taxed, the way winning from horse race is taxed, plus surcharge if applicable, plus health and education says. Irrespective of whether it is capital gains or PGBP, irrespective of whether it is long-term capital gain or short-term capital gain or PGBP, check here. The tax rate is same, whether it is business income, whether it is short term capital gains or whether it is long term capital gains. It doesn't matter only. It doesn't matter only. You are not going to be taxed at a different rate for different income. Every income will be taxed at 30%. It doesn't matter to you whether it is a capital gains or whether it is a, a PGBP or whether it is what, whether it is a business income. It doesn't matter. Okay. It is one and the same thing. <coughs> okay. Now, there are some important points which we have to keep it in our mind. First of all, no deduction of any expenditure will be allowed. Nothing will be allowed other than the cost of acquisition. Only cost of acquisition will be allowed. Apart from that, nothing will be allowed to you. No deduction of any expenditure. Nothing will be allowed. For example, if you are if you have bought Bitcoin, say you purchased Bitcoin for 100 rupees and then you sold for 250 rupees. That is a very straight calculation you are supposed to make. Selling price 250 minus cost of acquisition 100. 150 rupees tax at how much? 30%. That's it. Matter close. No deduction of any expense, no deduction of any loss, no deduction of any set up of loss, any expense, any allowance, nothing will be allowed against this. This is flat taxable at 30%. Suppose if there is a loss, <coughs> suppose if there is a loss, you purchased at 250 and sold at 100, so there is a loss of 150, right? This loss cannot be set off. Cannot be set off against any income. 
it cannot be set off against any income it cannot be set off against this income also not allowed this loss is lapsed forever if there is a loss on transfer of a virtual digital asset that loss is lapsed forever that will not be allowed to be carried forward and set off against any income will not be allowed to carry forward and set off that loss for any income okay will not be allowed to do that check that be very careful loss arising on transfer cannot be adjusted against any other income not allowed any loss incurred by SSE from transaction cannot be adjusted against income from virtual digital asset also. <coughs> if there is a loss on transfer of a cryptocurrency, that loss cannot be set off against other income also. That loss cannot be set off against, against the income of what? Transfer of virtual digital asset also. That loss is lapsed. Forget about that loss. So very dangerous taxability. Very, very, very dangerous taxability. The taxability is very straightforward. Tax rate 30% plus surcharge if applicable. And cess. And cess will be applicable always. How to compute? Very simple. Sale minus cost. That's it. This is the only deduction which is available. Nothing else. If this is profit, pay 30% tax. If this is loss, tax. Cannot be set off against any other income. Cannot be set off against the income from transfer of virtual digital asset also. Cannot be set off against the gain of cryptocurrency also. This is lapse forever. Okay. Now, the government has also put the implication of TDS. TDS has to be deducted. So, who will deduct TDS, when TDS has to be deducted, what is the timing of TDS, what is the rate of TDS, what is the threshold of TDS, we need to see all of that, okay. So, any person who is responsible for tax deduction under 194S, who is the deductor, a person responsible for payment to any resident. So, TDS has to be deducted when you make payment to only residents. If you make payment to non-resident, you will deduct TDS under section 195, not here. If you make the payment to resident, you will deduct the TDS. Who will deduct the TDS? Obviously, the buyer will deduct the TDS because buyer is making the payment to the seller. Okay. Who is the deductee? As I have told you, the deductee has to be resident. The deductee has to be resident. Resident, resident, resident. So who will deduct TDS? Let's see that. Buyer. Seller. Buyer while making the payment or credit, whichever is earlier, deduct TDS. Seller has to be resident, huh? please. If the seller is non resident, seller is non resident, then go to 195. Cannot come here. Okay. Be careful. Next question is what is the timing of TDS? That same credit or payment, whichever is earlier, traditional provision. The way we traditionally deduct TDS, in the same way we have to deduct TDS here also. Okay. Now this threshold is very important. This is slightly different kind of threshold. When should we deduct TDS? On every transaction, are we supposed to deduct TDS? Suppose if I am buying one cryptocurrency of hundred rupees, am I supposed to deduct TDS? The answer is no. There is the government has kept two thresholds. The consideration is payable by specified person. Then the threshold is 50,000 rupees. And by any other person other than specified person, the threshold is 10,000 rupees. So if the buyer, if the buyer is a specified person, then the consideration should exceed 50,000 rupees. If the buyer is non specified person, then the consideration is slightly lesser, 10,000 rupees. Then it has to deduct TDS. Okay. So here, it is talking about whom? The buyer. It is talking about whom? The buyer. Now you will ask who is, who is a specified person. The government has defined the term specified person means a person being an individual or HUF. 
इफ इज टोटल सेल ग्रॉस रिसीव ग्रॉस टर्न ओवर डज नॉट एक्सीड वन करोड़ रुपीज इफ इट इज डूइंग बिजनेस और इफ इट इज डूइंग प्रोफेशन इट डज नॉट एक्सीड फिफ्टी लैक्स इन द इमीजिएटली प्रिसीडिंग फाइनेंशियल एंड विद द वर्चुअल डिजिटल असेट इज ट्रांसफर्ड यू रिमेंबर दैट दिस इज अमिलर पॉइंट विच वॉज देयर इन वन नाइनटी फोर ए 194C, 194H, 194I, 194J. Do you remember that? Here also, if the buyer is individual HUF, and if the last year's turnover is less than one crore, or if the last year's profession turnover is less than 50 lakhs, then I will get a threshold of 50 lakh, 50,000. And if the last year's turnover or threshold is greater than 1 crore or 50 lakhs then i will get the threshold of 10000 rupees so here what has to be seen please pay attention here the buyer if is a specified person when he will become a specified person when the last years turnover is Less than one crore or less than fifty lakhs, then he becomes specified person, and this is only applicable to individual issue. So, if he is a specified person, then the threshold is greater than fifty thousand rupees. When he will become non-specified person, he will become non-specified person in two case. In case of individual HUF, if last year's turnover is greater than one crore or greater than fifty lakhs, and or it is other than individual, then always. Because this relaxation of fifty thousand is only for individuals and HUFs, not for everyone. We have to check the buyer. If the buyer is a small buyer, individual HUF last year's turnover is less than fifty lakhs, one crore, then the threshold is higher, fifty thousand. Up to fifty thousand, no need to deduct TDS. But if the assessee is an individual HUF as a big, a big, big buyer, last year's turnover is greater than one crore or greater than fifty lakhs, as the case may be for business or profession. Or if the assessee is a company or is a firm, then the this question is not applicable only. Then in these two cases, always the threshold is going to be how much? It has to be greater than ten thousand rupees. Okay, you can take a photograph of this if you want. <laughs> this will help you all to understand in a better way. <coughs> you have to check the status of the buyers. If the buyer last year, if the buyer is first of all individual actually, if the buyer is company, then by default it is ten thousand. Fifty thousand is only for individual HUF. That too, if the last year's turnover is less than one crore or less than fifty lakhs, or it is up to one crore, up to fifty lakhs, you can. Okay. Now, what is the percentage of TDS? The percentage of TDS is very simple. One percent. Okay. One percent is the TDS. Okay. One percent of the consideration for transfer of virtual digital asset. TDS rate is one percent, and when you make the payment to resident, obviously. This section is only applicable when the recipient is what resident. So obviously, for resident, we do not include surcharge and sales while deducting TDS. It is flat one percentage. Okay. Now one last thing over here. What if the consideration is payable in kind? Then what to do? You remember that I have told you this in what while while a uh, lottery also in section one ninety four B. That when you are paying the consideration in kind, then the payer cannot deduct TDS. Then the payer has to ensure that the other person has paid the tax, and then only release the consideration in kind. Otherwise, don't release the consideration in kind. You can do that also. Suppose if I am buying a cryptocurrency and I am giving you consideration in kind, then how will I deduct TDS from kind? You cannot deduct. Then in that case, your obligation is not to deduct. Your obligation is to only make sure that the other person has paid the tax. Just check this; it is exactly similar to 194B. Just check it once. So, if the payment is made in kind, then you have to ensure that before releasing the consideration, 
but to ensure that the tax required to be deducted has been paid in respect of such consideration by the other person. Okay, when it has to be considered when the consideration is made in kind. Uh, if you are making the payment through bank account or through cash, then you have to deduct the TDS at the rate of 1%. The same is the case in lottery. When you give the lottery in kind, when you give the winning in kind, then you have to ensure that the other person has paid the tax. I have given you the example of what? That the person has won a car, etc, etc, etc. Okay. Now, sir, am I supposed to take TAN number to deduct TDS? There is no need to take TAN. There is no need to take TAN. TAN is relaxed over here. Relaxation has been given with respect to TAN number. TAN number has been relaxed to you. Don't worry about it. Okay. Secondly, there is no need for, if the, if the other person has not filed the ITR, then 206AB is also not applicable. Do you remember that in general, if the other person does not file the ITR of last year, then I am supposed to deduct the TDS at twice the rate or 5% whichever is higher. Do you remember that? 206AB was there in TDS chapter. But that 206AB is not applicable for this section. 194S, 206AB is not. It means under this section, if the other person has not filed the ITR of last year, then also you will not deduct the TDS at twice the rate. You are not going to do that. Okay. <coughs> so, 206AB is not applicable. So, there are two relaxations which are given over here. The first relaxation is what? The other person, uh, the deductor is not liable to take TAN. First relaxation, second relaxation. If the deductee has not filed the ITR of last year, still you will not double the rate of TDS. You will deduct the TDS at 1% only. Okay. Last but not least, some overlapping of some sections, 194O and 194S. If there is an overlapping of two sections, then 194S shall prevail and 194O shall not prevail. It is 194S which is going to prevail and not 194O. Last but not least, this section is applicable from 1st of July 2022. Okay. So, this is what this section is all about. This is what the Bear Act talks about. This is exactly what is written in the Bear Act. I have not done any change in this. Even in our textbook, uh, it is the same thing, which is the ICI material. It is the same thing. So, I am directly dealing from here only, not from the textbook. Okay. So, now pay attention, please, all of you. Just go through it once, all of you, and then we'll move on to certain CBDT circular. A great circular is issued by CBDT explaining minute details about cryptocurrencies or transactions. Okay. So there are a lot of clarifications which are required with respect to this provision. CBDT has come up with a great clarification. We'll talk about all of them one by nine. Just go through this once and then we'll go ahead. Okay. Now, there is one question which I would like to show you all, uh, which is there in the question bank. If you come to question bank, uh, page number 32.7 in your question bank, it's a beautiful question. Let me talk about that. Okay. It's a beautiful question which will clarify a lot of things for you all. Then we'll move on to that CBDT circular. Okay. Let's read this question. This question explains us what used to happen in the last year when this provision was not there and what is going to happen in the current year after the provision is introduced. X54 years is a salaried employee, annual taxable salary 46 lakhs. He purchases and transfers the following cryptocurrency as an investor. So, as an investor means his income will be charged under what capital gains. Now, on May 1st, 2018, he has purchased some cryptocurrency of USDT, 2,40,000 quantity at 60 rupees. Okay. And then he transferred that in 2021, 70,000 and then 22, 30,000 and in 22, 23, 1,40,000 at different rates. Then there are some expenses on transfer also. Then in, again in April 22, he purchased some NFTs. And then he transferred that NFT in July 2022. Okay. So he purchased that 1400 and he sold at 1300. So there is a loss obviously. Apart from this, X, con X annually contributes 150,000 towards 
recognize provident fund apart from the information given above he has the following additional income long term capital loss of 1 lakh 2000 on transfer of residential house property on 31st march 2022 business loss of previous year 22 23 from a new part time business of trading in computer hardware 9 lakh 7130 Now X wants to know the tax implication pertaining to the previous year 21, 22, and 22, 23. X wants to know certain tax implications. Okay. So now, first of all, this is the year in which the provision of virtual digital asset was not there. So at that time, we used to treat virtual digital asset like a normal capital asset, and we used to take all the deductions, all the benefits, everything. Now, from this year onwards. we have to follow as per 115 bba so let's complete 2021 22 first of all <coughs> what has happened in 2021 22 first of all you have purchased the asset in 2018 and you are selling in 21 so you are selling after 3 years and 6 months approximately so this is long term so this will be computed as per long term capital gains Seventy thousand into sixty-five will be your sale consideration. Okay, just check one by one. First of all, I will write salary. Then the expenditure on transfer is five thousand rupees, and then index cost of acquisition will be seventy thousand into sixty rupees will be the cost into cost inflation index of twenty-one twenty-two divided by cost inflation index of eighteen ninety. Okay, so there is a loss of two lakh ten thousand rupees over year. Okay. Okay, I hope it is clear. Now there is one more transfer which we have done in twenty one twenty two. That is of this thirty thousand USDT. At what rate we have sold? We have sold at eighty rupees. Okay, eighty rupees we have sold. So thirty thousand into eighty. This will be your sale consideration. Three thousand will be your expenses on transfer, and then your cost of acquisition will be thirty thousand into sixty. Thirty thousand into sixty into cost inflation index of two thousand twenty one twenty two divided by eighteen nineteen. There is a long term capital gain. So last year there was nothing like that. You cannot set off the loss. So the loss of virtual digital asset cannot be set off. That has come from the current year. It was not there in the last year. <coughs> so last year we could easily set off this against this. Okay, there is no issue in this. So apart from that, we also have a loss of transfer of residential house property, one lakh two thousand. So my net capital gains will be three fifty nine positive minus two lakh ten thousand. This one I will reduce because I'm, last year there was no restriction. Restriction has been imposed in the current year in Finance Act twenty two, and one lakh two thousand is the loss of what of my residential house property. The business loss. i have to leave it because business loss cannot be set off against capital gains okay business loss uh, is there how much business loss is there in any ways in the next year it is not there in the current year it is there in 20 23 now this is the salary and this is your capital gains net income after that you can take deduction of atc 1 lakh 50000 rupees okay and then You have to pay tax on forty-four lakh ninety-seven thousand one hundred and forty rupees. Okay, now how will you pay tax? Out of this forty-four ninety-seven one forty, forty-seven one forty-three, which is long-term capital gains, will be subject to twenty percent tax, as you can see. And on balance, you will apply your slab rates. Okay, you can just check the solution. I can just tell you the solution once more. This first one. Is long term capital gains, so you are taking indexation. The second one is also long term capital gains, you are taking indexation. And there is one more loss of house property, so one gain, two loss. The net is gain forty seven one forty three. This forty seven one forty three will be subject to what? Will be subject to twenty percent tax. And on the balance income out of this, you will be applying the slab rates. Once you apply the slab rates, you will get this much tax as your final tax. Okay. Now this is the year in which the cryptocurrency concept was not introduced by the government of India. Now moving on to the next year, that is financial year twenty two twenty three. Now what is happening in twenty two twenty three? First of all, 
I am selling this one lakh forty thousand USDT at how much? At sixty six. So let's see first of all one lakh forty thousand USDT at sixty six will come to ninety to forty. Now against that there is some expenditure on transfer. Will I get the deduction of expenditure of transfer? The answer is no because as per the new provision you do not get any deduction except the cost of acquisition. Nothing will be allowed except the cost of acquisition. You can check over here. <coughs> No deduction of any expenditure. Even expense on transfer will not be allowed. Only cost of acquisition will be allowed. Check. Therefore, here you are not going to get the deduction of what? Deduction of 90 to, 90 to 40. Deduction of expenditure on transfer also. Even indexation benefit is not available. That is also not given by the government. So, 1,40,000 into 66. And what is the cost? 1,40,000 into 60. This will be long term capital gains 1 lakh 40 thousand to 60 no indexation also no indexation nothing will be allowed only the original cost of acquisition nothing else so 8 lakh 40 is the gain okay now there is one nft we are selling 600 nft sold at 1300 you are now going to get the deduction of what expenses 600 into 30 600 into 1300 600 into 1300 7 lakh 80 what is the cost 600 into 1400 is the cost. 600 into 1400 is the cost. Indexation not available. This 60,000 is loss. What will happen with this loss? This loss will be lapsed forever. This loss is not allowed as a deduction. I am sorry for that. This is what this provision is all about. This loss is also not allowed. This loss cannot be set off against your crypto's income also. It cannot be set off against salary income also. It cannot be set off against any income. Not allowed. Okay. Now what to do? What to do? 46 lakh salary? Yes. Is business loss? Business loss cannot be set off against salary. Not allowed. Is other loss? Other loss also cannot set off against what? Against crypto. Crypto income is directly taxable at 30%. So you have to carry forward this business loss to the next year. You cannot set off against salary first of all because against salary it is not allowed only. That we have done in the chapter of in the chapter of set up and carry forward only. Against this income also it is not allowed because against the crypto income, no deduction shall be allowed. Check no deduction in respect of any expenditure allowance set up of loss. Nothing will be allowed against crypto. Crypto will be flat taxable at 30%. Therefore, 46 plus 840 comes to how much? 54. <coughs> 54. But now we have to be very careful. On this 840, you have to take 30% tax. And on balance income, you have to take normal tax, but you have to apply 10% surcharge. Why? Because your total income is greater than 50 lakh rupees. So you have to apply 10% surcharge over your check. You have to apply 10% surcharge because your total income is greater than what? 50 lakhs. In the previous case, the total income was less than 50 lakhs. Therefore, there was no surcharge. But now you have to apply surcharge also. It's a beautiful question. Must do before exam. Please, you have to do this question. Go through this question once if you want. And then we'll move ahead with the next part. Okay. Go through this question once, all of you. So now let's go ahead with a CBDT circular. Now that circular is there. First of all, try to find out that. Okay. That circular is there in a separate chapter. That is chapter number 76, page number 15. 76.15. Here I have put all the latest circulars which the CBDT has issued. So that you can pay special attention on those circulars during the exams and also while you are revising the subject. <coughs> now, there are a lot of questions. There are around 6 to 7 FAQs which are raised over here through circular number 13, oblique 2022, page number 76.15, book number 2, book number 2, page number 76.15, question number 1. Now, to explain this question, it's a big question. The answer is very big. So, I have to explain that with the help of some examples now. Now, pay attention please. Please pay absolute attention all of you. Okay. Now, how crypto runs? Suppose there is a buyer of a crypto. Now, from, from where you will buy the cryptocurrency? Okay. From where you are going to buy? You are going to buy cryptocurrency through an exchange. There is one party who is an exchange. 
Now there is one more party who is called as broker. And there is one more party who is a seller and that seller has to be resident if you want to deduct TDS. Okay. Now listen carefully. You need to understand the mode of transaction first of all. I can buy a cryptocurrency through an exchange directly or through an exchange indirectly through a broker. <coughs> I can buy either through an exchange or either through a broker. Now the question is, the obligation of deducting TDS is on whom? Who will deduct TDS? Am I supposed to deduct TDS? Because when I will buy, I will give the money to the exchange. And then exchange will give the money to the seller through broker or directly to the seller. There are multiple players over here. Who is liable to deduct TDS? It is under whose obligation to deduct TDS? First of all, keep your mind clear that I can buy the crypto through an exchange directly or through a broker. I can directly buy through an exchange also. Or there might be an intermediary that is broker who is helping me to buy the crypto through an exchange. <coughs> what, is, what is an exchange? Exchange is nothing but a stock market. It's kind of stock market. And who is a broker? Broker is like all those different kind of apps. Like CoinDCX is a broker. CoinDCX is a broker. <coughs> now who will deduct TDS? So that is a very big problem. So there are four players. First player. Second player. Third player. You need to have lot of patience to understand this. And there is fourth player. How will I deduct the TDS? And even if I deduct the TDS, if I deduct the TDS, how will I come to know the pan of the seller? I do not know the pan of the seller because when I buy a cryptocurrency through an exchange, through any website or through any app, I do not come to know who is selling me. I don't come to know who is selling me. So how will I come to know the pan of that person? All these things are practical difficulties which are going to be removed through this circular. So the first question is about that only. Who is required to deduct tax? Who is required to deduct tax? When the transfer of virtual digital asset is taking place on or through an exchange. So when you are buying through an exchange and the payment is made by the purchaser, that is me, to the exchange directly or through broker and then from exchange it goes to the seller directly or through broker. Who is liable to deduct TD? So I am making the payment through exchange, either directly or through a broker. And then exchange is making payment to the seller, either directly or through a broker. Because seller might have also sold through a broker. <coughs> then who is liable to deduct TDS? So that is a big question over here. Am I liable to deduct TDS? Is exchange liable to deduct TDS? Is broker liable to deduct TDS? Who is liable to deduct TDS? Let's see the answer. If the transaction is taking place on, you have to be very patient. It's not that easy to understand. But the government has made a beautiful, beautiful clarification. We should appreciate the way they have made the provision and the way they have clarified the things. If the transaction is taking place on or through an exchange, there is a possibility of tax deduction requirement under 194S of the Act at multiple stages. That is, I will deduct, even exchange will deduct, even broker will deduct because everyone is paying to each other. I am paying, paying broker, broker is paying exchange, exchange is paying to the seller who will deduct TDS. Hence, in order to remove difficulty for transactions taking place on or through an exchange, the following clarifications are issued by the government. So now there are they have classified all the discussions into two parts. Part 1 and Part 2. What is Part 1? In case where the transfer of VDA takes place on or through an exchange and the VDA being transferred is owned by a person other than exchange. It means the virtual digital asset is not owned by the exchange. It is owned by some third party. So when you are coming into this case, Listen carefully. 
the virtual digital asset is owned by whom? Is owned by some third party seller. The digital asset is not owned by the exchange. There is a possibility that the digital asset is owned by the exchange also. That is also a possibility. That will come in part two. So now, <coughs> here there is a buyer. We are the buyer. Okay. Here there is an exchange. There might be a broker in between. There might not be a broker in between. We will try to see both the possibilities. And here there is a seller who is resident. And seller is a different person. Say Mr. A. I am Mr. X. Okay. Now I can sell to the seller through an exchange and through a broker. And I can directly also sell to through an exchange. Now who is liable to deduct the TDS? Be very careful. In this case, the buyer would be crediting or making payment to the exchange directly or through a broker. So I will be making the payment to whom? Listen carefully step by step. I will be making payment to the exchange either directly or I will be making the payment to exchange through a broker indirectly. Right? I can make directly the payment to the exchange or I can make indirectly the payment to exchange. Okay. So am I supposed to deduct TDS? Just wait. The exchange then would be required to credit or make the payment to the owner of the VDA being transferred either directly or indirectly through a broker. Once the money has reached exchange, what exchange will do? Exchange will either directly make the payment to the seller, that is the owner, or exchange will indirectly make the payment to the seller, that is the owner. First of all, understand this particular scenario that I can directly make the payment to exchange or I can make indirectly the payment to broker and then broker will make the payment to exchange. And then there is another possibility whereby once the money reaches the exchange, the exchange will directly make the payment to the seller or exchange will make the payment to broker and broker will make the payment to seller. In this entire transaction, the question is who will deduct the TDS? Will I deduct? Will exchange deduct? If there is an involvement of broker, then broker will deduct. Who will deduct? Who will deduct TDS? Let's see. Let's read ahead. The exchange then would be required to credit or make the payment to the owner of virtual digital asset transferred either directly or through a broker. Okay. Now, since there are multiple players to remove difficulty, it is clarified. So, now the clarification is coming. So what is the difficulty? The difficulty is who will deduct TDS? There are multiple players. Buyer is the possible player who can deduct TDS. Exchange is the possible player who can deduct TDS. Broker is a possible player who can deduct it. Ultimately, who will deduct? Let's see. The tax may be deducted under 194S only by the exchange, which is crediting or making payment to the seller. So, the tax may be deducted by whom? The tax may be deducted, the first point says that, only by the exchange, which is crediting or making payment to the seller. In case where the broker owns the VDA, Suppose the seller is what? The, se the broker itself is the seller. Suppose. There is also a possibility. Then also they have to deduct the TDS. Then also who will deduct TDS? The exchange. The primary responsibility is on the exchange. Now, the seller can be a third person, the seller can be broker itself, right? The broker itself has sold to the buyer. So, in either of the case, the TDS obligation is on the exchange. Be very careful, okay? This is the first point which says, in case where the broker owns the VDA, it is the broker who is the seller, hence the amount of consideration being credited or paid to the broker by the exchange is also subject to TDS. So, the primary responsibility over here, the primary responsibility over here is 
exchange will deduct you can write over here okay the exchange will deduct now point number two what does it say let's see that in case where the credit or payment between the exchange and the seller is through a broker and the broker is not the seller now if the credit is through a broker and the broker is not a seller then what will happen i will make the payment to broker then broker will make the payment to exchange exchange will make the payment to broker and then broker will make the payment to what the seller so exchange will directly not make the payment to seller exchange will first make the payment to broker and then broker will make the payment to seller now there will be multiple players who will be liable to deduct tds so who will deduct the responsibility to deduct tds under the responsibility to deduct tds under section 194s of the act shall be on both exchange and the broker so in case the payment is made by exchange to the broker and then broker to the seller then both are responsible as per this circular but the government will give some kind of relaxation don't worry it doesn't make sense to deduct tds twice however if there is a written agreement between the exchange and the broker that the broker shall be deducting tax on such credit or payment then broker alone may deduct the tax under 194 s of the act the exchange would be required to furnish a quarterly statement for all such transactions of the quarter on or before the due date described under uh, in the income tax rules now listen carefully so if there is a written agreement between whom the exchange and the broker then the broker shall be deducting the tds who will be deducting the tds the broker so if there is a written agreement between both of them between the exchange and the broker if there is a written agreement then the primary responsibility is of the broker not of the exchange is it clear so now listen carefully once again what does point number 1 says that point number 1 says that the exchange will deduct tds but if the exchange is making payment to broker and the broker is making payment to seller then point number 2 will attract then the if there is a written agreement between the exchange and the broker then only broker will deduct if there is no written agreement then both have to deduct exchange has to deduct and even broker has to deduct this is what point number 2 has to say just check it once so this is what the first point is all about what is the first point i'll again explain you with the help of an example there is a buyer there is an exchange there is a broker and there is a seller and the vda is owned by a seller not by exchange exchange does not own vda so if you are making the payment to through broker or directly to exchange and if the exchange is making the payment to seller then exchange is liable to deduct tds if the broker itself is the seller then also exchange is liable to deduct the tds but if exchange is making the payment to seller and then seller uh, uh, if exchange is making the payment to broker and if the broker is making the payment to seller then if there is a written agreement between both of them then broker will deduct if there is no written agreement then both will deduct both i hope it is clear to all of you is it crystal clear to all of you it's slightly complicated you have to see this lecture at least twice to understand this complicated concept i don't think so you should be having any problem you will understand in one time but if you see twice you will be able to understand properly okay okay Now let's go on to the second part of question number one. Pay attention, please. The second part of the question number one is what? Let's read that. In case where the transfer of virtual digital asset takes place on or to an exchange, and the VDA being transferred is owned by such exchange. So if the VDA is owned by exchange, then who is responsible for deducting TDS? Pay attention. now there is a buyer over here there is an exchange over here and vda is owned by the exchange there might be a broker over here 
So you can directly buy the BDA through an exchange or you can indirectly buy a VDA through an exchange. Now there are no multiple players. There is only one player that is buyer. Buyer has to deduct TDS or the broker has to deduct TDS. Okay, there are no multiple players now. But the question is very simple. There might be a practical issue over here. And what is that practical issue? What is the practical difficulty? The practical difficulty, just think that you are opening your mobile phone and you are buying a VDA. You are buying a VDA. You are buying a virtue, you are buying Bitcoin. You are opening your mobile phone, you are opening coin DCX and you are buying what? You are buying a virtual digital asset like say Bitcoin. Now the question is, how will I come to know that that virtual digital asset is owned by the exchange? How will I come to know? How will I come to I don't know who is the seller. Na? So I, I will not come to know. So in that case, how will I come to know that I am liable to deduct TDS? So in that case, the government has given a very, very simple solution whereby the government has said that buyer and broker is not required to deduct tax. The exchange itself will pay tax. and will file a statement that it has paid the tax. The moment exchange does that, the buyer and the broker is absolved from paying what? The TDS. Because the practical problem with me and even with the broker, broker will not come to know that the exchange is owning that particular asset. Okay. So, this is the second point which is mentioned over here. Let's read it very carefully. <coughs> In this case, there are no multiple players. The buyer is required to deduct tax under 194S of the Act. However, there may be a practical issue as the buyer may not know whether the VDA being transfer is owned by the exchange or not. I will not come to know whether it is owned by the exchange. If I if I know if I have that knowledge that it is owned by the exchange, I will deduct TDS. Hence, there may be a genuine doubt in the mind of the buyer with regard to its responsibility to deduct TDS under 194S of the Act. This difficulty would also be there if the buyer is buying VDA from an exchange through a broker. Now, to remove this difficulty, it is clarified that while the primary responsibility to deduct tax under the Act in this case remains with the buyer or his broker, as an alternative, listen carefully, as an alternative, the exchange may enter into a written agreement with buyer or his broker that in regard to all such transactions, the exchange would be paying the tax on or before the due date for that quarter. If the exchange itself is paying the tax, you don't have to deduct the TDS. Okay. The exchange would be required to furnish a quarterly statement in Form 29QF for all such transactions of the quarter on or before the due date prescribed in the income tax rules. The exchange would also be required to furnish its income tax return and all these transactions must be included in such return. If these conditions are complied with, the buyer or his broker will not be held as assessor in default under section 201 of the act for these transactions. Okay. So if the asset, virtual digital asset is owned by the exchange, the buyer and the broker can enter into an agreement with an exchange and exchange will be liable to pay the tax and then you will be absolved from paying what tax and you will not be treated as assess in default. Just go through this first question, a great question on virtual digital assets. So first question has two parts. First part is what? Where the asset is owned by some third person, not by exchange. And second part is what? Where the asset is owned by the exchange. So where, where the asset is owned by some third person, then who is liable to deduct TDS? Exchange. Exchange. Exchange will deduct TDS of seller and if the seller itself is the broker, exchange will deduct TDS of the broker. Okay. And the second part over here was what? In this also there were two parts, right? The second part over here was what? The exchange and broker can have a where you are buying through what? Through a broker. Then you will make the payment to exchange, exchange will make the payment to broker, broker will make the payment to seller. There can be a written agreement between the seller, between the exchange and the broker and broker will deduct the TDS. Now, where the VDA is owned itself by the exchange, then you are liable to deduct TDS as a primary responsibility. But if you or broker has a written agreement with the exchange, then exchange will pay the tax and accordingly file a quarterly statement. Okay, just check it once. So now let's move on to the next question and the next question is very, very, very dangerous question. Huh? 
Let me read the next question. It's a small question of three line. Can you see this? Two line, two and a half line. But the discussion is on, in, is on another level. Let's see. What is this question all about? Question number one was with respect to transactions where the consideration for transfer of VDA is not in kind. How will this operate in a situation where it is in kind or in exchange of another VDA? The problem over here is, listen carefully. Now, this is a very dangerous question and the answer is also very dangerous. There is a buyer. There is a seller. Now, if I am buying Bitcoin and paying rupees 1 lakh, then I can deduct 1% TDS. That is rupees 1000. Okay. Under section 194S. What if I am a buyer and here there is a seller and I am buying Bitcoin and in exchange I am giving Ethereum. So here the question is, we both are buyers now. Here the question is, we both are buyers. I am buying what Bitcoin, but this seller is also buying Ethereum. So now the question is, the TDS obligation will come on both now. The TDS obligation will come on me also and on seller also because seller is also a buyer of Ethereum. I will try to understand because I am buying Bitcoin in kind. So he is also buying Ethereum in kind. And we have seen in 194S, if you are buying something in kind, you cannot deduct TDS. You have to ensure that the other person has paid the tax. Now, both of them have to ensure. I have to ensure that he has paid the tax. He has to ensure that I have paid the tax. Now, what to do in such case? Okay. It's a difficult task to answer. Difficult question to answer. So, let's answer this question very wisely, very, very patiently. Now, there are a lot of things in this. Huh? Be very patient enough to understand this. As per the proviso to 194S of the Act, there could be a situation where the consideration is in kind. Or in exchange of another virtual digital asset or partly in kind and cash is not sufficient to meet the DDS liability. In these situations, what happens? The payer, the buyer has to ensure that the other person has paid the tax. The person responsible for paying such consideration is required to ensure that the tax required to be deducted has been paid in respect of such consideration before releasing the consideration. So, I have to ensure that the other person has paid the tax. The other person has to ensure that I have paid the tax. In the above situation, the buyer will release the consideration in kind after the seller provides proof of payment of tax. Example, Chalan details. In such a situation where VDA A, that is virtual digital asset A, is being exchanged with another VDA B, both the persons are buyer as well as seller. Yes, I am also buyer, he is also buyer. I am also seller, he is also seller. One is buyer for A and seller for B. And another is buyer for B and seller for A. Thus, both need to pay tax with respect to transfer of VDA and show evidence to other so that VDA can be exchanged. We both are liable to deduct TDS. This would then be required to be reported in TDS statement along with Chalan number. This year, Form 26Q has been included in provision for reporting such transaction and for specified person. Who is specified person? I have told you. Individual HUF whose last year's turnover is less than 1 crore or less than 50 lakhs as the case may be is a specified person. Okay. So, I hope you understood the first part of this particular discussion. That if I am buying Bitcoin and if I am buying Bitcoin by giving Ethereum, then I am also buyer, the seller is also buyer. I am also seller, the buyer is also seller. We both have to deduct TDS. We both have to ensure that the other person has paid the tax. We cannot deduct TDS in case of kind. I have to ensure that the other person has paid the tax. I have to take Chalan from him and he has to take Chalan from me. Is it clear to everyone? So, there is no issue till here. The issue will come here. Where the issue will come, you know? The issue will come here where I am buying. Here there is a seller. And here there is an exchange. We are not directly buying and selling. 
and I am buying Bitcoin by not paying money but by paying Ethereum. And he is taking what? Ethereum by giving what? Bitcoin. So in this case, if we are buying, if we are, listen carefully, if we are buying in kind through an exchange, through an exchange, then who will deduct TDS? What has to be done in that case? Who will deduct TDS? Pay absolute attention now. However, listen carefully now. If we buy directly, I am by your seller, you are giving me Ethereum, you are giving me Bitcoin, I am giving you Ethereum. I will make sure that you have paid the tax, you will make sure that I have paid the tax. And then we will exchange the cryptocurrencies. But if I am buying through an exchange, you are also selling through an exchange, then what will be done? However, if the transaction is through an exchange, there is a practical issue in implementing this provision. In order to address this practical issue and to remove difficulty, it is clarified that in such a situation, as an alternative, tax may be deducted by exchange. So in, in case we are buying in kind through an exchange, the tax will be deducted by the exchange. Such an alternative mechanism can be exercised by the exchange based on a written contractual agreement with the buyer and the seller. Therefore, now, the exchange, the exchange will have a contract with the buyer, will have a contract with the seller and exchange will deduct TDS. Exchange will deduct TDS on Bitcoin. Exchange will deduct TDS on what? Ethereum. Be very careful. Here there is a buyer. Here there is a seller. And here there is an exchange. We will take an example which is given in your circular. Okay. Now how this will be working? If such an alternative mechanism is exercised, the exchange would be required to deduct tax for both legs of the transaction. The exchange has to deduct tax on both the cases. Because both of them are buyer now. So both the cases he has to deduct tax. And pay to the government. In Form 26Q, it will for this reason, explained below, need to report it as tax deducted on both legs of the transaction. The buyer and the seller would not be independently required to follow the procedure prescribed in 194S. Then the buyer and the seller is what? Absolved from their liability. Now, how this will be done? How this will be done? That is also explained in great detail over here with the help of an example. I am explaining you with the help of example. When the exchange of for deduction of tax, under 194S of the Act, on such transaction, there is a possibility that the tax amount deducted is also in kind and needs to be converted in cash before it can be deposited with the government. How, sir? Listen carefully. Let me explain you. Pay attention, please. Suppose there are two cryptocurrencies. One is Monero. So I am buying Monero. And in exchange of Monero, I am giving what? Deso. These are cryptocurrencies. So he is selling Monero. And he is buying what? Deso. So listen carefully now. Listen carefully. Please pay absolute attention. How many Desos you are giving? I am giving 100 Desos. And in exchange of that, I am getting 50 Moneros. I am giving 100 Desos. In exchange of that, I am getting 50 mon Moneros. Okay. So, I am what? Buying Monero. And I am giving Deso. And I am buying Deso. And I am giving Monero. Now, exchange has to do what? Exchange has to deduct 1% tax. Listen how, when exchange will give Monero to buyer, exchange will deduct, will deduct 1% of this Monero. 
एन एक्सचेंज विल डिडक्ट जीरो पॉइंट फाइव लिसन केयरफुली जीरो पॉइंट फाइव मोनेरो एंड विल गिव हाउ मच विल गिव फोर्टी नाइन पॉइंट फाइव मोनेरो टू द बायर एंड एज अगेंस्ट दर the exchange will deduct again 1% deso that is 1% is how much that is 1 deso and will give how many desos will give 99 deso to home to the seller now what exchange has listen carefully it's a complicated thing it's not that easy to explain for me also now what exchange has deducted exchange has deducted 0.5 monero and 1 deso obviously exchange has to pay this to the government of india because he has deducted the tax in kind now when he will go to pay this to the government of india when exchange will go this to pay to the will government of india accept monero and deso they want rupees he has to convert that into rupees so this is the challenge that he has to face now let's see this is what it is explained so beautifully in this circular at the time of transaction the exchange will deduct tds in pair being traded for example in case of trade for monero to deso 1% of monero and 1% of deso will be deducted as tax under 194s by the exchange and balance shall be transferred to the customer so out of 50 we are deducting 0.5 and giving 49.5 and out of 100 the exchange is deducting 1 and giving 99 to the customer The trail of the transaction evidencing deduction of one percent of consideration for every VDA to VDA trade shall be maintained by the exchange. Exchange has to maintain all those details. Now, exchange shall immediately execute a market order. Now, what exchange will do? This Monero and Deso are hopeless currencies. Exchange will do what you know? Will immediately, immediately sell zero point five Monero. And one deso, and convert that, convert that into a primary virtual digital asset, which is a primary virtual digital asset like Bitcoin. It will immediately convert that into a primary virtual digital asset immediately. Ha! Huh. If this exchange which we are doing is not Monero and Deso. it is bitcoin on ethereum then it does not want to change a uh, convert that because the the, uh, the the bitcoin itself is a primary virtual digital asset but if the cryptocurrency which we are exchanging is not a primary the what he has deducted he has deducted 0.5 monero and one deso these are hopeless currencies immediately convert that into what primary virtual digital asset this is what it is written over here check The exchange shall immediately execute a market order for converting this tax deducted in kind, one percent Monero, one percent Deso, to one of the primary VDA like Bitcoin, Ethereum, USDT, USDC. These are primary. These are very famous cryptocurrencies, which can be easily converted into INR. Now, this step shall ensure that the tax deducted under 194S of the Act, in the form of non-primary VDA like Deso Monero. Is converted into an equivalent of primary VDA, which have a ready market in India, ready INR market. Because in India, what happens? Deso, Monero, all these hopeless currency does not have a direct conversion to INR. You cannot directly convert into INR. So convert immediate, immediately sell these hopeless currencies into what? Into a primary VDA. Time stamps of the timing orders to be maintained to ensure such conversion of VDA withheld to be done immediately by the exchange. If the taxes are withheld in primary VDA, this step should be ignored. This is a very important line. If the taxes are withheld in primary VDA, it means if you are giving Bitcoin and taking Ethereum, then you will deduct Bitcoin and Ethereum. In that case, you don't have to convert because your taxes are withheld in the primary VDA, so you don't have to exchange. You don't have to exchange that into INR. Okay. So you, the exchange has to do this for the entire day. Now, what does exchange has? Tell me, what does exchange has now? Now, exchange has what? Bitcoin in exchange of Monero and Deso. Now, what will exchange do after this? So now, the exchange has what? Exchange has the Bitcoin now. Now, what will they do with the Bitcoin? Obviously, they cannot give Bitcoin to the government now. 
So first of all, you have to convert your non-primary VDA into a primary VDA Bitcoin. Now, what has to be done after that? Let's see. Let's see. All the tax deducted under section 194S of the Act in the form of primary VDAs. Now, what is the primary VDA? We have Bitcoin. Or converted into primary VDA under step 2 will be accumulated for the day. So, the exchange has to accumulate all the taxes for the day. All the taxes for the day. The time limit will be from 00, zero that is from midnight 12 o'clock to 11.59 in the night. The VDA accumulation by the exchange shall be verifiable from the trail of the orders of VDA to VDA orders executed during the day. Now, the accumulated balance of the VDA at 12 hours will be converted into INR based on the market rate existing at that time. Now, at the time, after the entire day is completed, after the entire day is completed, the accumulated, the accumulated primary VDA, in our case, it is Bitcoin, will be converted at 0, 0, 0, 0 into what? INR. As per what rate? As per the rate prevailing at night. Because you might be knowing that the cryptocurrency market is available 24-7. It is not like stock market which gets closed at 3.30 in the evening. And which is closed on Saturdays and then which is closed on certain public holidays as well. Crypto market is available 24-7. So, there is no issue of conversion at any moment. So, let's, let me explain you the entire scenario how it will go. Please pay attention. The buyer is buying Monero and giving Deso. The seller is giving Monero, taking Deso. It is the duty of the exchange to deduct TDS. Now the exchange will deduct TDS in what? In kind. It will deduct 1% of 50 Monero which will come to 0 0.5 Monero. It will also deduct 1% of 100 deso which will come to what? 1 deso. Now the buy, now the exchange has what? Exchange at 0 0.5 Monero and 1 deso. Immediately, the moment they will deduct this, immediately they will convert this into what? Primary VDA. Now, once primary VDA is converted, say Bitcoin or Ethereum, at the midnight, at 12 o'clock in the night, whatever they have deducted in the entire day, they will accumulate that and they will convert that into INR in the midnight. This is how the procedure will be going on. Let's see. In order to bring consistency and to avoid discretion, the exchanges are required to place market order at 12 hours for the tax withheld or converted under step 2 in the form of primary video for conversion into IR. This sell market order shall be executed based on the open buy orders in the market. Price and the quantity data for every match trade shall be maintained by the exchange and shall be available for verification. It shall be verifiable from the system coding that conversion into INR happened at the first available buy order based on the prevailing buy order book of the respective exchange and at the time of conversion. As a practice, the respective exchange liquidating the VDA shall be prohibited to buy to be a buyer for these VDAs. The customers will be issued a contract note, office, obviously. The respective customers will be given the contract note for the respective crypto which they have bought or over email which will include the amount of tax withheld in kind and the amount of INR realized from such tax withheld. The tax withheld in kind and converted into INR by following the above procedure shall be deposited in government account as per the time limit that is by 7th of the following month and so on and so forth. Now this is one last clarification. One last clarification is also very important. Your mind and my mind will not work only but department is very proactive. It is clarified that there would not be any further TDS for converting the tax withheld in kind in the form of VDA into INR or from one VDA to another and then into INR. Otherwise, you will say that you are converting a VDA into an INR. You are converting Bitcoin into INR. So, for that conversion also, you should deduct TDS. So, the government has clarified that on that conversion, there is no need to deduct any TDS. Otherwise, there can be a TDS implication on that conversion also. So, on that conversion, there is no need to deduct any area. So, this is what this entire procedure is all about. So, how it will be deducted? The exchange is responsible for deducting in kind. Once they deduct, immediately, suppose I deduct, I am giving you 
50 Monero. I will deduct 1% right now and I will convert into primary VDA. And then at the night, at 12 o'clock, I will convert that into INR and I will pay to the government of India. So this is how it will run. And this is what this question number 2, the great question is all about. Just go through it and then we will move on to the next questions. And the next questions are very easy to understand. So question number 3 is again another clarification. What does it say? Suppose if I am a buyer and you are a seller. And if I am buying a VDA. The question over here is listen carefully. Such kind of great provisions have been made by the government of India. There is a buyer over here. There is a seller over here. And the buyer is buying a VDA. The question is. The buyer is liable to deduct TDS under 194S. Right? The question is, is VDA goods or not? Goods or not? If VDA is a good, then the provision of 194Q can also get attracted. Do you remember if your last year turnover is more than 10 crore and if you purchase more than 50 lakhs of goods, then you are liable to deduct TDS at the rate of 0.1% in excess of 50 lakhs when you buy some goods from someone. So the question over here is, is VDA goods or not? So the government has clarified that. The government is saying that right now we are not interested in identifying whether it is goods or not. But the government is saying that once the TDS is deducted under 194S, tax would not be required to be deducted under 194Q. There is no need to deduct any tax under 194Q. Once the TDS is deducted under 194S, without going into the merit whether VDA is a good or not, we are not getting into that discussion. The government is saying we are not interested in the discussion only whether VDA is a goods or whether VDA is not a goods. We are not interested in that. Irrespective of that, we are not interested in whether VDA is a goods or not. Once you have deducted the TDS under 194S, you are not supposed to deduct TDS under 194Q. For the story is very simple. 194S will prevail over 194Q. That's it. There is no need to further make any kind of argument on that. Just check it once. Okay. Question number 4. As I have said you only question number 1 and 2 is very important. Question number 2, 3, 4, 3, 4, 5, 6 very simple. Next question. Whether the consideration for transfer of VDA shall be on gross basis after including GST or commission or it shall be on net basis after exclusion of these items. So the government has said that it should be on net basis after excluding GST or charges levied by deductor for rendering services. So you have to deduct TDS on net amount and not on what? Not on the gross amount. Okay. You have to exclude GST, you have to exclude the commission etc. And you have to deduct TDS on the net amount, not on the gross amount. Just check it once. Okay. Okay, question number 5 is something which we have done earlier long back in TDS also. So, this is a similar clarification. Let me uh, give you an example for the same. Suppose I am a buyer, Mr. A is a buyer. Okay, and there is a seller, Mr. X. And I am making the payment. Okay, I am making the payment to Mr. X's seller. Through what? Through razor pay. And what is razor pay? Razor pay is a payment gateway. Okay. So what happens? In practical life, I will make the payment to razor pay and razor pay will make the payment to Mr. X. So now the question is, is razor pay liable to deduct TDS? Is the payment gateway also liable to deduct TDS? The government has given a clarification. If the buyer has deducted the TDS, then there is no need for the Payment gateway to deduct TDS once again. So the obligation is on the buyer. Once the buyer has deducted the TDS, razor pay need not have to deduct TDS once again. Okay. Check it once. In the transactions where the payment is being carried out through payment gateways, there may be deduction twice to illustrate that a person XYZ is a buyer. XYZ is Mr. A. Is required to make payment to the seller for transfer of VDA. Okay. He makes payment of 1 lakh rupees through digital platform of ABC. <coughs> now, ABC is razor pay. On these facts, liability to deduct tax 
under 194s of the act may fall on both xyz who is the buyer and abc who is the payment gateway is tax required to be deducted by both so the department has said that answer is no it is provided that in the above example the payment gateway will not be the payment gateway razor pay is not liable to deduct tds will not be required to deduct tax under 194s of the act on a transaction if the tax has been deducted by the person xyz if the buyer has deducted the tax payment gateway is not required to deduct tax okay is not required to uh, is required to make deduction under 194 hence in the above example if the buyer has deducted tds under 194s on 1 lakh rupees abc will not be required to deduct tds under 194s of the act on the same transaction to facilitate proper implementation abc abc who is abc abc is the razor pay is the payment gateway may take an undertaking from the xyz regarding tax deduction so razor pay will take an undertaking from mr a that you have deducted the tds please give me an undertaking so that i am not liable to deduct tds what if the buyer does not deduct if the buyer does not deduct then razor pay is liable to deduct the tds okay the indirect in interpretation of that provision is this only okay now <coughs> You remember there is a threshold of 50000 rupees and there is a threshold of 10000 rupees in some cases you remember that in 194s uh, how to apply that threshold because the section is not applicable from 1st april it is applicable from 1st july now listen carefully because the section is applicable from 1st july listen carefully pay attention please first July 2022, the section is applicable from this date. So till 30th June 2022, the section was not applicable. Okay. So from 1st April 2022 till 30th June, if you have made any payment, then no tedious. Then no tedious. No tedious. But to identify whether it crosses 50,000 or whether it crosses 10,000, you have to consider the payments which are made before 30th June also. For example, if you have made a payment of, there is a buyer Mr. A, who has made a payment of 30,000 rupees, no tedious. Now the buyer has made a payment of another 30,000. Now the question is to identify whether 50,000 crosses or not. You have to take both. And then once both are considered, you have to deduct TDS only in excess of 50,000 rupees. So you will deduct TDS on how much? On 10,000 rupees. Okay. So to identify whether 50,000 crosses or not or 10,000 crosses or not, you are supposed to consider this threshold also. This is what the last question is all about. Section 194S came into force from 1st July 2022. The liability to deduct tax under 194S of the Act applies only when the value or aggregate of the value of consideration for the transfer of VD exceeds 50,000 during the financial year. In case of consideration paid by specified person and 10,000 rupees. In other cases, it is not clear how this limit of 50,000 or 10,000 is to be computed. So, since the threshold of 50,000 is with respect to a financial year, the threshold is with respect to a financial year calculation of consideration for transfer of VDA triggering deduction under 194S of the Act shall be counted from 1st April. Hence, if the value of the aggregate of the value of the consideration for transfer of VDA payable by a person exceeds 50,000 or 10,000 during the financial year, including the period up to 30th June, the provision of 194S of the Act apply. On any sum representing consideration for transfer of VDA credit or paid on or after 1st July 2022. Since the provision of 194S of the Act applies at the time of credit or payment, whichever is earlier, representing consideration for transfer of VDA, such sum which has been credited or paid before 1st July would not be subject to TDS. So, if the credit or payment, either of the activity is happening before July, then TDS will not be applicable. So, let me give you an example now over here. Suppose in our case the threshold is 50,000. Okay, we have to consider one of the threshold here. Suppose the threshold in our case is 50,000. Okay. Now this is till 30th June 2022. And from 
फर्स्ट जुलाई टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी टू ओके केस वन सपोज यू पेड फोर्टी थाउजेंड नोट इडियस अब यू पेड अनदर फाइव थाउजेंड नोट इडियस बिकॉज द थ्रेस होल्ड डज नॉट एक्सीड फिफ्टी थाउजेंड ओके सेकेंड केस सपोज यू पेड सेवेंटी थाउजेंड नोट इडियस Now suppose you paid ten thousand. So to compute the threshold, you have to count both. But the TDS of one person will be only on the payment which is made after July. That is TDS on only ten thousand. On this amount, TDS cannot be charged. But to compute threshold, you have to consider both. Third, suppose you paid forty-five thousand, and then you paid what twenty-five thousand. So now, to compute the threshold, you will consider both. But the TDS at the rate of one percent, okay, will be only on twenty thousand rupees. Okay, I hope it is clear to all of you. You can take a photograph of this, and this completes this very important topic, which is there for your exam. Very, very, very important topic. Take a photograph of this, and then we'll end the lecture here. Okay. So now let's go ahead with the next topic which is going to be a very important topic for your exam one of the most important topic for your exams it is going to be why because if you see that topic the next topic that is this one pay attention on the board please this topic chapter number 29 beta i want your videos to be on throughout now please please the request Chapter number twenty-nine. It is a absolutely new section inserted by what Finance Act two thousand twenty-two. The government is saying is to give benefit to the SSC, but indirectly it is to trouble us. Okay, now let me tell you how. What is the last date by which, for example, this is previous year? Twenty to twenty-three. Okay. Now, please tell me what is the last date by which a person can file the return? Last date, last, last, maximum last date. Thirty-first December two thousand twenty-three. Is it clear? Which is under one thirty-nine four? Right or not, beta? Now the government is saying that you continue filing return under one thirty-nine one. You continue filing return under one thirty nine three. You continue filing return under one thirty nine four. You continue filing return under one thirty nine five. You can do all those things, okay? Whatever you are done. But later on, later on, if you feel that, if you feel that you have done a wrong computation of tax, you have done what? Or you have evaded some income, so you can come to us to what? Update the what? Return. But the government says that you should come to us to update the return only to pay tax. Don't come to us to update the return for refund of tax. Are are you able to understand? I am just giving you a gist. Ah, it is not as straightforward as this. we will not be able to complete also this topic today we have to continue carry forward for tomorrow it's a very dangerous topic very dangerous and practical life i will tell you that they have not updated the portal only on 31st july when i was filing the return for one of the client as an updated return so i made a request in winman i hope you know what is winman okay That's the software. So Winman gave a reply. Winman people give reply very fast. If you have any query, so they gave a reply. They have not updated the portal. What can we do? So in practical life, there is an issue over here with respect to this particular provision. Okay. Now I don't know today what is happening on the date of taking the lecture. Whether they have updated or not. I hope they have. So you can update the return up to when you know. Pay attention, please. Up to when. Up to twenty-four months from the end of relevant AY. So, what is the relevant AY? So, what is the last date? 
अरे इज इट क्लियर बट इज द गवर्नमेंट अलाउिंग गोइंग टू अलाउ यू सच अ लिबर्टी विदाउट कॉस्ट आर दे गोइंग टू अलाउ यू दिस विदाउट कॉस्ट देर इज अज अमाउंट ऑफ कॉस्ट इन्वॉल्व इन इट ओके तो वॉट इज दूज अमाउंट ऑफ कॉस्ट लिसन केयरफुली डोंट बी इन अरी बेटा डोंट री डू नॉट अंडरस्टैंड एनी थिंग हैव पेशेंस द वेरी डिफरेंट काइंड ऑफ सेक्शन इट्स न्यू फॉर मी ऑल्सो इट्स न्यू फॉर यू ऑल्सो इट्स न्यू फॉर द एंटायर इंडस्ट्री इट्स न्यू फॉर डिपार्टमेंट ऑल्सो वी हैव नेवर एवर एनकाउंटर्ड सच काइंड ऑफ प्रोविजन इन द अर्लियर पार्ट ऑफ द इनकम टैक्स लॉ सो वी हैव टू बी वेरी पेशेंट इन so let's see the provision and let's read and interpret let's not be in a hurry pay attention please on the board all of you chapter number 29 there are questions also on this will which will be solving after we are done with the chapter okay there are practical questions i have put uh, any person may furnish an updated return of his income or income of any other person in respect of which he is assessable under the act For the previous year, relevant to such assessment year, the provision below, given below, pertaining to updated return, are applicable from 1st April 2022. Updated return under section underline 139A. This is the return section. This is the section number of the return. Okay. When you file the return, you select na under which section you want to file. 139, 1, 4, 5. This is 8A. Okay. can be submitted at any time within how many months within 24 months from the end of the relevant ay is it clear so let's underline this time limit now at any time within 24 months from the end of relevant ay for instance updated return for ay 22 23 can be submitted on or before what on or before what 31st March 2025. Is it clear? Are you tell me one line by line? Is it clear or not? Okay. Now, is is this much clear to all of you? Till here, I have to go paragraph by paragraph. I am striking off this paragraph. This is clear to everyone. Okay, I am going ahead. You have to be very patient now. Vinita, you have some doubt? बेटा वो तेवीस चौबीस के लिए था कार्टून वो ट्वेंटी थ्री ट्वेंटी फोर के लिए था ना हाँ तो असेसमेंट यदि तो लिखा है इधर मेरी माँ चेक करना क्या लिखा है असेसमेंट यदि लिखा है ना और क्या क्लियर चलो ठीक है लाइक गोहेड बेटा चलो लेट्स गो हेड हु कैन सबमिट फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल वी नीड टू आइडेंटिफाई ना हु कैन सबमिट द रिटर्न इज एवरी एस एस सी कवर्ड और नॉट लेट सी अपडेटेड रिटर्न कैन बी सबमिटेड बाई एनी पर्सन वेदर और नॉट अंडरलाइन वेदर और नॉट यस पर निशर रिटर्न अंडर वन थर्टी वन वन थर्टी फोर वन थर्टी फाइव फॉर एन ए वाई यू आर इन आफ्टर एफर्ट टू एज रेलिवेंट एवाई लिसन केयरफुल लिसन 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 Suppose if we have filed the return under one thirty nine one earlier, okay. Now you want to update the return. You can do so. Or one thirty nine four you have filed, or one thirty nine five you have revised. You want to update the return, you can update. Okay. Or if you have not filed the return only earlier, you forgot to file the return. Okay. And now you want to directly file updated return. Okay. You can do that also. Is it clear? so updated return is not necessary that you should have filed the return earlier even if you have not filed the return earlier you can directly file what tell me within 24 months from the end of relevant day at a cost the cost is very high the cost is very high you will come to know the cost after some time other points let's see step by step the following point should be noted If a person has sustained loss for any previous year, and he has already submitted return of loss for that year within the due date, as given in one thirty nine one, 
he can furnish an updated return for that year under 139.18. Where such return is a return of income. Now, please read this once more. And let's try to understand what is the meaning of this particular point. Okay. <coughs> Write down in the bracket. Note 1. Okay. Suppose previous year 22-23, Mr. A has a PGPP loss of 10 lakh rupees. Okay. Now he what? Filed ROI on what? Tell me. Time. Now, therefore, can he carry forward this loss? Right? Now, there are three options I am creating. Now, if he feels that his loss is increased, his loss will what? Increase. Loss will what? Increase. Second possibility. Loss will increase to how much? Say I will take a number. Loss will increase to 18 lakhs. Okay. Second possibility. Loss will decrease to say 6 lakhs loss. Okay. There is a possibility now if he files an updated return. Shall I go ahead? Third case. The loss will convert to what? Convert to rupees 10 lakh or rupees 15 lakhs what? Income. Okay. So now what the provision says, you know? He cannot file updated return. He cannot file updated return. Yes. He can file updated return in that case. This is what this line means. Read once again. If there is a loss... You can file updated return if that is converted to income. Check. Otherwise not. Can you see that? Are yes or no? Now, I would like to ask you a question. Why a person will come? Will anybody come? Yes, come beta. People will come because they will have a fear in their mind. Na? What if we get caught? If we get caught, then there is a larger cost as compared to the cost which you are going to pay in this section. The cost in this section is, is slightly slower, is slightly lower as compared to the cost you are going to pay if the government catches you. They will directly take 200% penalty now for misreporting of income. Say yes or no? So you yourself declare it here. Pay the extra cost, live in peace. Yes or no? You can just copy this beta. You can write over here, note one, give the reference in your textbook, please. You can take a photograph of this, please. You copy this later on. But give a reference over there. Is it clear? Let's go ahead now. You have to be very patient enough. Other points, point number two I am reading. If as a result of, please see your, please start your video, please beta, please request. If as a result of submitting the updated return under 139.88, the quantum of carry forward of loss 
or unabsorbed depreciation or MAT or AMT credit is to be reduced for any subsequent year. Then an updated return shall be furnished for each of the subsequent year. Please check the provision carefully. Then I will speak about it. Now please tell me. We are filing updated return for which year? 22-23? There was a loss of 10 lakh rupees, right? We converted that to income of 15 lakhs, right? Now, is there a possibility or not that that loss is getting carried forward to next year and we have set off that loss for the next year, yes or no, before filing the updated return? Just think. I am extending this example. Okay. Just see here. Are see here. Updated return filed on 15th of March 2026. Is it fine? Is it on time? Now, before that, Previous year 23-24 ITR you have filed or not? Under the normal provisions of 139-1. You would have set off this loss, na? You would have set off this loss or not of 10 lakh rupees? Because that activity has happened before filing the updated return. So now later on if you decide to file an updated return. Right? For this year, see here. Later on, if you decide to file updated return for this year, are you not supposed to file updated return for this year also? This is what point number two has to say. Check, please. You can take this revised photograph if you want. Because if you are filing an updated return for one year, and your loss is changing, it, there is the possibility that you have set off that loss in second year. So, you have to update the return of 23-24 also. Right, beta? Is everyone clear? So they have brought this provision to help us or to trouble us? Such kind of things they have done in last 5-6 years. I am very irritated with the subject. Practically, academically, it's okay. They will ask you simple questions only. But get into the practical life. Get into the grounds. Then you will understand the reality. Okay. So, the two points. Is it clear? If there is a loss in your original return, can you file an updated return? Yes, if there is an income. And if you do so, if there is a change in the losses of subsequent years, you have to file updated return for subsequent years also. Right? Now, let us go ahead and see who cannot submit updated return. Shall we read? Exclusion list. Whomsoever is not allowed to file what? An updated return. Let us see. When updated return cannot be submitted? It cannot be submitted in the following cases. If the updated return is what? Tell me. Not allowed. Okay. Because they want income, they want tax. This section is not for your benefits. Okay. In the updated return, we want income. We don't want loss. Is it clear? Second, forget about income. Forget about loss. If the updated return has the effect of what? Underline. Decreasing the total tax liability. Determined on the basis of the return furnished under 139.1 or 139.4 or 139.5 or results in what? Tell me. 
refund or increases the refund due to on the basis of re return furnished under 139.145 of such person for the relevant AY. We will not allow you to file what? Updated return. Say in original return your income was 10 lakh. In updated return your income is 6 lakhs. This is 3 year. <coughs> in original return it was how much? 10 lakh. In updated return 6, 6 lakhs. Is it a loss? No. There is no loss now. But if there is a reduction of income. So that could lead to refund now. We will not allow you that also. So what are they allowing? They, allow, they are allowing only if your income is increasing. Are you clear? Otherwise they are not allowing only. They want money. Money. They want money. Paisa chahiye. Theek hai? Loss case not allowed. Reduction of income case not allowed. Refund case not allowed. Payable case, yes, come. File the return at extra cost till 2026. Okay. And we will not ask any kind of penalty from you. Okay. Is it clear? Yes, please. क्या करेंगे मेरे को समझ नहीं आया बेटा इनकम व्हाट इज इनकम व्हाट इज इनकम इनकम इज आफ्टर डिडक्शन मैडम दैट यू आर शोइंग टेलिंग टॉकिंग अबाउट रेवेन्यू रेवेन्यू इज ऑफ नो यूज अंडर इनकम टैक्स लॉ व्हाट इज इनकम इनकम इज आफ्टर डिडक्शन ना बेटा after deduction, your income should increase. Before deduction, what? Revenue is of no use under income tax law, Bhavisha. Okay. So, be patient enough with this section. You have to be very patient. It took a lot of time for us to understand this, the objective of this section. See here, please. Please, beta. First case, who cannot submit? Loss. Second case, whose liability is going to decrease, okay, right, or their refund will increase, don't come. Third case, third case has lot of points, has lot of points, okay, all kind of different kind of thieves are covered in this, different kind of chores are covered in this, okay. So, Chodo ke liye section nahi hai. Let's see who are the chores, who are the thieves. Point number three. Shall we read? A person shall not be eligible to furnish an updated return. Okay. If underlined search has been initiated under 132. So, if a search is initiated, you are not eligible for updated return. Okay. Second, if a survey is conducted, what? You are not eligible for what? Updated return. But in the bracket, it is written other than subsection 2A. This is with survey. Let me tell you, this is tedious or TCS survey. Do you remember that? So, in this case, can you find updated return? Yes. Because it is other than this, na? Yes, beta? So, search not allowed. Survey not allowed. TDS, TCS allowed. Point number 3 and 4 is about that only search and see, sir. You can check. Not allowed, not allowed. <laughs> There is some money found, bullion found, jewelry found, etc. in your place. Okay. Okay.
So till now, who have been excluded? The list is long. Loss. Reduction of income liability. Search and seizure cases, survey cases. Okay? The list is long. You can turn to the next page. Still the list is long. Okay? Shall I read? No updated return shall be furnished by any person for the relevant day by where? Where? Point number one. All these cases also you cannot file updated return. Okay. First. Where an updated return underline has been furnished. If you have filed updated return once, you cannot file it again. Are, are you understanding? You cannot say that. Are, I, I am filing updated return now. Achha, achha. Once you have filed, now you want to again change. You cannot do that. Once you have filed, that's it. Is it clear? So, otherwise you will file. You, otherwise you have a very big time not to file. Two years. You will file multiple times in that year. For the same year. Yes or no? Not allowed. Only once. Clear, beta? Sure, na? Step by step, beta. Second point. Where any proceeding for assessment, reassessment, recomputation or revision underline is pending or has been completed, put it in box. So, if there is any assessment proceeding which is pending, okay, or reassessment or revisionary proceeding which is pending, okay, you cannot file or which is completed. You cannot file updated data. So, 143.3 is already opened. 143.3 is what? Now, you cannot go. Or it is completed. You cannot go. Because in that case, you should have told to assessing officer during assessment only, na? Sir, I have hidden this much income. Yes or no? So, once the assessment is completed or it is pending, you cannot go. If it is pending, tell you. Why you want to file updated data? Yes or no? So, if the assessment is pending as well as it is, you will not be allowed to file updated data. Or even if the revisionary proceeding is pending or, or, or it is, what? Completed. You will not be allowed to file updated data. Shall I go ahead? Third point, big time chores, big time thieves, not small thieves, big time, angres, angres types, Britishers type thieves will come in point number 3. Sina, these are not small thieves. These are the people who are got convicted under different dangerous laws. Check. The AO has information in respect of such person for the relevant AY in his possession. Under what? Prevention of Money Laundering Act. Okay. Sir, AO has information that you have hide some income under which law? Prevention of Money Laundering or Black Money Act. Or prohibition of Benami Transaction Property Act, Smugglers and Foreign Exchange Manipulation for Feature of Property Act, and the same has been communicated to the SSE prior to the date of filing of return under 139.88. So before the SSE files, these departments have communicated with you that you a proceeding is going on against you under these laws. Are, are you able to understand? You cannot file updated data. We don't trust such people. Nay, AO has information that you have done something wrong under these laws. You are not convicted so far. You are not con convicted means it is final. You, a, pro a show cause notice might have been issued against you under this law. Or a raid might have been con conducted against you under this law. 
say ed has conducted a raid under pmla prevention of money laundering so you might be under jail your proceeding might be going you are not convicted so far but you have been communicated about that that you are getting trapped under this law then you cannot file updated return okay Half for that financial year. Yes. No, 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 no. Is it clear? Point number four. Where information for the relevant assessment has been received under what DTWA agreement? Check. We have got information from outside India. What information we have got from outside India regarding you? Regarding some escapement of income from foreign authorities. Yes or no? You get information na, from outside India or not? I have told you about this in, in 147 also, if you remember. In 147 also, the AO can conduct 147 based on information from foreign authorities. Okay. And last but not least. Not last, second last in fact. The last one is general point which the CBDT may notify. Which they have not notified so far. Second last. There is a prosecution proceeding already pending. There is what? Prosecution proceeding pending under this act. Under the income tax act. You cannot file updated data. Moral of the story, it is for Sida Sada people. Okay. Who are simple people who have not done anything great in their life with respect to these provisions. So there is already a prosecution proceeding initiated for the relevant table. And this has been prior to the date of his filing of return under 139A. You cannot file 139A if your prosecution is going on. Last point, a general point, CBDT may notify, they have not notified anything, luckily so far. Okay. So, it is a long list, who cannot go for updated return. Okay. Let us come to the previous page once again. Who cannot go for updated return? This entire one and a half page is about that only, na, but ultimately. In different bits and pieces. First, if there is a loss return. Right? Second, if there is a reduction of tax liability, you cannot go. Third is what? Search. Survey. Survey, but in case of TDS survey, it has happened, you can go. Okay? Then comes. If there is an assessment or revision proceeding pending or completed, you cannot go. If you are given notice under different laws like PMLA, like Benami Transaction Property Act, like Black Money Law, etc., Bluggers Act, etc., you cannot file updated return. If your information is obtained under DTAA, you cannot obtain, you cannot go. Or a prosecution proceeding is initiated against you under the income tax law. You cannot file updated return. Is it clear? Anything you would like to ask over here, please ask. No, 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 not necessary. You don't have to remember all these laws. No. Okay? Don't remember all this. Not possible. Not required also. Is it clear? Now, suppose I am not falling in all these cases. Vinita, start your video. Suppose I am not falling in these cases. Then can I file updated return? The answer is yes. So, previous year, see on the board. 21-22. Just a second. So, previous year 21-22, I can file the updated return till which date, last date?
31st March 2025. Okay, right? Now, I am not falling in any of the category. Nor my return is a loss return, nor there is a deduction of tax liability, nor I am doing any search, nor there is any survey in my case, nor there is any uh, pendency of any proceedings under the income tax law, nor prosecution proceedings are pending, nor there is any, uh, I, am, I, am, I have received any notice under different laws, nor there is any DTAA information which is received by the AO. Is it clear? I am a very normal SSE. Okay. So, can I file an updated return? The answer is yes. But now, as I have told you, at a cost. What is the cost? What is the cost? Let's see. The updated return to be accompanied by proof of payment of tax. And what? And what? The updated return. From here, the real journey will start up. What blunder they have done over here? The updated return can be accompanied by proof of payment of what? Tax. Tell me common sense. If you file an updated return, listen carefully. Please see here with all of you. If you are filing an updated return, your liability is going to reduce or increase? Because if it is reducing, they are not allowing only. They are allowing only in case of increase. So, if your liability is going to increase, listen carefully and tell me, are you supposed to pay tax or not? Interest or not? Yes or no? And 234 FT or not? If you have not filed the return earlier on time, yes or no? That to anyways you have to pay. pay. Anyways you have to pay that. There is no excuse in that. But apart from that, you have to pay some additional tax. That cost is separate. That's the reason you have to read the first line very carefully. Updated return to be accompanied by what? Proof of? And circle additional income tax. Sir, what is the additional income tax? We will see that about that later on. Okay. By virtue of explanation 3 CA to 139.9, an updated return cannot be submitted unless it is accompanied by the proof of payment of tax as required by 140B. Chalo, theek hai. Now, listen carefully. Just be very patient now. Very patient. It will take time for us to understand our please from here onwards. Till here everything was very easy. It was very manageable beta. Till here. But from here onwards it is not that easy. They have made it very complicated. Have patience. Sir. How much, uh, how much tax I am supposed to pay? Have patience. Now, there are two possibilities. First, listen here. Possibility number one, listen. Shall I say? No ROI filed earlier. Can I file an updated return directly? This is the first possibility. Okay. Second possibility. ROI filed earlier. And I want to increase the income. Can I file updated return? Yes. These are the two possibilities which are there. Okay. First possibility is what? You have not filed ROI. Second possibility, you have filed ROI. And now you want to increase income. If you want to decrease income, don't come. Go home. Don't come. If it's a loss case, don't come. Okay? If it's a search case, survey case, uh, conviction under different laws, don't come. 
राइट और नॉट बेटा वी आर नॉट इंटरेस्टेड इन दिस टूडे वी आर इंटरेस्टेड इन दिस टूडे अज्यूम दैट देर इज अ पर्सन हु हैज नॉट फाइल द आर वाई देन ई शुड हैव फाइल द आर वाई बाई थर्टी फर्स्ट ऑफ डिसंबर टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी टू ही हैज मिस दैट डेट ऑल्सो ही हैज मिस दैट डेट ऑल्सो नाउ ही वॉन्ट्स टू फाइल एन अपडेटेड डेटर ही कैन फाइल विद अ कॉस्ट ही कैन फाइल विद अ कॉस्ट सो वॉट इज द कॉस्ट ए एब्सोल्यूट अटेंशन This is the cost. Computation of additional tax. He has to pay. What is the additional tax? Listen carefully now, please. The additional tax payable at the time of furnishing what? This is the what? This is the cost of filing updated return. Okay. Shall be calculated as follows. If the updated return. is furnished after expiry of time available under 1394 or 1395 but before completion of 12 months from the end of the relevant ay okay then you have to pay extra tax additional tax it is a of 25% of the aggregate tax plus surcharge and cess and interest as computed above okay Now, what do I mean by this? Just pay attention. In the bracket, you write interest plus fee. It's not only interest; it's interest plus fee. Everything I'll explain in detail. Don't worry. Just wait for some time. If you furnish the return after twelve months, but Before twenty-four months, you have to pay fifty percent of the tax plus surcharge plus health, health and education says plus C interest as computed above interest plus fee. In fact, it is write down over here. Now, what do I mean by this? Listen carefully. Listen, listen. This is previous year twenty-one, twenty-two. Assessment year twenty two twenty three. I should have filed a return till thirty first December two thousand twenty two. Agree, everyone agrees to it. Please tell me. But I have not filed, so I have missed all the due dates. Now only option available is what? Till which date? Tell me again and again. March 2025, but it will come at a cost, right? Now, what is the cost? If I file till 31st March 2024, file till what? Then the cost is 25 percent. 25 percent of what? That we are supposed to compute. That we are supposed to learn. And if I file after this, then what is the cost? Fifty percent of something. Of what? That we are supposed to learn. Yes or no? Is it clear to everyone? So we need to learn what is that amount of which we are going to pay the cost. Okay? Tell me. Let's read now. Have patience, beta. Have patience. This is the manner of calculating tax, mode of computation of tax, including additional tax. Is given by Section One Forty B as follows. As I have told you, there are two possibilities. Which possibilities? Pay attention on the board. One is where the SSC has not filed the return. He directly wants to file an updated return, right? Second is he has filed the return earlier. Now he wants to increase the income, right? 
I am not interested in the second one now. I am interested in the first one. Shall we start? So can I say his first return in life is about is updated return? He has not filed the return earlier. So now what he will do? Listen, let's see. Where the SSC has not furnished the return earlier. Correct? When no return of income under section 139.1 or 139.4 has been furnished by an SSE, he shall. Are you listening, beta? Each and every word clearly. Every word has to be listened carefully. When no return of income under 139.1 or 139.4 has been furnished by the SSE, he shall. Before furnishing the updated return under section 139.8a, is liable to pay what? Tell underline tax together with what underline interest step by step and what fee payable under any provision of the act for delay in furnishing the return or any default. What do you mean by default in or delay in payment of advance tax? What do you mean by which interest is chargeable for default in paying advance tax? Right, default for default 234P, right? And for delay, which interest? Write down. Okay. And which interest is paid for not filing the return on time? 234A, right? And this is the reason, beta, we have not taken this topic along with ROI chapter. Because if I would have taken this topic along with ROI chapter, you would have not understood anything. For that, you need to first understand which chapter, beta? Advanced tax. Yes or no? We will again write, read the entire paragraph. Bhavisha, where are you, beta? Are you there? Don't miss this particular part. I am reading. Where no return of income has been furnished, under 139.1 or 4 has been furnished by an assessor. He shall, before furnishing the updated return under 139.8, he is liable to pay tax. This is the first thing he is supposed to pay. Together with interest and fee. For what? Why is he paying this interest? Tell me please, why is he paying this interest? Read the sentence ahead. For delay in furnishing interest, that is, that is 234A, right? And which fee is paying? For delay in furnishing return, that is 234F, right? Or default or delay in payment of advance, along with the payment of advance tax. The tax payable shall be computed. After considering the following, you have to consider all these things and compute the tax. Let's see what all things. Consider what? Tell me. Advanced tax. If it is paid, then give the credit of that. Okay? Are yes or no? Are tell me? Is it is possible or not? He has paid some advanced tax here. It is possible or not his TDS is deducted. Next. Some relief might have been claimed under 80, 9, 90, 90 A. Yes or no? And the last but not least. Some MAT or AMT credit he might have taken, right? Such updated return shall also be accompanied by proof of payment of such tax, additional tax, interest fee under 234F. Just go through this paragraph once and then we will try to understand this with the help of an example. Okay, beta.
स्टार्ट यार वीडियो चलो लेट सी ए क्वेश्चन शेल वी विद द क्वेश्चन यू विल बी गेटिंग क्लैरिटी विदाउट क्वेश्चन ऑब्वियसली यू विल नॉट अंडरस्टैंड द इंप्लीकेशन ऑफ दिस नाउ हैव यू रेड दिस पैराग्राफ प्रॉपरली श्योर चलो लेट्स अंडरस्टैंड विद द हेल्प ऑफ एन एग्जाम्पल This example is there in your question bank, page number thirty-two point nine, which covers questions on Finance Act twenty-two amendments. Mr. X is a thirty-four years old resident individual. He does not submit his return of income. Okay, shall I go ahead for the AY twenty-one twenty-two under one thirty-nine one under one thirty-nine four. See the AY, which AY it is? Which AY it is? Twenty one twenty two. So updated return can be filed till which date? Twenty four, right? Updated return can be filed till which date? Thirty first March two thousand twenty four, right? Now income tax department has not initiated any proceedings so far. Is it correct? What would happen if they would have initiated? Then he cannot file updated return, right? Now he intends to submit updated return for AY twenty one twenty two under section one thirty nine eight A on twenty ninth November. Now if he intends to submit on twenty ninth November two thousand twenty two, how much additional tax he is supposed to pay? Are is it within twelve months or is it after twelve months? How much additional tax he is supposed to pay now? Twenty five percent he will be liable to pay, right? Of what amount? Twenty five percent of what amount? Listen carefully. Twenty five percent of the aggregate tax which we are going to compute as per this formula. Yes or no? Clear? Shall we read the question ahead? So now let's see. His estimated income is how much? Forty-five lakh fifteen thousand. This is his income. Advance tax is this. TDS TCS is this. Credit available is this. Audit is not required under forty-four AB or under any provisions of the Act or under any other law. Therefore, his due date is what? His due date is thirty first July, ignoring any extension. X wants to know whether or not updated return can be submitted and the tax liability which is required to pay. Now just wait, just wait. He can submit update updated return definitely. See here, beta. See here. He can definitely submit updated return. Why? Because his liability is going to increase. First of all, yes or no? Secondly, his assessment is not pending, nor he is convicted in any law, etc., etc. Right or not? Nor it's a case of search and survey, etc. Right? So our objective now is to compute additional tax. For that additional tax, we need to compute tax as per this now. So what all things have to be considered over here? Please tell me. First, what we will consider? 
from the beginning. You will compute the tax of this person. Then 234 ABC. Then 234 F. And then you will give the credit of all those things to him, right? Now let's see. Let's compute that now. Patiently. He is 34 years old. 45 lakh 15,000 is his income. Let's compute tax, please. How much tax will come? Step by step. Including cess. Surcharge will not apply because income is less than 50 crore, right? How much tax is coming? Twelve lakh thirteen six eighty. Did you get this? This is the tax amount. You can check over here. Okay. Are is it clear? Now just be patient, beta. Just pay attention what I am trying to do over here. Just be patient. Shall I say? You will understand everything, don't worry. It's slightly tricky. You have to do this sum at your end once more at home. Then you will get grip of this. Now wait. This is the tax, right? Now, I am removing TDS, I am removing advance tax from this. The reason I am telling you why, just wait. I am removing TDS, I am removing advance tax. I will get this number, okay? Now, just wait, just wait. In the tax amount, in the tax amount, am I also supposed to add 234 A, B, C and F? Please tell me, am I supposed to add 234 A, B, C and F? Yes, now let's add 234 A first, okay? Now, just wait. Going back to the previous chapter, wait, previous chapter, 234A, why it is imposed? Because you do not file the return. In this case, to assert he has not filed the return only, na? So, he will be chargeable with interest from 1st August 2021 till the date of filing the updated return, na? Uh, when is he filing the updated return? He is filing the updated return on 29th November 2022, right? So, he will be chargeable interest from year till year, na? Just wait, just wait. See on the board, at 1%. Just wait. Now, tell me, on how much amount 234A is imposed? Tax minus TDS minus advance tax. So, you will be paying on this amount na is it clear 234a check the calculation of 234a that is the reason this chapter couldn't have been done before advanced tax don't go ahead is it clear CR, CR, CR. 234B, don't see the answer. Say to me. 234B, from when it is chargeable? Till when? Assessment. Here assessment is not happening. Here we are filing the return. So, till the date of filing of return? Yes? Check. At how much rate? 1%. The amount is same only, na? Tax minus TDS minus advance tax. Right? Clear? Now see here. Please see here. 234C is charged quarterly. Now apply common sense and tell me on how much amount. You have, we have learned that. Tax minus what? 
then 234C is charge on how much amount? Tax minus what? Advanced tax you reduce while computing 234C. Then tax minus what? Are tax due on returned income not? What is that tax here? We have done today also, yesterday also. So, tell me the amount now. That is the reason I have given the breakup on the board itself. On 11.43 you pay 234C na beta. Are yes or no yaar. Now is the SSC paid any advance tax in any of the quarter? Check. If he has paid in any of the quarter, in that quarter we have to reduce that much. Has he paid? Has he paid in first quarter? In first quarter has he paid? In second quarter? In third quarter? In fourth quarter he has paid. So check the calculation of 234C now. First quarter 1143, 15% into 3. Right? Into 3 months it is, it is not 3%. Second quarter 1143 into 45 into 3 months. Right? Third quarter 1143 into 75 into 3. But in fourth quarter, you will not take 1143, you will take 843. Did you understand? Because he has paid on 4th Jan 3 lakh rupees. Into 1 month. Clear? This is 54,752. Right? Now, is he also supposed to pay 234F because he is not filing the return on time? 5,000 that will be added back. Okay? So, now, please tell me. Please tell me. See here. Have we got this amount? After tax, listen to my words carefully. Is this amount after tax? After interest under 234 ABC? After fee under 234F? And after reducing advance tax, TDS, etc.? Is this amount after all those things? So, can I say now I finally got the amount which the government is asking over here? Yes? Check. Have we got tax? See on the board. Have we got tax? I'll, I'll change the color. Have we got tax? Have we got interest under 234A? Have we added fee also? Have we added 234A, 234B, 234C? And have we considered all these things also? That is, we have reduced all these things. So, this is the amount. This is the amount on which you will pay what? 25% additional tax under 140B. Now, don't be under an impression. This too, you have to pay only anyways. This too, you, if you would have filed the return on time, then also you would have paid. And this too, even if you would have filed a belated return, then also you have paid, na? So, you are getting this benefit to file return till 2 years. At an extra cost of 3,1782. I hope you understood this particular point. Did you understand? So, this is what this provision is all about. It is not completed. We have completed the first position. Which position? Where earlier the SSE has not file the return and now he is filing what the return but there is one more possibility na beta what is that possibility that earlier you have shown 10 lakh income and now you want to increase your income yes or no that we are not going to do today we'll do it tomorrow because that itself is a very big exercise to explain from the very scratch okay i request you all to please Read this provision tomorrow and come till here. And also see this question once more. Okay? Please, beta. Otherwise, you will have a trouble tomorrow. Please. And it's a very important provision. It's a new provision, so we cannot ignore it. It's an absolutely Finance Act 22 fresh amendment. Okay? So...
let us continue the discussion of updated return which we have started in the last lecture okay so pay attention please all of you so yesterday we have seen one case of updated return whereby you have not filed the return earlier and now you are filing directly an updated return okay so let's see the second case where you have furnished an updated return earlier so now you are filing another uh, sorry you have furnished a return earlier under 139.1 or 139.4 or 139.5 okay you have furnished return in either of the section so now you want to update that return by increasing the income you want to increase the income and you want to update the return so what is the consequence how the tax will be computed in that case okay we have to see that tell me pay attention so this is how the tax will be computed and whatever tax will be computed we have to pay 25 percent or 50 percent additional tax on that okay now let's see let's read this paragraph once there is some mistake in this i would like to rectify that first and then only we will be able to understand the provision page number 29.2 let's read this all of us together where the SSC has furnished return earlier. If an SSC has furnished return under section 139.1 or 139.4 or 139.5, that is normal return, belated return or revised return, he before submitting the updated return is required to pay, pay what? Required to pay what? Tax. Is required to pay tax. Underline tax. Together with interest payable. Together with what? Interest payable under any provision for what? Default or delay in payment of advance tax. What do you mean by default in payment of advance tax? Default means 234B. Delay means 234C. Right or not? Along with the payment of additional tax. Okay, and then there is something written over here as reduced by underline by the interest paid in the earlier return. Okay, so there is there are a lot of things over here. We will try to understand this each and everything with the help of an example. Don't worry. But still, let's read once more. If an SSC has furnished return, let's make a count of how many items are mentioned over here. If an SSC has furnished return under section 139, 1, 4 or 5. He before submitting the return is liable to first of all what? Pay what? Pay tax. First item. Second, he is liable to pay interest under 234B. Then interest under 234C. Right? Then he is supposed to pay additional tax. As reduced by what? The amount of interest paid in the earlier return. Hello, let's see. We will see how to interpret how to interpret this? <coughs> the tax payable shall be computed after considering the following. Now, let's number it. Let's number this as number one. Number one. After considering what? The amount of relief or tax referred to in 140A1. Now, what is referred to in 140A1? Just underline that and Let's give the breakup of this. 140A1 has lot of things. Let me give you the detail of this. Just write down. 140A1 includes which all things? It includes TDS, TCS, Section 89 relief, Section 90 relief, Section 90A relief, Section 91 relief, Section 115JAA. Section 115JD and advanced tax. Which is paid earlier. A 140A includes all these things. If you go to section 140A, open 140A in Income Tax Act, Bear Act. You will find out all these things. It will take time for us to understand this concept. Just wait for some time. The tax payable shall be computed after considering the following. First, 
the amount of relief or tax referred to in which tax TDS relief 115JAA 115JD advance tax paid earlier comma the credit for which has been taken in earlier return underline this particular line very important the credit for which has been taken in what earlier return underline this and I go ahead Second point is missing over here. I am sorry for that. This is second, this is third, this is fourth. Second one is missing over here. Please write down now. The second point over here. Any relief under section 89, under section 90, 90A, 91, for which credit was not claimed earlier. Just write down this, this is missing in the textbook. Return third thing which you have to consider is TDS or TCS on any income which is subject to such deduction or collection and which has been taken into account in computing the total income and which has not been underlined claimed in the earlier return. Here also it was not claimed in earlier return. What do I mean by this? We will come to that, do not worry. The last one is any MAT or AMT credit, again, which has not been taken into earlier return. Okay. Now, I request you all to go from here till here. At least two, three times with minute detailing. Read each and every line very carefully from here till here. Please.
रेड बेटा अरे रेड नाउ वन मोर थिंग विल जस्ट सी दैट्स अ फॉर्मैलिटी इवन इफ यू डोंट सी दैट्स इट्स ओके बट स्टिल विल सी दैट वंस हाउ टू कैलकुलेट इंटरेस्ट अंडर टू थर्टी फोर बी वेर एन अर्लियर रिटर्न इज फर्निश्ड ओके लेट सी दैट ऑल्सो वंस एंड देन विल मूव ऑन टू अंडरस्टैंड द क्वेश्चन Where an earlier return has been furnished, interest payable under 234B shall be computed on an amount equal to assessed tax, or on the amount by which the advance tax paid falls short of the assessed tax. For this purpose, assessed tax means the tax on total income as declared in the updated return after considering the following. After considering the following, okay. So, what all relief we give? To claim advance, uh, to compute 234B, we give everything, na? We give all relief, like the amount of relief or tax referred in 140A1. What is referred in 140A1? Just give the breakup once again. TDS, TCS, section 90, 91, 90A, 89 relief, advance tax. Mat AMP, all these credits are there. The credit for which has been taken in the earlier return. Then what you will consider? TDS TCS on any income declared in updated return which has not been claimed in the earlier return. Same just like the previous page. I'll try to explain you the implication of this with the help of example. Don't worry. Any relief or deduction which has not been claimed in the earlier return, any AMT mat which has not been claimed in the earlier return. Okay, now what do I mean by this? Pay absolute attention now. The entire catch lies in this paragraph. Let's try to understand with the help of an example now. This example will explain us in a better way. Bhavisha, you will struggle a, a bit because you have missed the initial part of the discussion. So try to understand, please, or else you can see the things later on. Shall we start with this question? Please start your videos, please. Question number six. X is forty-four years old, is a resident individual, and for AY twenty-one twenty-two. He submits the return of income under 139.4 on Jan 28, 2022. Now, first argument which you will make, sir, how he can file the return for AY 2122 on Jan 28, 2022? You will make this argument or not? Then what should be your argument then? Yes, he should have filed till thirty first December two thousand twenty one. No, earlier the time limit to file the return was till March. Okay, just one year before they have reduced the time limit till December. Okay, okay, beta. So there is nothing wrong in this twentieth Jan two thousand twenty two day. Is it clear? Okay, the following information is taken from the intimation. Taken from where? Intimation under one forty three one pertaining to what assessment year twenty one twenty two tax audit not required due date of submission of return is what thirty first July. Now this is the data taken from his intimation. Now what is the data? Net income twenty lakh twenty five thousand. Okay. Then there is tax. Tax they have computed and they have given to us four lakh thirty six eight hundred. Just try to understand the things implication of this section. Then, obviously, in the income tax return, he might have claimed some TDS and TCS, yes or no? So he has got the credit of that. Okay. Obviously, in the income tax return originally filed under one thirty nine four, he might have claimed some advance tax. So he has claimed some advance tax, which was paid on twentieth November two thousand twenty after two quarters, right? After two quarters, right? Is it clear, beta? Now, now, please pay absolute attention. Please start your video. Please, beta, pay absolute attention now. <coughs> Will he liable for two thirty four A? 
normally not no, i am asking normally forget about updated returns and all we are not going to updated return now we are normally now filing the normal return will he be liable for interest under 234a why because he is supposed to file the return by july and he is filing in the month of jan yes so he will be liable for 234a yes or no 1% on what amount 234a is paid on this amount na Are 234A is paid after taking TDS advance tax both na? For how many months? For 6 months. Is it clear? August, September, October, November, December, Jan. Clear? Similarly, will he be liable for 234B 1% for 10 months? From April to Jan? Clear? He is liable for April to Jan. Okay? And on the same amount 234b is also on the same amount na beta now 234c is on which amount 234c is before advance tax yes so in the first quarter he will pay 15% of 306 for 3% 3 months sorry second quarter 45% 306 3 month but in third quarter he will get deduction of 1 lakh rupees are you able to understand that because on 20th November, he has paid 1 lakh rupees. Are it till, better till here, na, it is like a normal advance tax question only. Just check. Okay. Is it clear? So, total tax, total self-assessment tax will include all these things, right? 256, 381. Is it clear till here to everyone? Sure. Okay, beta. Now I am just giving the breakup of this. Okay, breakup is what? 206800 is tax. 12408 is 234A. 20680 is 234B. 11493 is 234C. And 5000 is 234F. Is it clear? I am just giving a break up. Okay. Now, my intimation will look something like this. Okay. My intimation will look something like this. And there will be nothing payable in my intimation because I have shown everything correctly so far. So, as per intimation, the tax is coming how much? The tax is coming 436,800. Okay. I am showing 436,800 as intimation. Okay. Then this is the interest. This is the total interest which I am adding over here. Then fee. And then I will say that I have already paid 486, 380 in the form of taxes earlier. Is it clear till here? So, till here also I can say there is nothing new which we have done. Is it clear? There is no intention till here of what? Showing what? Of showing, of showing additional income to the income tax authority. Yes or no? We, Till now, we are not having any information of showing extra income, right? So, let us introduce that now. Let us now introduce the second part, which is this chapter. For EY 21-22, X wants to what? Declare, underline additional income of how much? 35,50,000, okay? Which was not included in what? In the original return by mistake of his accountant. Okay. Now we will say that only now by mistake of his account. He will not say I will deliberately make. Okay, beta. Now let's apply with some common sense. If you have not claimed that income, if you have not shown that income in the return earlier, you would have not shown the TDS also of that amount, na? You would have not claimed. There might be possibility that on this 35,50,000 some TDS was also deducted. You might have not shown that also. If it is missed, then both should have missed. Na? See, so against which <coughs> TDS against this income is rupees underline 2,80,000. How much? Which was also not claimed in the original return. Okay. 
इज इट क्लियर टिल यार चलो अभी वी विल कंप्यूट द इनकम ऑफ हिम एम आई सपोज टू नाउ क्यूमुलेट बोथ द इनकम एंड देन कंप्यूट द टैक्स ऑब्वियसली ना ही हैज टू इंक्लूड दैट इनकम दिस इनकम कंप्यूट बोथ यस एंड देन सी हाउ मच टैक्स ही हैज ऑलरेडी पेड बैलेंस ही हैज टू पे राइट लेट्स डू द कंप्यूटेशन टोटली नाउ नाउ वी आर मेकिंग नॉर्मल कंप्यूटेशन नॉर्मल I am still not going for additional tax. Additional tax computation I will do later on. Normal computation. What will come in normal computation? Original income twenty lakh twenty five, undisclosed income thirty five thirty five. Is it clear? Total fifty five seventy five. Now because of this, what will happen? Now you will compute tax. And now when you compute tax, compute tax, you also have to take ten percent surcharge, na? Because now your income is above fifty lakhs. Is it clear? now this against this you will get credit of two tds right a old tds and one new tds so i am taking the credit of both the tds right you have also paid advance tax earlier i will take the credit of that also please tell me beta plus plus you have also paid some self assessment tax earlier na you will take the credit of that also and differential amount you have to pay yeah, right Now please apply your mind and tell me: Am I supposed to pay some additional interest now? Apply common sense because earlier you have computed interest based on twenty lakhs. Now are you supposed to pay some extra interest? Tell me now, please, beta. Definitely, na beta. Earlier you have paid interest as per twenty lakhs, twenty five thousand, na. Now you have to pay extra interest also, na, beta, because you have not shown that income earlier. So shall we compute that interest? Let's compute that interest now. Pay attention, please. We are computing interest now. So just see what all things I have taken over here. Just pay attention. Just pay attention. I am computing interest for late payment or short payment of advance tax. Okay, interest under two thirty four B. Please see here. Interest from here the real critical point starts. Just for the next five minutes, if you pay attention, the things are clear. Two thirty four B starts from where? Till right till filing of return or till assessment of that particular thing. Right. Now just wait. Just wait. Just wait. He has submitted return on his date set, tenth March two thousand twenty-four. Okay, just twenty days before the two years end. Okay, now let's compute two thirty-four B. How I will compute two thirty-four B? Just wait. Two thirty-four B is computed on this amount, right? After reducing advance tax. So listen carefully now. Listen carefully. Eleven lakh eighty-eight thousand eight percent. Eight eight forty into one percent from first April to twentieth Jan. Okay, now on twentieth Jan, see here on twentieth Jan, is he paying two zero six eight hundred as income tax? Can you see that? So after twentieth Jan, he will not be liable for this amount now on in, for interest. Do you remember in advance tax also in two thirty four B we have done two segregations. So here also, you have to do two segregation. From Feb onwards, he will be liable to pay on nine eighty two. Is it clear? Check the answer, please. Because this much amount was paid on twentieth Jan, so after twentieth Jan, that is from Feb onwards, you will not be liable to pay interest on two zero six eight hundred. Is it clear? So how much interest is coming under two thirty four B? Three seventy four two hundred. Okay. Is it clear? Two thirty four C. On what amount two thirty four C is paid? Please tell me first of all. 
टेल मी ट्वेल्व एटी एट एट फोर्टी राइट सो फर्स्ट क्वार्टर ट्वेल्व एटी एट सेकेंड क्वार्टर ट्वेल्व एटी एट बट थर्ड क्वार्टर ट्वेल्व एटी एट माइनस वन लैख राइट and fourth quarter also 1288 minus 1 lakh which is 1188 right this is 61085 okay now this to you have to pay all these things you have to pay even if updated return concept would have not been there you have to pay is everyone clear till here now the last part comes and that is how to compute extra cost first of all he is filing the return on 10th of march 2024 the extra cost will be how much it will be 50% clear na the 50% of what we have to read this paragraph as i have told you earlier you read this absolutely clearly let's read once again shall i beta if an assessee has furnished the return under subsection 1 4 or 5 he is liable to pay tax okay together with interest under any provision for default or delay he is liable to pay tax okay together with interest With interest, which interest for default? For default, which interest is there? Two thirty four. B is there. Or for delay, which interest is there? Two thirty four C, along with payment of additional tax, as reduced by what? Underline as reduced by what? Amount of paid in earlier return. Okay. The tax payable shall be computed after considering the following. Okay. The amount of relief. Or tax referred to in that is TDS, TCS, relief, 115 J W E, MAT, AMT credit, advance tax, credit for which has been taken in earlier return. Okay, any relief 89, 90, the credit for which was not taken, TDS, TDS, the credit for which was not taken, MAT, AMT, the credit for which was not taken. Now you have to be very careful with this particular lines. Now there is a great difference between the first point. Listen carefully. Be patient enough. there is a great difference between the first point and the next three point what difference can you find out between the two can you tell me the difference point number 1 what comes that tax that relief that advance tax that amt mat credit comes for which you have taken the credit in the earlier return right And point number two, three, four covers what? Which was not claimed in earlier. It means it was missed in earlier return, and now you are showing in the updated return, right? This is what the bifurcation is between now between one and two, three, four. Now be very careful now. Every point I can explain you with the help of the reasoning. Okay, every point. Just pay attention. 140b subsection 3 we are computing now additional tax for computing additional tax we need to make a calculation what is the calculation we have to take the tax first of all just wait now how this tax has come this tax is same as this one okay 1698840 are right or not so now i am just doing the calculation which is mentioned over here okay i am just making the calculation which is mentioned over here beta i am not doing anything extra he is liable to pay what he is liable to pay tax right so i am writing tax i am writing step by step what is written over here shall i write tax over here so i have written tax first item is over okay shall i go ahead second item second item i am just ignoring these points i am just coming to this now i am first of all reducing this it the tax should be after considering this now So I will now reduce what the TDS and TCS and advance tax and what is whatever asset tax I have paid earlier. Okay. So as per the original return, whatever tax I have paid earlier, what I have paid earlier, as per the original return, what I have paid earlier, one lakh thirty I have paid as a as a TDS, advance tax, 
सेल्फ असेसमेंट टैक्स वॉट एवर आर पेड अर आई विल रिड्यूस दैट ओके अरे यस और नो नाउ एज पर पॉइंट नंबर टू थ्री फोर पॉइंट नंबर टू थ्री फोर वॉट सेल आई टेक एज पर पॉइंट नंबर टू थ्री फोर विच वॉज वॉट Not claimed earlier. So let's do what? Let's reduce that also now, which was not claimed earlier. What was not claimed earlier? Please tell me. There is only one item which was not claimed earlier. That is two lakh eighty thousand TDS, right? So I have reached till here. Okay. Is there any relief in the question? No. Is there any mad credit in the question? AMD credit in the question? No. Is it clear? So now just try to understand what I have done. They have made this computation hell lot of confusing. But we need to understand with the word by word interpretation. Now, just one thing is pending over here. That's it. You just let me know what all things I have taken. Have I taken the tax payable? Have I taken this? Have I considered this? Which which I have ignored? Which I have not taken earlier? Now there is only one thing which is pending. Can you please tell me what that I am supposed to take in this calculation? and that is this line yes or no this line is pending now apart from that i have taken everything else you can check only this line is pending you can check have i taken the part before the orange part what is before orange it's a pure interpretation of law beta what is before orange tax have i taken the tax what is after orange you have to take the credit of all the items which you have claimed earlier and which you have not claimed earlier both have to be taken consideration have we taken that also just orange part is pending yes or no now what is that orange part let's read shall we read beta is liable to tax together with what interest payable under any provision of act for any what default or delay that is 234b 234c in payment of advance tax along with the payment of additional tax as reduced by what as reduced by what the amount of interest paid in earlier return so now what we will do we have already computed 234b and 234c just wait see here we have computed here 234b and 234c in the earlier calculation just wait now What was two thirty four B three seventy? I'll do orange here. Three seventy four two hundred two thirty four C sixty one zero eighty five. Now please tell me, am I supposed to add this also to my computation? Beta read English, read English together with. Am I supposed to add this also to my tax computation? Yes. So I will add this. Okay. I will add these two right. please tell me beta but it is written in the last line something is written as reduced by what interest paid in earlier return so what was the interest paid in earlier return 234b and 234c is this the interest paid in earlier return are tell me na please beta so is this the interest as per 234b and c now Minus the interest paid earlier. This, अरे बेटा, I am explaining the interpretation of the line which has been said by the government. Did you understand? So, is this the interest which we are paying now? Minus, is this the interest which we are paid in earlier return? So, they are telling us to add the differential amount. Did you understand what I said? बेटा, did you understand what I said? so that is the reason now i am adding this differential amount here check can you see that because the law says that that you have to consider the new interest minus the interest which you have paid earlier why we will we take tax on that amount because that you have paid earlier na we don't want to take additional tax on that amount we want to take additional tax on only extra interest are are you understanding so they are taking additional tax on extra interest now now just read that entire paragraph which we were reading what does it include beta does it include tax 
does it include interest minus earlier interest does it include credit of all these things so whatever amount comes after that you will pay what beta how much tax 50 percent tax on that is it clear to all of you and therefore this is how the computation will be made in practical life you don't have to worry about anything why software has been made according to that software computes everything very precisely you have to just mention over there that this is a case of what 139 8a updated return is it clear but in exam software is not going to come in exam but initially i feel so they will ask you a simple question not as complicated as this. but i have to explain you the implication of the provision and that is the reason i have to consider this okay is it clear so it's a complicated provision i agree it's a difficult provision i tried to explain you with word by word what the law has said each and every provision which the law has said okay now one just practical advice that i can give you if you want you can take it if you don't want you you can ignore it okay that is just practically relevant not academic for that you might require uh, yesterday what we have done knowledge of that okay shall i say now just let me ask you one thing which year is going on today which year financial year 22 23 is going on okay suppose if a person it's wrong to write fail to file suppose if a person is not eligible to file return not eligible to file return because because his income is total income is what below so can he file the return for previous year 2021 year in the form of updated return and show the income as uh, 1.9 lakhs can he do so Please tell me. Are there is a person who is not eligible to file the return, but he wants to file the return because why? Why? Because sometimes uh, if you want to go to bank and take a loan, then they ask for ITR of last two three years. Yeah. For that purpose, I want him to file the return. Can he file the updated return? Why no? Where 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 the provision is stopping him? Please tell me. Which point provision is stopping? No, 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 no. It's nowhere written your liability should increase. It's written your liability should not decrease. See. It's written your liability should not decrease. It's nowhere written your liability should increase. Check. Where it is written, beta? Check. Where? It's written, it should not decrease the total tax liability. Can you see that? Will he come under this point? No? No, beta. So, for your kind information, tell me if any, any clause can stop him. Any clause? He is a normal SSE, not covered under search and seizure, not covered, not convicted under any law, nothing like that. Can you file the updated return? And the answer is yes. He can file. He can file. There are a lot of people who have filed also this year. There are a lot of people who have filed an updated return this year in the month of July. Okay. Now, there is no consequence on the SSE. Why there is no consequence? Because there is no tax payable now. If there would have been tax payable now, there would have been interest under 234 ABC. Yes or no? This is a nil return, na beta. So even today, even today, 
तो डेट ऑफ ड्यू डेट ऑफ फाइलिंग ऑफ रिटर्न हैज ऑल्सो गॉन बाय ना यस और नो इवन टुडे यू कैन फाइल द अपडेटेड रिटर्न ऑफ 2021 व्हाई बिकॉज़ 21 2021 मींस 21 22 एंड 21 22 मींस यू कैन फाइल टिल व्हिच डेट 31 मार्च 2020 ओके सो इन प्रैक्टिकल लाइफ इफ एनी क्लाइंट कम्स and tells you that i want to file an updated return i want to file a return i don't have any income then file it if he comes and tells you i want to file a return and there is an income then tell him the consequence you have to bear the extra cost is it clear so this is what this topic is all about you cannot ignore this topic you can hate this topic but you cannot ignore you have to consider this for the exams <laughs> precisely if they have to ask they will ask with the first part of this topic in the exam at least in the first few attempts which is about what you have not filed the return earlier you are directly filing an updated return that was an easy one that was nothing great in that okay but if you have filed the return earlier now you are again filing the return then you have to make a long computation and then you have to find out how to compute additional tax and for computing additional tax what all components have to be taken tax interest under 234b 234c minus paid earlier then credit taken earlier credit not taken earlier you have to reduce all those things is it clear